I don't quite fit in with the Joneses. My unusual hobby of collecting taxidermy animals, meticulously arranged in glass cases throughout my living space, tends to raise a few eyebrows. None of my friends truly understood the appeal, but I loved the eerie and mysterious vibe that it lent to my daily life. And that's exactly what brought me to a small, remote town in Colorado known for its intriguing antique shops filled with unique and bizarre items. After a few hours of browsing dusty old shelves, I decided to take a break and explore the nearby woods, rumored to have strange old relics scattered around them. As I delved deeper into the forest, I stumbled across them, decaying wooden stairs standing alone amid the trees, leading nowhere. My initial reaction was curiosity, as I expected it might lead me to an abandoned cabin or something equally impressive. Instead, as I climbed the stairs, pushing through the branches above my head, I found nothing. Absolutely nothing. Disappointed and curious about why anyone would build these stairs in the middle of nowhere, I decided to snap some pictures before heading back to town. As I retraced my steps back to civilization, lost in thought about those peculiar stairs, a group of local friends stopped me. Michael noticed that something seemed off about me. He was so incredibly perceptive. You look like you've seen a ghost, he teased. More like some random staircase in the middle of the woods, I replied casually. Immediately, their laughter died down and what little color they had drained from their faces. You saw them too? Sarah whispered nervously. Yeah, you're not supposed to climb those stairs. Michael warned me cautiously. Before I could ask for an explanation, they went on to share chilling stories about others who had encountered these isolated staircases and subsequently suffered grisly deaths or unexplained disappearances. Eerily enough, many victims were discovered in pieces, and the ones who simply vanished remained a mystery. Locals attributed these horrific happenings to a mysterious figure lurking in the shadows. Feeling my skin crawl at the idea of being pursued by some unknown entity, I became increasingly paranoid as the connections between the stories became clear. This malevolent figure wasn't just targeting random victims. It was seeking out those who dared to venture too close to the stairs. As we continued our conversation, Michael explained that he had actually met an individual who survived an encounter with this elusive figure. He wouldn't provide their name initially, but eventually whispered it, Tyson. Michael also added that if I wanted to know more, I would have to approach Tyson myself. Gathering my courage, I searched for the survivor, questioning locals until finally finding him alone in a dimly lit bar, nursing a drink. Wrinkled and elderly now, Tyson looked like he had been through hell and back. Upon hearing my question about the stairs and the mysterious antagonist stalking his victims there, I could see flashbacks resurface in his eyes. My family used to own that wooded land, he began hesitantly. We were warned by our father never to speak of what we knew about the stairs or anything connected to them. He glanced around nervously before continuing. But I'll tell you about him, the one they call Jackal Bones. Horror-stricken silence settled between us as Tyson recounted how, years ago, a deranged man named Jackal Bones hunted people around those woods. Equipped with crude weapons fashioned from animal bones and pieces of metal wire, he would gleefully tear apart his victims. What followed next was Tyson sharing his harrowing encounter with Jackal Bones when he ran face to face into him near those cursed stairs many years before. Somehow, inexplicably, Jackal Bones spared his life but only after torturing him and leaving him maimed. To this day, Tyson doesn't understand why he was spared when so many others were simply vanquished from this world. 
The only thing Tyson knows for certain is that terror and pain will continue to haunt him throughout the remainder of his life. As I left that bar that night, I couldn't shake the sinking feeling in my stomach. Were those stairs indeed connected to jackal bones? Or was he truly just some sadistic lunatic scribbled down in the annals of local folklore? One thing's for sure. I never slept soundly again after learning about Jackal Bones. For days, the story of Jackal Bones gnawed at the corners of my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that he was still lurking in those woods, waiting for his next victim. As much as I wanted to forget about it all and leave this dark chapter behind, I just couldn't. So, I decided to do some research of my own. I hit the local library, scanning through old newspaper archives and conducting online searches. Gradually, a twisted tale began to emerge. Apparently, Jack O'Bones was once a man named Jacob Jones, a skilled hunter and taxidermist who lived in this small town over fifty years ago. He spiraled into madness following the mysterious disappearance of his wife and child becoming obsessed with hunting humans instead of animals. Piecing together bits of information from various sources, I discovered that Jacob's wife and child had stumbled upon those very stairs in the woods. They ascended, never to be seen again. As a possible explanation for his psychotic behavior, some believed that the cursed stairs created a link between our world and another darker realm possibly driving Jacob mad when he learned about their fate. There were also whispers about locals who had attempted to speak out about the cruel acts committed by Jackal Bones, only to turn up dead or disappear altogether. The more I uncovered about this disturbing history, the deeper my own obsession grew. By retracing Tyson's footsteps and following any lead I could find on Jackal Bones, an idea started to form. What if there was a way to stop him? Convinced that this mysterious figure still hunted in those woods, I decided to take action. My plan was simple but dangerous. Lure him out of hiding by using myself as bait at the stairs before attempting to capture or kill him. Revealing my plan to Michael and Sarah was met with resistance. They tried to dissuade me from doing something so reckless. But my determination overrode their concerns, and eventually they agreed to help me. We gathered makeshift weapons, protective gear, and some rudimentary traps before setting off into the woods under the cover of darkness. With trepidation in every step, we approached the cursed stairs. With a heavy heart, I started climbing them, with my friends watching anxiously close by. As I reached the top step, I whispered a silent prayer before descending back down. Not long after, we heard an eerie rustling in the trees. The air grew cold, and we could sense his presence nearby. Suddenly, Jackal Bones stepped out from the shadows, a hulking and sinister figure brandishing his gruesome bone weapon. This was the moment of truth, our one chance to put an end to his reign of terror. Sarah fired a crossbow bolt from her hiding place, striking Jackal Bones in the shoulder. The initial shock bought me enough time to swoop in with a homemade bear trap cleverly designed by Michael. Caught off guard by our ambush, Jackal Bones was no match for us as we overpowered him and forced him into submission. Writhing in agony on the ground, he stared up at us with eyes full of desperation and fear. Sirens wailed in the distance as local law enforcement arrived on scene to arrest the notorious Jackal Bones. With tears streaming down his face, he could only whimper out one phrase. Forgive me. Gazing into those once horrifying eyes now filled with pain and regret, I couldn't bring myself to feel hatred towards him anymore. I knelt beside him as the police closed in and whispered. I don't know if I can forgive you, but maybe one day, you can find peace. 
In that moment of unexpected empathy between predator and prey, we were bound together by our shared obsession over darkness and closure by an uncanny series of events. As Jacko Bones was taken into custody, the cursed stairs seemed to fade away into the night, as if their sinister purpose had been fulfilled. Although the town now slept soundly after decades of terror, questions lingered in my mind. Did those stairs truly hold otherworldly secrets? And more importantly, what would become of the man called Jackal Bones? However, one thing was certain. I had somehow played a pivotal role in ending a horrifying legacy. It was time for me to move on and seek a brighter future, leaving the shadows behind once and for all. I stumbled upon this bizarre quirk of mine while in high school. I can't walk downstairs without counting each step. It doesn't matter if I'm just descending a small staircase or going down multiple flights. I always find myself muttering the numbers under my breath. I got used to the fact that it was just a strange quirk of mine and never thought anything important would ever come out of it. That is, until that fateful day. It was March 18, 2013 when my life took an unexpected, gruesome turn. My friend Darby and I had decided to explore the woods near Devil's Gulch, a popular hiking spot in Southern California. We made our way through the dense trees, enjoying the serenity and tranquility of nature around noon. Did you hear about that group of hikers who went missing around here last month? Darby asked as we continued ascending on a dirt path. Shit, no, that's creepy. I replied nervously. Darby laughed, saying, Don't worry, they found them eventually. They just took a wrong turn somewhere and got lost for a couple of days. Our casual conversation came to an abrupt stop when the path led us to an unusual sight. A set of wooden stairs leading down into the woods ahead. We stared in disbelief at the steps before us as they seemed eerily out of place in this environment. Have you ever seen stairs like these around here? Darby asked me with a puzzled expression. No, I replied, equally confused. Something about these stairs sent chills down my spine, but my curiosity pushed me forward as we cautiously approached the top step. Be careful, man, Darby warned as he stood back. One deep breath later, I placed my foot on the first step and started counting, something even this bizarre situation couldn't stop me from doing. Fifteen steps later, I reached the bottom, still not understanding why those stairs were there. Darby followed suit, and we found ourselves at the edge of a vast clearing filled with thickets and tall grass. So, do we just go back up? Darby asked. I say we explore a bit more, I answered, feeling more confident than before. It wasn't long before I regretted that decision. As we ventured deeper into the brush, we stumbled upon a horrifying sight, a body, or rather, what was left of it. The mangled corpse lay sprawled out under some bushes, torn apart by something unthinkably savage. Jesus Christ! Darby gasped. We have to call the police. He pulled out his phone and immediately dialed 911. The officers arrived within 30 minutes, questioning us as they examined the gruesome scene. It was clear that there had been more people killed recently in these woods than just this poor victim. But who could be responsible for such heinous acts? Days later, I overheard some detectives talking at the local coffee shop about the case. They mentioned how they had found fingerprints on one of the bodies that belonged to a former convict named Daniel Boucher Payne. The man had been released from prison only a few months prior to these murders. 
I struggled to comprehend that someone so monstrous had lived among us until then and could commit such brutal acts. However, knowing who was responsible didn't make me feel any safer. It only added to my growing paranoia. The next week, word got around town that they found Daniel Boucher Payne hiding out not too far from Devil's Gulch. He confessed to his crimes in gruesome detail. Hearing about his apprehension brought some solace to our community, but left me with a shaken worldview and unanswered questions. Why did he lead his victims down those stairs? How many lives have been lost because of him? The reasons behind his actions remained a mystery, further amplifying the terror and confusion surrounding the whole ordeal. Soon enough, however, Devil's Gulch was once again filled with hikers and people laughing and enjoying nature's beauty. But I couldn't share their lightheartedness as my mind became fixated on one spine-chilling thought. What if there are more stairs out there and more people like Daniel waiting to strike? I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that settled over me, so I decided to do some investigating of my own. The more I looked into the case, the more it seemed that the stairs were a key element of Boucher Payne's murder spree. Could there be more staircases hidden in these woods? Were there others like him out there? I scoured the area around Devil's Gulch and eventually found another set of stairs deep within the forest. My heart raced as I descended those eerie steps, counting each one out of habit. At the bottom, I noticed something strange in the dirt, a buried notebook. Cautiously, I dug it up and started flipping through its pages. The entries were unsettling, ramblings about the perfect prey, and cryptic paragraphs detailing methods of luring victims. It became increasingly clear that this was no ordinary journal. Upon further investigation, I found numerous newspaper clippings hidden in a makeshift compartment at the back of the notebook. As I scanned through them, my blood ran cold. They were articles about unsolved murders and disappearances from all over the state. It was as if someone had been collecting trophies, marking each horrifying act in this morbid scrapbook. My gut told me that this notebook might be connected to Boucher Payne and his gruesome crimes. But who could have left it here, and why? What are you doing here? A rough voice startled me from behind. I whipped around to see a rugged-looking stranger, his wild eyes filled with anger and hate. You shouldn't be here, he snarled, taking a threatening step toward me. Instinctively, I held up the notebook like a shield. This is yours, isn't it? I asked accusingly. You're working with Boucher Payne or worse. He laughed menacingly. You have no idea who you're messing with. He growled, reaching into his jacket pocket. I caught a glint of metal and knew I was in trouble. But running would only give me a bullet in the back. You think you can just walk around, prying into other people's business, and get away with it? You've just signed your death warrant, kid. I tried to stay calm and managed a shaky smile. You might have the weapon, but I have your confession right here, I replied, waving the notebook. If you so much as touch me, this goes straight to the police. His eyes widened in momentary disbelief before hardening with hatred. He lunged at me but stopped short when he heard the sirens approaching in the distance. Let me make something clear. He hissed between clenched teeth. This isn't over. With that, he turned and disappeared into the woods. As promised, I delivered the notebook to the police. They were initially skeptical about my story, but their attitudes changed drastically once they realized its contents could provide crucial leads on several cold cases. Days turned into weeks as they tracked down leads from the notebook, making numerous connections between Boucher Payne and other unsolved crimes. 
grisly discoveries were found buried throughout Devil's Gulch, chilling evidence of a murder club comprised of twisted individuals who reveled in their unspeakable acts. But while some members were apprehended and brought to justice, others still remained at large, a chilling reminder that there are darker evils lurking among us. I couldn't forget the man I'd encountered in those woods or his final words, that unsettling promise of revenge. So now I live my life ever vigilant, always cautious when descending stairs, and treating every passerby with wary suspicion. The safest thing was leaving town and starting anew elsewhere, but I couldn't let fear take over my life. No matter where my journey takes me, I'll face the unknown with one truth in mind. You never truly know who you can trust, and sometimes the most innocent-looking path can lead to devastating consequences. And so, I embrace every day with a heightened sense of awareness. My once unusual quirk of counting steps has transformed into a constant reminder that this nightmare may not be over just yet. I used to be a professional fire eater. Maybe it was the adrenaline that attracted me, or maybe it was just a way to escape my mundane life. One thing's for sure, I never expected it to lead me down a path of horror and mystery. It happened a few years ago, on the outskirts of the city, near that popular hiking spot in the USA. My buddy Eric and I had decided to explore some of the woods just outside of town. We'd heard there were some old stairs hidden deep within the woods, used by locals as part of an urban legend. We wanted to see if they actually existed. As we ventured deeper into the forest, we came across a group of people who introduced themselves as amateur ghost hunters. I found it odd that they were out in these woods without any gear or equipment. So, what brings you guys here? One of them asked with a suspicious tone. We're just here for some adventure and those mysterious stares everyone talks about, I replied casually. The group exchanged glances before their leader, Jeremy Thorpe, warned us against continuing further. He mentioned something about evil lurking in these woods but quickly brushed it off as nothing more than random occurrences. Despite his half-hearted attempt at scaring us away, we pressed on. It had been hours since we began our search for these elusive stairs when we finally spotted them. They were made of stone, moss-covered, and worn from years of neglect. But what struck me was that they seemed to ascend into nothingness like someone had built them intending to add on to them but never did. As we started to climb them cautiously, an eerie feeling overcame us both. Suddenly, we heard bone-chilling screams from somewhere below us. Panic-stricken, we rushed back down and tried to make our way back toward town when we stumbled upon a gruesome sight. Someone had been violently murdered not too far from where we were. Blood was splattered everywhere, and the body had been ripped from limb to limb. Eric and I couldn't believe our eyes. All we wanted was a simple adventure, and now we were caught up in something far more sinister. We decided to report our findings to the police and quickly made our way back toward town. As the days went on, something still didn't sit right with me. How could it be that we came across another group of people on the same day at the same place? It felt like something was amiss. I racked my brain for any information I could find about them. After countless hours, I discovered that Jeremy Thorpe, their leader, had an extensive criminal record, mostly drug charges and petty theft. It wasn't until weeks later when I mentioned this discovery to a bartender at a local pub, that she told me something that would forever change how I viewed the woods near my hometown. You know, she said cautiously, Jeremy Thorpe. 
He's rumored to be a member of a grotesque cult right here in town. They call themselves the followers of desolation. Word on the street is that they're responsible for countless unsolved murders in these parts. My heart raced upon hearing this revelation. Was this mysterious group somehow connected to our horrifying discovery in the woods? Were Eric and I lucky to have escaped in scathe? While no answers came easily, questions and suspicions continued swirling in my mind. The thought of those stairs plunging into nothingness still haunts me to this day, leaving me with a piercing sense of dread. And as for Jeremy Thorpe and his macabre group, the followers of desolation, their deeds and true names remain shrouded in mystery, perhaps forever eluding the grasp of truth and justice. I couldn't just let it go, knowing that there was a possibility that Jeremy and his group were involved in those gruesome murders in the woods. I needed to gather more information, even evidence, especially since the authorities seemed to have no interest in delving deeper. I confided in Eric about my plans, and he reluctantly agreed to help me. Over the next few weeks, we did our best detective work. We trailed Jeremy and his group, dug through their trash for any incriminating evidence, and talked to anyone who might have encountered them. During this time, I noticed how elusive the followers of Desolation were, as if they could sniff us out. While staking out from a distance one day, I watched Jeremy enter a house on the outskirts of town, where the group seemed to converge frequently. All of them entered through the front door except for one, who closed it behind him. I've got an idea, Eric said suddenly, eyeing an open window on the second floor. He grabbed a ladder from the truck bed and extended it up towards the window. I swallowed hard but knew this was our opportunity to get solid evidence against them. We crept upstairs and stepped into what appeared to be a makeshift altar room. At its center was a table covered with bloodstains, some fresh, others old, surrounded by crude symbols drawn on the floor. Just then, we heard footsteps approaching. Hiding inside a small closet nearby, we peeked through the slightly ajar door as Jeremy entered the room, with several other members following behind him. As we gather tonight, he began ominously. We shall offer yet another soul to our Lord of Desolation. Mark has brought us our newest sacrifice. The group nodded in unison as Mark led in a frightened young woman, her hands bound behind her back and her mouth gagged. My heart raced in terror. I had to act fast before another life was lost to these monsters. All of a sudden, my phone began to buzz in my pocket. To my horror, the caller ID displayed. Private number. It was almost as if they knew we were there and decided to trap us. Jeremy's head snapped in our direction, and his eyes bore into mine through the slight opening in the closet door. I knew we'd been caught, but I couldn't allow this senseless murder to happen. I leaped from the closet, completely catching them off guard. Stop! I yelled, grabbing a crowbar from the cluttered floor. You're not getting away with this. Eric followed my lead, brandishing a wooden plank he found in the closet. A fierce fight ensued, with Jeremy and his group using candles and ceremonial daggers against us. Our surprise attack seemed to be working for a while, that is, until one member smashed a glass jar filled with some type of liquid at our feet. A relentless fire engulfed the room as flames spread quickly across the symbols on the floor. Using my experience as a fire eater and whatever adrenaline was left in me, I breathed deeply before exhaling sharply towards the flames. With expert precision, I managed to control the fire enough for us to find an escape route without it spreading further throughout the house. 
We grabbed the captive young woman along with any evidence we could stuff into our backpacks before scrambling out of that hellish room. As we fled from the house, we could hear sirens approaching in the distance. Jeremy and his remaining followers had already vanished by then. We showed everything we'd gathered to the police. Photos of their lair, cultic writings, blood-soaked clothes, and they finally agreed to open an investigation into the followers of desolation. Media coverage swarmed around this chilling discovery. Though no arrests have been made yet due to Jeremy and his group disappearing without a trace, Eric and I know that we've sparked enough attention to make them think twice before ever resurfacing in our town again. For now, the woods near our hometown feel less ominous, but they will always be a reminder of the horror we faced. As for those stairs leading nowhere, we never ventured back. What other dark secrets they hold remains an unsolved mystery. I have a strange quirk. My mind treats the taste of black coffee like an invigorating electric shock. It sounds bizarre, I know, but it enlivens me every time. It's something nobody else understands. While enjoying my usual strong cup of black coffee outside a cafe, I gazed at the bustling streets of San Francisco around me. So, you guys are finally going to explore those stairs in the woods everyone's been talking about? Asked my friend Richard, sitting across from me. His teasing look reflected both intrigue and disbelief. Yeah, I replied with a nonchalant shrug. I mean, why the hell not? It could be fun, and besides, it's just stairs. What's the worst that could happen? A week later... Richard and I met with two other friends, Clara and Josh, near the entrance to the mysterious woods for our little adventure. We cautiously made our way inside with a mix of excitement and apprehension. As we trudged through the gnarled roots and damp earth beneath us, we stumbled across something quite peculiar, a set of stone stairs leading down into the ground. Lounging on one of the stair steps was a hiker named Thomas Weller, who greeted us with an easygoing smile. He claimed he had camped nearby several times before and considered himself an expert on these woods. We exchanged names, and Thomas was happy to show us around and answer any questions we had about the stairs. Over time, we noticed subtle changes in Thomas's demeanor as we explored deeper into the woods, more withdrawn yet sporadically aggressive in his tone. Soon enough, Clara decided it would be best for us to head back since dusk was approaching. Thomas couldn't hide his disappointment as he escorted us out of the woods. Right at that moment, we stumbled upon a grotesque sight. A mutilated deer carcass sprawled in front of the stairs. Richard tilted his head downward in disgust, while Clara and Josh gasped, their eyes wide with shock. Thomas merely stared at it, his face flaring with confusion. The brutalized deer was too much for us to handle. We practically sprinted out of those woods, never looking back. After that horrifying experience, we made a pact to forget the stairs and every unsettling detail we encountered. Everything seemed to return to normal for a while, until about three months after our trip, when Richard called me, panicking and out of breath. Dude, he stammered, I just heard some crazy news on the radio. It turns out there's been a string of murders in those woods. The cops found human remains scattered around the stairs. I felt the room spin as a myriad of emotions coursed through me, fear, nausea, and utter disbelief. They have a suspect in custody. Richard continued after a pause. His real name hasn't been disclosed yet, but apparently he went by the name Thomas. 
Chills ran down my spine as my memories played back the chilling parts of our woods adventure. Thomas's increasingly erratic behavior. The mutilated deer carcass near the stairs. In a later news story, we learned that Thomas had built a cabin nearby and had been actively targeting hikers who ventured too close to his sanctuary. The police were skeptical when he claimed the stone stairway provided him with an otherworldly power that granted him immunity from the law. They dismissed these claims as delusions befitting a deranged killer like him. It wasn't until weeks later that we found out how Thomas had assumed the Weller persona so seamlessly. He'd killed the real Thomas Weller years ago and posed as him to gain unsuspecting hikers' trust before luring them to their deaths. We didn't venture into any more woods, and needless to say, those stairs remained the stuff of nightmares. The surviving hikers, we included, vowed never to return to the cursed site for fear of history repeating itself. The news about Thomas Weller, the stairs, and the grisly incidents surrounding them still haunt our thoughts and dreams to this very day, growing more poignant with each sleepless night. And so, we are left with a lingering question. Would those bloody events ever have happened if it hadn't been for that mysterious stairway beckoning us into the unknown depths of a chilling adventure? Those sleepless nights started taking their toll on me. I'd find myself aimlessly wandering the city, trying to clear my head of the memories that haunted me. Despite the time that had passed, something always lingered in my mind. A gnawing feeling that urged me to look deeper into Thomas's life and the truth behind those damned stairs. My curiosity ultimately led me down a rabbit hole of research. I spent countless hours reading articles, forums, and even old journals on the subject of those stairs. I uncovered a dark history that stretched back centuries and involved gruesome rituals, unexplained deaths, and supernatural folk tales. But nothing could prepare me for what happened next. One evening, during my usual research session at a local bookstore, I stumbled upon an old journal that stood out from the rest. It was written by an eccentric man named Heinrich Albrecht, who lived in the late 1800s. Within its pages were detailed accounts of his own obsessive investigation into these mysterious stairways in the woods across various parts of the world. As I continued reading Heinrich's work, I noticed something unnerving. His descriptions bore a striking resemblance to our encounter with Thomas Weller and those haunting stairs in San Francisco. He recounted horrifying experiences shared by those who dared descend including eldritch whispers and vile apparitions that lurked beneath the earth. The more familiar this narrative became, the less rational it seemed. There appeared to be some sort of supernatural connection between these mysterious staircases and their malevolent influence on those who ventured close to them. It was as if they had selected Thomas, or worse yet, created him. Late one night after my research sessions at the bookstore, I found myself passing by that very same cafe where Richard and I had discussed our plan to explore the stairs. The memory of our conversation drew me closer to those accursed woods, perhaps as some twisted form of closure. With every step I took, the cold air seemed to grow more oppressive, as if the woods themselves were aware of my presence and defiant of my intrusion. Reluctantly, I approached the site where we had discovered the mangled deer carcass many months ago. As I stood there, something caught my eye. Only a few steps away, hidden amongst the undergrowth, was a camera, one that we must have dropped during our haste to flee from Thomas and the stairs. At first, I hesitated. Touching it felt like plunging into icy water. However, curiosity prevailed, and I picked it up. Upon returning home and scrolling through the images on the camera's screen, I was met with a chilling realization. 
It contained photos of what appeared to be provocative ritualistic symbols carved into the earth at various staircases, including the one we had encountered with Thomas Weller. In that moment, everything clicked into place. Those damned stairs had somehow corrupted Thomas, or perhaps they had drawn his dark soul towards them as some sort of negative energy nexus spot. I knew then that this newfound discovery was meant for me to uncover. Some might say it was fate, while others would argue sheer insanity. For better or worse, I was now compelled to expose this supernatural force and its evil grip on humanity. And so, armed with both knowledge and absolute terror, I began a new mission no longer as a petrified bystander but as an investigator committed to shining a light on the dark corners of this world's greatest untold horrors. Some nights, when sleep evades me entirely and fear chills my bones, I wonder if these stairs will ever release their grasp on my own life. Ultimately, while I may never find all of their secrets or fully comprehend their unearthly obsession with our world, my hope is that by sharing my research and experiences, I can prevent others from falling victim to this malevolent force. Because, rest assured, if the darkness lurking beneath those stairs chose Thomas Weller, who's to say it won't choose someone else? I have a knack for finding valuable things in unusual places. In fact, it was this very talent that led me to uncover something sinister in the heart of Los Angeles, something I could never have predicted nor wished to encounter. I'm Jonah Wexler, a 33-year-old freelance writer and app developer who spent months exploring the mountains of California doing off-trail hiking in search of anything interesting or potentially valuable. My curiosity led me to discover a metal detector and a sense of adventure, which together helped me find anything from old coins to long-forgotten artifacts that I later sold online. This odd hobby brought much-needed excitement into my otherwise mundane life. Now, back to the heart of the story. It started on an unusually cold day in late November when I decided to take a hike around Griffith Park after hearing rumors of some hidden stairs deep within its woods. I couldn't resist the urge to uncover them and perhaps learn the truth about what transpired there. As I arrived at the park, I noticed it wasn't buzzing with its usual swarm of tourists and hikers. The atmosphere was eerie and quiet, save for the occasional rustle of leaves stirred by the wind. Undeterred, I followed the path leading deeper into the woods while consulting an old, hand-drawn map that I found in an online forum post. Hours went by as I trekked through the dense vegetation when suddenly, there they were, the infamous stairs leading nowhere, surrounded by thick foliage that seemed almost determined to keep them hidden. Naturally, my curiosity was piqued as I noticed fresh markings and scratches on the steps, as if someone or something had recently been dragging objects across them. Intrigued by this discovery, I decided to dig around with my metal detector to see if anything interesting had been left behind. And that's when it all changed. While scanning near one of the lower steps, my detector went off. Anxious, I started digging, only to find a discarded cell phone. The device was in near-perfect condition as I turned it on to find the owner's details for returning it. Upon unlocking the phone, I stumbled across recent text messages exchanged between the owner, a woman named Denise and an unknown contact only saved as X. The content of these messages was nothing short of horrifying, photographs of mutilated bodies, cryptic messages about offering sacrifices, and plans detailing elaborate kidnappings. 
I realized then that I had accidentally unearthed evidence of something far darker than hidden stairs in the woods. Panicking, I called my best friend, Ryan. He was skeptical at first but agreed to meet me at the park when he heard fear wavering in my voice. As Ryan and I poured over the messages and photographs on Denise's phone, we felt sick knowing someone in our city was committing such heinous crimes. We debated what to do with the phone and how to proceed until we were interrupted by a chilling sound. Footsteps were rapidly approaching us from an unknown direction, coming closer and closer. As we listened to our hearts racing fiercely in our ears, we made the decision, slipping the phone into my pocket before rushing back to our car parked on a nearby trailhead. Exhausted and terrified from our ordeal, we decided we couldn't keep this knowledge to ourselves any longer. In a last attempt at finding answers before turning the evidence over to authorities, Ryan reached out to his cousin working for the LAPD. Through her contacts inside the police force, Ryan's cousin informed us that they were aware of a violent cult operating deep within Los Angeles called The Ascendant, led by none other than Denise Holloway herself. They were conducting an ongoing investigation into her activities, but had not yet accumulated enough concrete evidence for an arrest. As they thanked us for our willingness to come forward with the phone and the evidence we had found, chills ran down our spines, knowing that we had unknowingly stumbled upon a dangerous secret hidden deep in the heart of Los Angeles. In the end, we handed the phone and its grisly contents over to the police. Sleepless nights plagued us, haunted by the knowledge of what lurked unseen in our city's shadows. And every time I drive past Griffith Park, I shudder at the memory of that cold November day when I found those infamous stairs and unintentionally uncovered a sinister darkness lurking beneath. Over the next few weeks, Ryan and I couldn't stop thinking about what we'd discovered. Every face we passed on the street could be an ascended member, yet there was nothing we could do besides anxiously await an update from Ryan's cousin. Then came the phone call that marked the beginning of the end. It was a Tuesday night when Ryan's cousin called to inform us of a significant update. LAPD had raided a warehouse in downtown LA finding horrifying evidence confirming the cult's existence, sacrificial remains, tools used for torture, and lists of targets that included both prominent city figures and lesser-known locals. Even worse, Denise Holloway had alluded to capture and was now believed to be on the run. Our connection to this case had made us aware of our risks. For our safety, the LAPD insisted we join the other potential targets under their protection. Though it was an inconvenience, it seemed necessary for our survival, so we agreed. Within days, Ryan and I found ourselves in a secure safe house in an undisclosed location. The atmosphere was tense with unease as each of us weighed the risk we posed to each other while simultaneously relying on one another for our collective safety. Then one day, while sitting together in a shared common area, ominous whispers spread as one of the occupants revealed that he overheard a phone conversation. Denise Holloway had somehow infiltrated our safe haven. Was she disguised as one of us or disguised as someone who worked at the safe house? Panic crept in like a thick fog as suspicion mounted toward every person in that room. We couldn't wait for the LAPD to solve this. It seemed clear that if Denise tried anything while she was here, it had happened before they had a chance to contain her. We needed answers faster than they could give them to us. So, using my skill set, I managed to hack into Denise's known email accounts, searching for anything that might reveal her current disguise or her motives. But what I found was more unexpected and horrifying than anything I could have imagined. Deep in Denise's special encrypted emails, I uncovered an exchange between her and a highly ranked LAPD official. 
the same one managing our protection. It appeared that Denise was maliciously feeding misinformation to the department, framing it as clues leading them to other suspected cult members. Some of these clues would then be broadcast on the news or in press conferences. Due to this manipulation, Denise was effectively initiating targeted assassinations while remaining hidden from the law. In a matter of hours, I discovered that we weren't just in danger. We were sitting ducks. We called the LAPD confidentially and showed them my findings, praying they'd believe us. As it turned out, Denise had flown too close to the sun. With this evidence, authorities closed in on her whereabouts, arresting her during a tense standoff that left two cult members dead and several others injured. After weeks of hiding and fearing for our lives, Ryan and I could finally breathe again. The safe house occupants dispersed to return to their lives, changed but fortunate enough to be alive. It wasn't until months later, when LAPD had apprehended enough crucial players of the Ascended, that we finally felt like things were back to normal. As normal as could be after everything we'd been through. It's funny how, from time to time, I'll stumble upon another urban legend or enticing story about some shocking new LA discovery. Intriguing ideas like those still flicker past my eyes with some semblance of allure. But now there's a part of me that hesitates before going down any new rabbit hole or hunting for buried secrets. That cold day at Griffith Park taught me more than just a valuable lesson about being careful in the darkness. It showed me that sometimes it's better to leave unknown staircases unclimbed and let terror-filled treasures remain buried. I've always had an unusual ability, one that most people wouldn't believe. I can hear people's thoughts, their deepest secrets, and their fears. Growing up, I tried to keep it hidden and never revealed it to anyone. It was both a gift and a curse, but I learned to live with it. My name is Finnegan Delaney, but most people just call me Finn. A couple of years ago, I moved with my friends to an old house near the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. There were three of us living together, me, my closest friend Carla Simmons, and her brother Derek. Carla had been my best and only confidant for years when it came to my inexplicable talent. On October 31st, 2017, Halloween night, we decided to take a break from city life and explore the woods around our new home. Derek had heard rumors of strange stairs in the middle of the woods that were rumored to lead nowhere. We didn't pay too much attention to those tales, figuring they were just urban legends or forgotten relics. You guys ready? Carla asked as she laced up her boots. Yeah, Derek replied as we gathered some supplies for our impromptu jaunt into nature. As we trekked through the woods under a dreary gray sky, Carla led the way with a map while Derek trailed close behind her. We followed their familiar yet eerie dialogue as they joked about possibilities for what lay ahead, ancient ruins from past civilizations or perhaps remnants of a cult ritual. Carla slowed down when we heard distant footsteps approaching us rapidly, instinctively using my gift at this moment without revealing its existence. Derek stopped. Alarmed, only picking up curiosity from his thoughts. A stranger appeared on the path ahead, walking deliberately towards our group with a visibly serious countenance. A man in his early forties wearing a warm baseball cap with graying hair, a beard, and sharp, cold blue eyes. Hey there, he said, pausing as he eyed us suspiciously. What brings you folks into these woods? Derek replied casually, just exploring a bit. We heard about some strange staircases around here, 
and we wanted to see for ourselves. The man's eyes narrowed as his tone shifted to a more ominous one. I reckon you should forget about those stairs. You don't want to go anywhere near them. Derek chuckled lightly, but my unease only grew stronger given his thoughts being unreadable, giving me an uncanny feeling I hardly experienced. That sinking sensation prompted me to speak with an uneasy smile. Thanks for the warning. What's your name? He smirked back, his distant eyes refusing any warmth, and walked past U.S. without answering. Slightly drowsy after coming back from an eventful Halloween house party held by friends of friends later that night, Carla mentioned her run-in with the mysterious man in the woods to the other attendees. One of them perked up. Oh, that guy. That's Sam Hayward. Yeah, everyone here knows him. He's what many would consider sketchy and dangerous. He has a notorious reputation for being involved in some gruesome acts like trafficking and gruesome killings of people who crossed him that were easy to keep quiet given his network of acquaintances who dabble in illicit activities. My heart started pounding as the tortuous details circulated through their thoughts like poison spreading through a vine voices rising late into the hallowed night, while tension hung heavy in thick layers that worsened with each word and reeked eerily with flashes of upcoming danger. I sensed intermingling among our identities, the true Sam, a murderer hidden behind an ordinary face. We left the party unhinged by every emotion one could feel coursing throughout my body like adrenaline pursuing answers leaving room for a future haunted by mystery and dread. As I lay in bed that night, haunted by the revelations of Sam Hayward's dark past, sleep evaded me. The feeling of our lives being in danger grew stronger as the night progressed, and I knew I had to do something about it. I shared my concerns with Carla and Derek the following morning, having decided that confronting Sam was the best course of action. After all, he knew where we lived. Though they were apprehensive at first, my friends eventually agreed, understanding that we had limited options. We spent several days gathering whatever evidence we could on Sam's criminal activities to have some bargaining power. My ability to read people's thoughts proved invaluable as we approached potential witnesses and victims. Each story was a descent into a nightmare. It became clear that Sam Hayward was truly a monster hidden among us. With shaky hearts but firm resolve, we set our plan into motion. We sent an anonymous letter to Sam stating that we had evidence of his crimes and demanded a face-to-face -face meeting between us before turning it over to the police. He took the bait and agreed to meet us at an isolated spot in the woods late one evening. The night came cold and infused with tension. I felt a chill run down my spine as Carla, Derek, and I arrived at the chosen spot while gripping whatever makeshift weapons we could find for protection. Tire irons, baseball bats, things that paled before the darkness we suspected in Sam. He appeared from the shadows like smoke with an eerie smile on his lips. Our conversation began calmly enough as we laid out our demands. Leave town immediately or face potential exposure to law enforcement agencies. Sam's curiosity was provoked by our knowledge, his eyes casting nervous glances at me but never challenging my poker face directly or doubting its veracity. His composure cracked ominously when we detailed the specifics of his crimes with chilling accuracy. Thanks to my telepathic skills, Sam knew then that we weren't bluffing. His eyes darkened, and he lunged toward us, brandishing a knife from his jacket. In those terrifying moments, a cacophony of struggle ensued with grunts, cries, and metallic clashes. Sam was larger and stronger than all three of us combined. He fought like a wild animal cornered by hunters. It was almost as though the man was filled with demonic rage. 
or perhaps something darker still. I wondered if my reading of his thoughts had somehow unleashed a torrent of hatred within him. We managed to overwhelm him eventually, landing a few blows that left him bleeding and battered on the ground. The eerie calm that followed gave rise to a poignant realization. Did we become criminals as well by using brute force against Sam? Nobody spoke those words aloud, but we all felt the weight of our murky morality crushing our spirits. Why? Sam gasped between labored breaths and coughs stained by blood. W.Y. D. Do you care? Carla stared at him for several tense moments before finally whispering. Because nobody deserves to be preyed upon if it's possible to stop you. As we watched Sam Hayward accept his fate, defeated and alone in the cold woodland darkness, an odd sense of relief washed over us. We couldn't excuse the violence we had resorted to, but we had potentially saved innocent lives from intersecting with a monstrous presence. We parted ways with Sam Hayward without pursuing justice further, ready to face whatever consequences might arise from our choices. Life began to feel somewhat normal again in our old home near the Rocky Mountains, though there would always be a lingering uneasiness and strange beauty derived from knowing what had transpired within those woods. There were brutal secrets swirling through those trees, echoes of violence, pain, and eventually minor redemption that haunted our souls while we wondered if that chilling encounter would leave us altered forever. Looking back on that unhinged period in our lives, we would always remember the eerie power of the unknown, a hellish birth forged from a stranger's ominous whispers. I might seem like a regular guy, but I have a certain peculiarity. I have an irrational fear of stairs, especially ones in the woods. Yes, stairs. It all began when I went hiking with my friends one day. My name is Castor Aldebaran. Most people just call me Alderman. I've never been a fan of the outdoors. But my close friend Leo Perseus dragged me along on this adventure after hearing about the legendary wooded area near Crescent Cove in Maine. The summer of 2014 was hotter than Hell's Kitchen, but we set out exploring nature regardless. Hey ALD, remember that photo on Reddit of those creepy stairs in the forest? Leo asked with a grin, knowing full well about my phobia. Tempting, but no thanks, I replied sarcastically. Just focus on where we're going. As we continued our hike, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Little did I know what awaited us deeper in the woods. Almost at sundown, we spotted what looked like an old makeshift campsite. We set up tents nearby and built a fire for warmth and cooking. As everyone sat around talking and sharing stories, including our latest conspiracy theories from last week's town hall meeting, which was invaded by Mark Griffin and his band of insufferable rebels, Lisa Karina decided to explore further into the woods. Hey guys, you might want to check this out. Lisa called out excitedly as she motioned for us to follow her. Imagine the combination of shock and horror when we saw it. Stairways rising out of nowhere in these forsaken woods far from civilization. Adrenaline coursed through my veins like liquid ice. It felt surreal and eerie at once. Don't tell me you're scared of those too. Leo remarked sarcastically as he looked over at me with his trademark smirk. I'm just concerned about our safety, man. I mumbled nervously trying to avoid drawing attention to my unusual fear. It wasn't long before we decided this wasn't the place for us. We began packing our camp, getting ready to scuttle back home. Suddenly, a petrifying scream reverberated through the forest. What was that? 
Astafia Salvarez, hyperventilating. Dude, relax. We are in the woods. A raccoon probably stepped on a twig or something, replied Leo dismissively. Leo's dismissal didn't calm our nerves. Unease settled over our group as we hurriedly dismantled camp, trying to get out of those creepy woods. Weeks passed since the hiking trip incident, but it stuck with us like a splinter in our minds. Late one night, while hanging out at Crescent Cove's Lighthouse Cafe, we met an old local fisherman named Salty Colin. He told us he had seen the staircases himself 40 years ago and shared stories of a cult group that carried out ritualistic sacrifices deep within those same woods, led by a vicious man named Zeke Hawthorne and his followers. They butchered innocents and then submerged their bodies in a nearby lake. This chilling news hit closer to home after we discovered that Mark Griffin's gang was related to Zeke's cult when we overheard two of his members talking about the last meeting between both groups at a local bar. The revelation invoked such disgust and curiosity that I couldn't dismiss it anymore. I devoted days to uncovering every historical document, newspaper article, and online posts mentioning these staircases or the cultists' vile actions. Word of another gathering reached our ears through town sources who had warned folks like us against going anywhere near Crescent Cove once the sun set. By this point, it had become more than just a personal phobia. It had turned into my drive to uncover who Zeke Hawthorne truly was. But the man remained an enigma as if his very existence had vanished into thin air. The remaining cult members were few, and they had gone to great lengths to maintain their secrecy. As the sun dipped below Crescent Cove one evening, bringing the sort of closure that a sunset usually implies, I pondered the eerie plight of those unfortunate souls who had encountered Zeke's cult at its zenith. With so many unanswered questions and loose ends, the restless nature of my search would not be quenched. What were those stairs hiding beneath their cloak of wooded isolation? What really happened out there during those rituals? All these thoughts circled my mind as I decided to confront the living members of the cult and put an end to whatever it was they were hiding. I enlisted Leo and Ophius to help me investigate further and after doing a hefty amount of research on Zeke Hawthorne, we discovered that he and his followers used to gather in an abandoned warehouse near the edge of town. Keeping our wits about us, we armed ourselves with everything from flashlights to baseball bats, ensuring we were prepared for any gruesome surprises. We crept through the warehouse, trying our best not to draw attention to ourselves. The air was thick with a sinister energy, making every breath feel like I was inhaling smoke. As we pressed deeper into the building, we heard faint whispers and chants echoing through the maze-like corridors. We followed the disconcerting sounds until they led us through a hidden door and into a dimly lit, large room filled with horrifying sights. There they were, Mark Griffin and his remaining band of cultists, standing around a large wooden table adorned with candles in the center of the room. Horrifying symbols were etched on the floor beneath them as one member laid out grotesque tools before Mark Griffin. On the table was a mutilated corpse. Its lifeless eyes stared back at me as though pleading for help that would never come. My stomach churned while my heart raced violently in my chest, but I knew we had come too far to turn back now. Afius gripped his baseball bat tightly while Leo held a heavy metal pipe in one hand and his phone ready to record everything in another. With subtle nods, we agreed it was time to confront them. Mark Griffin! I called out as we stepped into their line of sight. Your little cult game ends here! Their heads snapped towards us with expressions ranging from shock to pure malevolence. Mark the most sinister of them all, merely sneered before speaking. Oh? 
Did you really think you could waltz in here and bring us down? Leo began to record everything on his phone. Afius held his baseball bat defensively while I refused to let Mark's taunts deter me. We know what you did with C. Cawthorn, I growled. Murdering innocent people in the name of your sick beliefs. The cultists' laughter was like nails on a chalkboard as they formed a circle around us. It was clear they intended to show us no mercy. Let's dance, Lisa said as she stepped out of the shadows, swinging a crowbar at a nearby cultist who went down with agonizing screams. An intense brawl ensued, with each of us using every ounce of strength to overpower these sinister fiends. The warehouse erupted into a cacophony of groans, shattering glass, and the sound of bones breaking. And while it felt like this terrifying battle lasted for hours, it all came to an abrupt end when Mark Griffin was finally backed into a corner with nowhere left to run. Lisa held her crowbar to his throat as I stood in front of her, my breath heavy with anticipation. It's over, I whispered hoarsely. You're not going to hurt anyone else ever again. Just as I moved toward Mark Griffin to restrain him and call the police, he produced a sinister grin that sent shivers down my spine. With a quick motion, he suddenly twisted his body out of Lisa's grasp and fell backward into pitch darkness. We never saw him land. Our relief at having stopped their grotesque sacrifices was marred by our failure to apprehend the mastermind behind it all. In the end, however, we had effectively dismantled their sick operations by apprehending their cult members and gathering evidence implicating them in various crimes. The warehouse was searched by authorities, but Mark Griffin's body was never found. To this day, the bizarre staircases and the elusive Mark Griffin remain a mystery to us all. While I can't erase those chilling memories, I take solace in knowing I played a role in bringing an end to their twisted practices. But you can never be too sure. Whenever I drive past Crescent Cove these days, I can't help but wonder if Griffin is still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the perfect moment to strike again. I've always been fascinated by abandoned structures. Some people collect stamps or play video games, but for me, exploring the forgotten remnants of society sets my heart racing. My buddies and I often go on expeditions to discover new places, delving into their stories and reveling in the eerie silence that envelopes them. My name is Leander Brickton, and recently, while exploring the dense forests near a popular tourist location in the USA, I discovered something truly terrifying. Most of the time, our investigations don't lead to much, just some scattered debris or decrepit buildings overtaken by nature, but this time was different. It was an unusually bright day when my friends Tara, Keith, and I set out on our latest adventure. We had heard rumors of an enigmatic set of stairs leading from the middle of nowhere to the entrance of a hidden cave. Thinking it might make for an interesting excursion, we trekked deep into the woods in hopes of uncovering this mysterious landmark. As we ventured further from civilization and into the wilderness, I couldn't help but notice an overwhelming sense of unease. The sunlight barely penetrated through the dense canopy above us. The silence was strange, unnervingly so, with neither birds singing nor insects buzzing. Finally, after hours of searching, we stumbled upon a steep staircase overgrown with vegetation. It appeared seemingly from nowhere. There were no nearby trails or other signs of human activity nearby. Well, Tara said hesitantly, it looks like we found what we were looking for. As we began our ascend up the treacherous steps, 
I couldn't help but feel as though something was watching us from within the shadows. We pressed onward all the same. As we reached the top of the staircase and crossed into a cramped opening that led into the cave, our attention was drawn to several violent claw marks etched into its walls, as though someone or something had been desperately trying to escape. What the hell could have done this? Keith whispered, his voice tense and uneasy. Before I could answer, a blood-curdling scream pierced the silence. We turned around just in time to see Tara being dragged away into the darkness. We scrambled after her, our heartbeats racing and our panic reaching a fever pitch. However, as we navigated through the twisting cave system, we soon lost track of her, along with whatever had taken her. We found ourselves back outside after what felt like hours of groping through the darkness. Disheartened and terrified for our friend, Keith managed to get a call through to the authorities on his wavering cell reception. We were reunited with civilization hours later when we were met by a detective named Holden Ames. He pulled us aside and asked if we'd ever heard of a man named Winston Rowe, someone who had been terrorizing hikers and urban explorers in the area over recent years. As Detective Ames regaled us with stories of gruesome murders carried out by a group of apparent psychopaths led by Roe, I slowly began to piece together what had happened in that cave. The reality was far worse than any supernatural explanation. Later, I learned that Tara hadn't made it. Her mutilated body was discovered just outside of the cave entrance. Her injuries were consistent with those inflicted by both human and animal attackers. A horrifying puzzle led by a mastermind seemingly hell-bent on destruction for no discernible reason. Winston Rowe remains at large. Knowing that he and his group are still out there is chilling and leaves an unsettling weight in my chest. The knowledge that evil like this exists does not sit well with any of us who knew Terra. The stairs in the woods remain haunting reminders of our harrowing ordeal and the reality that darkness lurks among us, from both within and without. Nothing will ever feel quite as safe again. It was about a month after the terrifying incident in the forest, and the loss of Terra had left a void in our hearts. I struggled to sleep, haunted by the crime we had unwittingly stumbled upon. Keith who'd been my best friend for years, drifted apart from me as we both tried to cope with our grief and fear independently. I couldn't let go of what had happened, though. The idea that someone like Winston Rowe was out there, free to continue his murderous rampage, ate away at me. Despite my better judgment, I decided to investigate Winston and his followers on my own hoping that bringing them to justice would finally set me free from this torment. After days spent scouring online forums and digging through local news archives, I managed to locate a few people who claimed to have seen or met Winston in the past. As more connections were made through the labyrinth of connections and aliases, I started getting closer to uncovering Winston's whereabouts. It was only at this point that I brought Keith back in, knowing that together we could put an end to this horror once and for all. Our investigations led us to a compound deep within the woods, where we believed Winston and his followers were hiding. Keeping our distance initially, we scouted the area for a few days until it became unbearably clear that we had come across the real deal. The seemingly derelict buildings and ramshackle structures hid secrets far beyond anything we could have imagined. We prepared ourselves emotionally before reaching out to Detective Ames once again. Holden, I said hesitantly over the phone. We think we've found Winston Rowe. With only the dim moonlight illuminating the night, our ragtag group, consisting of four squad cars filled with armed officers, slowly approached the compound through gnarled branches and ankle-deep mud. As we made our way deeper into Winston's lair, 
we encountered horrors that words can hardly describe. The decayed remains of what appeared to be wolves were skinned and hung from the rafters. Painful cries emitted from makeshift jail cells holding other victims, waiting for their ultimate fate. We continued cautiously, knowing that our enemies were both humans and animals. Suddenly, the horrifying shriek of one of the officers filled the night air. Jesus Christ! He screamed as we rushed to his side. He'd stepped into a crude bear trap, the metal teeth shredding through flesh and bone. Out of the gloomy shadows, they came. I couldn't tell if they were men or animals, these twisted abominations Winston had created. As we fired our weapons in a futile effort to defend ourselves against these vicious creatures, all hopes seemed lost. But then, in one fateful moment, it happened. A bullet finally found its mark, striking Winston Rowe between the eyes, but not before he let out a final blood-curdling scream that echoed throughout the compound. As he fell lifeless to the ground, so too did his twisted minions, abruptly dropping dead as if their connection to him was severed. The few remaining followers fled in terror. It was over. Detective Ames radioed for backup to get medical assistance for the injured officer and help free those abused and torn souls still trapped within Winston's web. We all knew that their road to recovery would be long and nightmarish. As we stood there in silent shock and awe at what had unfolded before us that night, it became painfully clear that we had brought an end to this chapter, but that night would haunt us forevermore. Years later, I still find myself scanning every crowd for faces like those of those followers who had escaped. Because who knows where they are now? Are they plotting some other heinous plan or stalking their next victim like they once did? And perhaps that's the worst part. The lingering knowledge that although evil has been cut down, its malignant roots may run deeper than we can ever know. In my sleepless nights, I find myself aching for the simple days before I ever decided to explore an abandoned staircase. I long for those more innocent times when my friends were safe and nearby, and the whispers of the night held no darkness. But those days are gone, leaving behind a saga written in blood and tears that will never be forgotten. I've always been fascinated by puzzles and secret codes. They drew me in like a moth to flame. It became a somewhat strange hobby, but the combination of logic and intuition always interested me. But as I said, my interest was seen as peculiar. Little did I know that my skills in solving puzzles would lead me down a dark path and uncover a hidden world closer to home than I ever imagined. It was the summer of 2019 when my friends and I decided to take a trip over the weekend to a popular hiking trail in Colorado. We were all amped up to enjoy some time away from our monotonous routines. The five of us, Alaric, Braden, Cora, Danny, and myself, Elliot Snowden, had been friends for more than 10 years. We knew all there was to know about each other our quirks included. The trail we chose led through the woods and up to an abandoned mining town overlooking majestic mountains. Upon reaching the summit, even though we were out of breath from the uphill trek, we couldn't help but admire the beautiful surrounding landscape. As we explored the remains of the old town, decaying structures with eroded wooden planks and rusting metal supports, we came across something quite unusual a hidden staircase that seemed to lead nowhere. The stairs were made of stone, contrasting starkly with the lush green forest around them. The descending steps ominously disappeared into darkness. Why don't one of you go down first? Danny challenged. Brayden scoffed at him and said, 
Why don't you? Alaric shook his head and changed the subject. We should probably get moving. We left those strange stairs behind us. However, they would not remain dormant for long. Our camping experience resumed as planned. Making s mores by the campfire and sharing laughs filled our evening. That night shattered our brief sense of security. At around 2.30 a.m., screams pierced the night air. Startled awake, we scrambled out of our tents and found Cora lying on the ground just a few feet away. She was hyperventilating and bleeding profusely from her leg. What happened? Alaric demanded worriedly. Through gasps of pain, she replied, I don't know. Someone dragged me, then stabbed me. Panic set in as we raced to attend to her injury and look for any signs of who could have attacked her. The only identifiable clue was a torn piece of paper found nearby. Unfamiliar symbols filled the parchment, and no one could make heads or tails of them, except for me. I recognized it as a substitution cipher and quickly started decoding as my friends called for help. My heart raced as I finally understood the cryptic message it held. You should never have left the stairs. That's when it clicked. Whoever sent this message must have been connected to those strange stairs in the woods. There was something about that place they didn't want us to know. Concerned by what felt like targeted retribution, we knew finding the person responsible was our only hope for answers. It took days of relentless searching in libraries and online forums to find anything even remotely related to the place we had encountered. Finally, we stumbled across whispers of an old mining group known as The Keepers, suspected to have been involved in illegal activities back in their heyday. Rumors were rife that their descendants continued their underground network, unbeknownst to even local authorities. Piecing together scraps of information from secluded online groups, coded messages on internet forums, and similar incidents that took place near those mystery stairs over the years, we eventually managed to draw connections between the keepers and the inexplicable events surrounding that location. There was no going back now. Our names and faces had been seared into the memory of an all too real boogeyman, and they were not likely to let go any time soon. The puzzle master in me had unwittingly stumbled onto something dark, dangerous, and incredibly real. We knew we should have reported our findings to the police, but paranoia took hold of our group. I couldn't shake the feeling that the keepers had eyes on us. Cora's attack was a premeditated and calculated act meant as a warning to stay away. As we hunched over our screens in my dimly lit apartment, desperately scouring for any more clues, a new message from an anonymous source slid into my inbox. It contained an address with the words, Be there tomorrow night at midnight. Learn the truth. My heart pounded as I read it. Was it a trap? It most likely was, but I couldn't let the keepers continue to haunt my life. My friends reluctantly agreed to join me. We couldn't leave each other to face them alone. We arrived at the decrepit abandoned warehouse just before midnight, armed with flashlights and whatever makeshift weapons we could find. The darkness engulfed us as we cautiously stepped inside, our footsteps echoing throughout the empty space. We were soon greeted by a chilling voice. Ah, the fearless group that trespasses on sacred ground, it said sinisterly. A hooded figure emerged from the shadows, followed by several others dressed similarly. I took a deep breath and spoke up. Why did you attack Cora? What is this all about? The hooded figure walked closer and removed their hood, revealing a face that made our hearts sink. It was Danny. We couldn't believe what we were witnessing. Danny? What the fuck are you doing? Alaric growled. 
The betrayal in his voice was palpable. Danny smirked. I'm glad you've taken the bait so easily. You see, the keepers needed fresh blood. They didn't think you would care about some old stairs in the woods or that you'd crack this wide open. Yet here we are. Our knees felt weak as fear washed over us. How could he do this to his own friends? Suddenly, several armed men appeared around us, seemingly out of thin air. This wasn't supposed to happen, Danny continued coldly. But your curiosity has sealed your fate. The room filled with the sounds of safety catches being released as guns were aimed at our heads. We were frozen in place, knowing any movement could be our last. As the armed men prepared to execute us, I frantically searched for a way out of my terror. It was then that I noticed a gas pipe above, and an idea crossed my mind. Kicking over a rusty barrel filled with flammable liquid nearby, I shouted to my friends, Cover your faces! Before anyone could react further, I scraped the metal end of my makeshift weapon against the concrete floor, generating a spark. The liquid ignited into a fiery blaze between us and the keepers. Amidst the chaos, we found our way out through the warehouse's rear exit. As we escaped into the night, we heard the furious screams of Danny and the keepers behind us. We never spoke to Danny again, nor did we see him after that chaotic night. We'd survived the wrath of the keepers by a hair's breadth, but the trauma would haunt us forever. And those strange stares? We kept far away from them, never daring to seek out their secrets again. To this day, I can only imagine what dark mysteries they concealed. And if I had any thought of venturing there again, my haunted memories served as a chilling deterrent. Every time we'd hear about another group of curious souls who stumbled upon those forsaken stairs in the woods or others like them, we'd silently pray for their safety but knew better than to interfere. Sometimes it's better not to know what lurks in the shadows because once you lift that veil, you can never return to blissful ignorance. And if you think it won't happen to you, just remember that's what I once believed too. After all, some secrets are meant to be hidden forever. I've always had an odd fascination with other people's secrets. I'm the kind of guy who can't resist eavesdropping on conversations in cafes and on the bus. You might call me nosy, but I'd say observant. Little did I know that my curious nature would lead me down a path from which there was no return. It all started when my friend Drew invited me to go hiking with him in the Adirondack Mountains. The popularity of this place has risen in recent years, but at the time, it was relatively quiet and untouched. I agreed without hesitation. Being outdoors, away from the city's constant hum, has always helped clear my head. Early one morning, we embarked on our trek through the dense wilderness. As we climbed higher into the mountains, we chatted about everything under the sun, politics, movies, even our shared distaste for pineapple on pizza. Before long, we stumbled upon a set of stairs in what seemed to be the middle of nowhere. They were old, overgrown with moss and vegetation, and looked like they had been abandoned for decades. There was something about this discovery that piqued my interest. We stood there for a moment, dumbfounded by their appearance in such an isolated location. Drew shrugged his shoulders and said ruefully, Well shit dude, I guess we're not the first ones to come out here after all. As much as they intrigued me, something told me not to linger on those stairs for too long. We continued our hike but stumbled upon yet another set of abandoned stairs a few miles later. 
This spurred an uneasy feeling within us. That evening, we made camp beneath a cluster of trees near a small creek. Huddled around our makeshift fire pit while trying to roast hot dogs on sticks, Drew asked cautiously, Hey man, what do you think those stairs are doing out here? I mulled it over for a moment and replied, Something tells me they're not just leftovers from old houses or whatever. It's like they have a purpose, but what the hell is it? Before we could delve deeper into our theories, we heard rustling from behind the trees. We tried to assure each other that it was probably just an animal. But as the sounds grew closer and more frantic, it was clear that wasn't the case. Suddenly, a woman burst through the brush, her clothes torn and bloodied. She was screaming something incomprehensible, but her terror was palpable. It wasn't until she spotted us that she shouted with clarity, Denver Dawes! You need to run! An icy chill went down my spine as I realized I had no idea who this woman was, but she knew who I was. Before I could question her further, she was gone, disappearing into the darkness. Drew and I spent hours speculating on how this stranger knew my name. Our fears only deepened when we discovered the remains of an old camper nearby. The door hung wide open, with dried blood splattered across the exterior. We managed to find our way back to civilization by daylight with our somewhat tarnished sense of adventure hanging heavy over our heads. But the unsolved mystery of what transpired in those woods refused to leave me be. Several months later, I received a message from a reporter named Janie who heard about our experience in the woods and wanted to interview me. During our phone call later that evening, I asked Janie if she'd learn anything about those stairs and their possible connection to Denver Dawes. There was hesitance in her voice as she answered. It seems Denver Dawes isn't a person, rather, it's an old group of criminals who were known for abducting people and leaving their victims dead or barely alive on those stairs. No bodies have been found, but there have been countless reports of blood and disturbing sights over the years. People believe it's still going on. The revelation sent chills down my spine, and I couldn't shake the image of that woman from that unforgettable night her terror-stricken face forever etched into my mind. Though there was no solid resolution to our terrifying experience in those woods, the sinister myth of the Denver Dawes group haunted me, taunting me with whispers of unsolved mysteries and hidden secrets. I became obsessed with the story Janie had given me, spending countless hours researching the Denver Dawes group and even contacting some of the people who had reported encountering the mysterious stairs in the woods. I sought out those who had survived their experiences or knew someone who hadn't been so lucky, piecing together a terrifying pattern that left an icy trail of dread in my veins. Eventually, my digging led me to an online forum where people shared information on illegal activities in remote locations. It wasn't long before I found a thread dedicated to Denver Dawes and, within that thread, a user who claimed to have insider knowledge of the group's activities. Meet me at the old Franklin warehouse on 5th Street. Friday, midnight. Come alone if you want answers. They had messaged me. While I knew this could be dangerous, my burning desire for answers outweighed any fear that would have otherwise held me back. Upon arriving at the warehouse, my hands trembled as I clutched a flashlight, casting eerie shadows around the abandoned space while waiting for the stranger to arrive. Suddenly, I heard footsteps approaching and demanded they reveal themselves immediately. I was involved with Denver Dawes, stuttered a man in his late thirties as he emerged from the darkness. But I just couldn't stomach it anymore. 
He went on to divulge horrifying details of how the group abducted people and subjected them to unimaginable acts of violence before leaving them on those stairs as some twisted form of ritual. Feeling sickened by his words, I pressed for help in putting an end to their reign of terror once and for all. The man hesitated but ultimately agreed, providing me with enough information to take down key members of the organization. With newfound resolve, we spent weeks gathering evidence and planning our moves carefully until one night when storm clouds gathered overhead, a perfect cover for our swift intervention. Under the cover of darkness and heavy rainfall, we infiltrated their hidden compound nestled deep within the woods. As we crept through the dense forest, grisly scenes unfolded before our eyes, victims being subjected to Denver Dawes' torturous methods. Drenched and fueled by adrenaline, we launched our attack on the unsuspecting criminals while simultaneously alerting the police. The sounds of gunfire and desperate screams filled the air as we fought to bring justice to all those who had fallen prey to this monstrous group. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the police arrived in full force, and the remaining members of Denver Dawes were arrested or killed in the firefight. Those who survived were left with deep scars, both physical and emotional but a sense of relief began to permeate as it became clear that Denver Dawes would no longer plague our world. As I stood atop one of those mystifying staircases, splattered with blood and remnants of violence, I couldn't help feeling both triumphant and hollow. I found my answers in the darkest depths of humanity, but at what cost? My innocence was gone forever tainted by the knowledge that such evil could exist among us. Over time, life slowly returned to normal as I tried to put the horrors behind me. But occasionally, while I lay in bed at night or sat alone in a quiet room, I would recall that woman's terrified face as she screamed my name in warning. I never discovered her true identity, but somewhere deep within my heart, I held on to a glimmer of hope that she had found solace from her tormentors. Maybe, just maybe, she was finally free from the darkness that haunted her. For me, those events would forever linger on as nothing more than a ghostly tale best left untold, a harrowing journey that transformed me from an innocent bystander into a man forever changed by his quest for truth. But maybe, just maybe, that was the price paid for staring into an abyss so deep that it threatens to swallow you whole. And maybe, just maybe, I discovered that there are some secrets better left buried beneath the cold, unforgiving soil. Secrets like Denver Dawes and those haunting stairs in the woods. I've always been good at picking locks. My father taught me when I was 12, and it quickly became one of my favorite hobbies. Little did I know that this peculiar skill would save my life one day. It was March 15th when the nightmares started, the day after I discovered a mysterious set of old stairs in the woods behind my grandparents' house. These stairs didn't lead anywhere. They were just sitting there in the heart of the forest. The mossy steps were far from any path, yet they looked like they hadn't been abandoned for long. Being an adventurous teen, I climbed a long flight of steps to see if anything interesting was at the top. I'm still not sure what I thought I would find up there, but whatever it was, it changed everything. The moment my foot touched the top step, an eerie chill hung in the air. Everything went silent, and for some reason, I glanced down at my watch. It was frozen at 3.33 p.m. Suddenly feeling uneasy, I hurriedly made my way back down and headed home. Sometimes small things can cause a chain reaction that we don't expect. My name is Devin Dyson Carter, 
but you can call me Dyson because most people do. Ever since that day on those stairs, my life has been unlike any other time in its 16 years of existence. Night after night, I had nightmares featuring horrific scenes, a man with a horribly deformed face stalking innocent victims and torturing them in gruesome ways. He always left a bloody mess behind, mutilated bodies dismembered and discarded like mere trash. Every morning after waking from those nightmares, I could feel bile burning in my throat, but I convinced myself it must only be intrusive thoughts getting out of hand. Things escalated when news spread throughout our tiny town about strange disappearances and gruesome crimes happening under mysterious circumstances, their details hauntingly similar to my nightmares. Uncertainty and fear filled our town like toxic gas, as everyone wanted to know who was responsible but no one actually had a clue. I heard it was some psycho from out of town who escaped from an asylum. My friend Mike commented as we sat in the local diner. Yeah, I overheard my parents talking about it last night, Laura replied, taking a sip of her coffee. My dad said that whatever sick bastard is doing this knows what he's doing, and he's not leaving any evidence behind. The conversation continued, but I soon zoned out, feeling increasingly uneasy. The dreams tormented me at night, and during the day I felt as if I was being watched by some malevolent figure lurking in the shadows. It was driving me mad. One evening, after an unnerving run-in with an unfamiliar face watching me from the edge of the forest, I met up with Mike and Laura to vent my unease and hear their opinions on the matter. As we sat on a park bench bathed in moonlight, Laura noted something alarming. You know Dyson, she said cautiously, her voice low so no one else would hear. My brother Ryan was chatting with his friend Travis from the police force yesterday. He mentioned something strange you should probably know about. Apprehension spilled over me like hot coffee as she hesitated before continuing her story. Laura explained that rumors had started to circulate amongst law enforcement officials that there were seven possible suspects involved in these gruesome attacks, seven twisted individuals coordinating their malicious efforts in some depraved killing spree. The name they all shared whispered fear into our hearts the seven staircase killers. Horrified by this new information, I couldn't shake off the feeling that my nightmares were no mere coincidence. They were somehow connected with these real-life horrors plaguing our community. In my panic, I confided my suspicions to Mike and Laura, who struggled to wrap their heads around the idea but seemed sympathetic and concerned. The weeks crawled by, and the toll of sleepless nights brought me to the breaking point, so I turned to a local therapist, Dr. Peterson, hoping he would help me get through this dark time. Dr. Peterson just so happened to be filling in for our regular school counselor that week. Coincidentally, he was also helping with the police investigation into the staircase killers, which made him a knowledgeable voice in our community that people trusted. During one of our sessions, he suddenly looked at me intently and said, Dyson, have you ever considered the possibility that, and I don't say this lightly, the killers might be trying to communicate with you through your dreams? My heart pounded in my chest. But that doesn't make any sense. I sputtered. Why me? Why should I be the psychic conduit for a group of violent criminals? I don't think it's by accident or pure coincidence that your dreams started after your encounter with those mysterious stairs. There may be something about that location or something about you that has drawn these malevolent entities into your life. That night, sleep came restlessly as I tossed and turned, anxiety keeping me company. Awaking from another horrific dream set in an empty warehouse on the outskirts of town, my thoughts race. How would I ever be free of these nightmares? 
Two days later, Laura told me her brother had heard from his police contact. Travis mentioned a lead that suggested one of the staircase killers might have been spotted near the same forest where I'd first discovered those ancient stairs. Without a second thought or consideration for our safety, Mike, Laura, and I made grim plans to venture into the woods, determined to put an end to our town's suffering. Armed with flashlights and a crowbar, we ventured into the nighttime shadows. Fueled by adrenaline and terror alike, we approached the dreaded staircase slowly. A rotten smell assaulted our senses as we climbed, step by careful step. At the top of the staircase lay a guard too chilling to face head-on, an unconscious man, his limbs twisted at unnatural angles in proximity to what appeared to be a shallow grave recently dug made my stomach acidic. What the hell? Mike whispered hoarsely. Is this, isn't this Dr. Peterson? Laura stuttered in disbelief. As both fear and revulsion washed over us, we descended from the cursed staircase, leaving the grisly scene behind us. At the police station, we reported our findings in excruciating detail. Officers swarmed the location, confirming our story and arresting Dr. Peterson as he later regained consciousness. The following days exposed more about Dr. Peterson's depravity. Along with six other psychopaths, he had orchestrated gruesome crimes under the moniker of the Seven Staircase Killers using me as an unwitting message-bearer through unknown psychic manipulation. With Dr. Peterson and his associates imprisoned, the town breathed a collective sigh of relief as normalcy slowly returned. Months went by without incident. My sleep was once again calm and undisturbed, though I doubted my life would ever truly feel normal again. Late one evening, as I sat on my porch reflecting on how much had changed, a rough voice sounded from behind me. Dyson Carter. I jolted in fright, turning to face a disheveled man I had never seen before. How many people have you convicted? His piercing eyes stared at me intensely. How much have you really done to stop this madness? I... I don't... Who are you? What do you want? Fear crackled through my voice. The man smiled bitterly before revealing a worn scrap of paper containing a list written in trembling handwriting. The strange symbols from my nightmares appeared next to Dr. Peterson's name and six others. Your job is not yet finished. His voice was cold and detached. As he turned away from me into darkness, he concluded with an eerie statement. The fate of those souls rests on your shoulders. As seconds passed that felt like hours, the realization dawned upon me. While I may have helped apprehend some twisted individuals who operated under the guise of the seven staircase killers, there were others out there that were willing to take up their mantle. Others who would perpetuate this cycle of violence and who would continue to try to manipulate people like me to bring their sinister plans to fruition. And so, my fight continues against the shadows that plague both my dreams and the waking world. My journey is far from over. My cursed path is yet unwinding before me, riddled with never-ending darkness that can be either ignored nor wholly defeated, but faced head-on with every ounce of determination I have. My alarm system has been acting strange lately, going off for no reason at night. I reset it over and over again, but the problem persists. My heart races each time, even though I know there's probably no one in my house. I'm Franklin Hawthorne, a computer security specialist living in Portland, Oregon. The sun was setting when my friends and I decided to go for a hike. 
We wanted to capture some amazing views and have some alone time in nature. The trail we chose would take us deep into the woods, far from any urban civilization. I heard rumors about this place, said Derek, one of my closest friends. Apparently there are stairs somewhere in these woods. Come on, man, I scoffed. We're all grown-ups here. Spare us the urban legends. I swear I'm not making it up, he insisted. As we made our way deeper into the forest, an eerie atmosphere began to settle around us. A thick fog had started rolling in, making it almost impossible to see where we were going. We all stuck close together, chatting with each other to relieve some tension. Suddenly, there they were, a set of stairs right in the middle of the forest. Seemingly out of nowhere, they appeared quite old and overgrown with moss. See, what did I tell you guys? Derek exclaimed. Well, that's creepy, whispered Meredith, another friend on our little trek. Together, we cautiously approached the stairs and inspected them closely. There didn't seem to be anything particularly sinister about them, just an ordinary set of steps seemingly leading nowhere. While we were trying to decipher the mystery of these steps in the woods, suddenly we heard screaming coming from behind us. Terrified and unsure what to do next, we noticed that another friend who had been trailing behind us, Lily, was missing. Guys, Lily's gone, cried out Tori, her eyes full of fear. Meredith's hands began to shake as we all panicked. I don't understand. She was just here a second ago. Derek had his phone out, desperately trying to call emergency services, but there was no signal in the woods. Just when we thought that things couldn't get any stranger, someone new appeared out of the fog. Melinda, who had been Lily's roommate for several years before she disappeared a few months ago, claimed that the stairs were for ritualistic purposes. Fearful that our friend had become the latest victim of these mysterious stairs and the unknown group responsible for their construction, we decided it was best to follow Melinda's lead. Enraged by the harm inflicted upon Lily and disgusted by their heinous actions, I picked up a rock and violently struck one of them in the head. We ultimately escaped that dreadful forest with our injured friend in tow. When we reported the incident to the police days later, they revealed some shocking news. They had investigated a series of murders in those woods. The main suspect is a seemingly normal accountant named David Sanders, who went missing around the time that Melinda disappeared. They believed he'd been leading some sort of cult deep within those woods that worshipped human sacrifice and lived off the grid. My mind raced as I tried to connect the dots between what we experienced in those woods and David Sanders' disappearance. It couldn't just be a coincidence, could it? Curiosity consumed me as I found myself searching internet forums late into the night, finding others who discovered strange stairways in remote locations across America. It wasn't until weeks later, when we visited Lily at her rehabilitation center, that we finally understood how Melinda knew about these sinister events. In hushed voices, she explained to us that she had crossed paths with David Sanders during her time living on the streets after escaping her nightmare ordeal in the woods. He shared details about the twisted cult he had led, hinting that they may not have been their only victims. To this day, the whereabouts of David Sanders remain unknown and lost in the darkness. Every so often, I catch myself wondering what other innocent souls may have stumbled upon those abandoned stairways, unaware of the horrors awaiting them at their summit. Months had passed, and although it was hard to shake the terrifying memory of our experience in the woods, life started to resemble some semblance of normalcy. I was still haunted by what happened, but I tried to focus on my work and spend time with my friends. 
One night Derek invited me out for a drink at a local bar. As we sat at the counter nursing our beers, Derek couldn't stop talking about a strange forum he found online. He excitedly pulled out his phone and tapped away at the screen. It seems like there's another group out there that's connected to David Sanders. He told me. Curious, I grabbed his phone and scanned the threads. They detailed countless stories similar to ours. Staircases in remote areas, disappearances, and encounters with elusive cult members. I was equally intrigued and horrified. Do you really think we should be looking into this? I asked skeptically. Isn't poking around what got us into trouble last time? Derek hesitated before replying. It could help us find the answers. Just imagine how many people out there are suffering because of them. In that moment I was torn. The past few months have taught me that there are countless stories waiting to be uncovered, each darker than the last. But couldn't these explorations make things worse? My thoughts were interrupted as my eyes locked onto a figure standing just outside the bar's window, David Sanders himself. At least it sure looked like him. Every detail of his face matched his missing persons poster. Tugged by a mix of terror and rage, I shoved past Derek and raced out the door after him. He turned around briefly before sprinting down the alley nearby. Hey! I shouted as I ran with full force at him. I was gaining on him quickly when he vanished into an old abandoned building nearby. The eerie building instantly filled me with dread, but I couldn't let him disappear again. I inched into the darkness, adrenaline fueling my journey down a narrow corridor. This place had clearly been used recently. Flickering candles lit up strange symbols and drawings on the walls. As I rounded a corner, I suddenly found myself face to face with David Sanders. There was no doubt that he held other people's lives in his twisted hands. The sinister gleam in his eyes sent shivers down my spine, even as they begged me to just turn back. After a moment of glaring silence, David finally spoke, his voice as cold as ice. You shouldn't have pursued me. You escaped once before. You won't be so lucky this time. Sweat streamed down my face as I responded defiantly. What you're doing is sick, and it needs to stop. I won't allow you to hurt anyone else. His menacing laugh echoed through the halls of the building. You don't have a choice. It all happened so fast. David lunged at me with something sharp glinting in his hand. He slashed at me violently, knocking me to the ground where I lay bleeding and helpless. A vile grin spread across his face as he whispered, You'll make an excellent addition to our rituals. And then he was gone. As I lay there in pain, my vision blurred and my consciousness fading away, Derek burst through the door and came running towards me. He managed to get me out of that hellish building in time to call for help. That night's events weighed heavily on us all. Visits from the police became more frequent, but even their ongoing investigations couldn't bring a sense of closure or calm. However, with Lily's recovery and her reconnection with Melinda as she adjusted back into society, having defied her own harrowing experience, we started to believe that we were resilient enough to face whatever darkness might be waiting around the corner. As for that despicable cult, that sinister organization continued to elude the authorities. The urban legends surrounding their existence persist even now, with those mysterious staircases connecting them all. But every now and then, somewhere deep in the dense woods, you can hear whispers of vengeance echoing through the trees. We blended back into society, but we never truly forgot. We are both the victims and the survivors, always watching and waiting for a chance to bring justice to the predators hidden in our world.
one staircase at a time. I broke my leg about three years ago. I had an operation and they implanted a rod and some pins in my tibia. Because of the pins, I can't bend my wrist more than 30 degrees. It's not too debilitating, but it does get in the way whenever I try to do things like bowling or push-ups. I also can't join my friends during their workouts at the gym, so I've learned to adapt to other forms of exercise, like hiking or swimming. One day, when I went on my usual solo hike through the woods of a local park on the outskirts of a small Vermont town, something happened that would change my life forever. The path snaked through an area peppered with tall trees, mostly pines and spruces. As the trail wound deeper into the woods, I came across an unexpected sight, a long abandoned set of stairs. They seemed out of place as if someone had uprooted them from a house and placed them in the middle of nowhere for no apparent reason. They looked unsteady. Moss covered each step while vines snaked around the cracked railing. Hey man! My friend Brian called out from somewhere behind me. Whoa! You scared me! I said, half-jokingly, as we both began to inspect the decrepit stairs. Brian had joined me on this particular hike since he was also sick of hitting the gym all day every day. Intrigued by the anomaly, we decided to see where these sinister steps led. The forest grew denser around us as we climbed higher up the stairs and further into the unknown. Suddenly we heard a rustling in the bushes next to us and discovered a few empty bags on the ground that appeared to have been hastily thrown away. A few moments later, there followed a sharp metallic clanging sound mixed with muffled shouts ahead of us. Should we check that out? Brian asked hesitantly. Yeah, let's see what's going on. I replied, curiosity getting the better of me. We moved cautiously toward the noise, hearts pounding. The area we stumbled upon looked like a makeshift campsite. All around, there were signs of disturbance, broken beer bottles, torn clothing, upturned chairs, all indications that someone had left in a hurry or struggled. In the middle of the ruckus lay a man with deep cuts covering his body and blood pooling around him. I was no medical expert, but there was something very wrong with his injuries. The wounds seemed brutal and precise at the same time almost as if they were inflicted by an experienced hand. As panic set in, Brian and I scrambled around, searching for any sign of life or movement, while trying to figure out who or what could have caused such horror. We spotted torn pieces of paper strewn among the wreckage and discovered extremely unnerving photographs taped to them. Each picture showed people's faces we recognized from town, friends, neighbors, and acquaintances, all missing people we had only heard rumors about. Our blood ran cold when we realized the photos were taken at this very site, clearly implicating whoever stayed here and their disappearances. We knew it wasn't safe to stay any longer and decided it would be best to get help from the police. We reported everything to the authorities in town as soon as we could. A few days after our harrowing encounter in the woods, I overheard an off-duty cop at the local bar discussing recent events. The investigation led them to arrest a notorious group of sadistic individuals who called themselves the Black Forest Syndicate. Rumor had it they lived by a twisted moral code where innocent people were rounded up, tortured, and eventually murdered for sport. By sheer luck or divine intervention, Brian and I hadn't come face to face with these antagonists that day in the woods. Their names remain a chilling mystery to this day, as they withheld their true identities from both the authorities and the public. 
As for those stairs in the woods, they're all I think about whenever I close my eyes. At night, that cursed spot revisits me, haunting my dreams and making me question everything I once knew as safe and ordinary. Ever since that day, I couldn't shake the image of the abandoned stairs and that makeshift campsite. It became my mission to find out the real identities of the Black Forest Syndicate. Brian, still heavily affected by what we witnessed, decided to step back and give up on it. My days turned into a blur of visiting libraries, pouring through online forums, and drowning myself in true crime accounts for any hint of a connection to our small Vermont town. Weeks turned into months, but all my efforts seemed futile. One evening, after yet another dead-end lead, I was feeling disheartened and found myself back at the local bar, nursing a drink. As if on cue, a stranger sat next to me. He had a sinister air about him that sent an immediate chill down my spine. Although the temperature inside made it unnecessary for one to wear a hat and sunglasses indoors, he was doing so. His demeanor betrayed traces of anxiety as he sipped his whiskey. What do you want? Are you investigating those gruesome murders up in the woods too? He asked in a half whisper. I was taken aback by his bluntness yet intrigued by his bizarre demeanor, especially as he stealthily gazed around before stirring his drink with an unwavering slight flick of his wrist. I nodded hesitantly. The man leaned closer to me, reeking of nervous perspiration mixed with stale alcohol. You're playing with fire, he muttered before finishing his drink and walking out of the bar without so much as a backward glance. The following day, while checking through another batch of forum postings about unsolved crimes dating back decades across Vermont towns, something struck me. Each time someone tried uncovering details on this syndicate or its members, they'd receive veiled threats or end up being found with gory ritualistic cuts on their bodies, then dumped in different locations across town. I was starting to feel uneasy about the stranger's warning and contemplated stopping my investigations until one day it dawned on me. Each murder occurred alongside or directly opposite some odd structures abandoned stairs, wells, even outhouses. My passion reignited. I began mapping out these locations and managed to sketch the symbol of a twisted tree that seemed to be at the epicenter of their activities. I informed the authorities, hoping they'd follow up aggressively on this lead. Two weeks had passed, and despite my expectations, it felt as though everyone had turned a blind eye to my findings. Frustrated and desperate for answers, I decided to investigate the odd structures by myself. Starting with the epicenter, I ventured deeper into the woods when I noticed smoke in the distance. As I walked closer, I saw a large gathering around a bonfire. Their faces were concealed by wooden masks intricately carved into the twisted tree design. It took me a numbing moment to recognize one of them. My heart skipped a beat when I saw that odd stir of whiskey just days prior. A sinister grin spread across their faces while one masked figure started towards me, each step echoing throughout the woods. A primal surge of adrenaline shot through my veins, somehow mustering enough energy to flee despite my heart nearly collapsing in horror. I spent hours running through those woods and stumbled out onto the familiar town streets utterly exhausted but grateful to be alive. The nightmare wasn't over yet. One morning, as I went to retrieve my newspaper from the doorstep, I discovered an envelope with no address or return information, just my sketch inside bearing one spine-chilling correction, an additional twisted branch extended from that tree symbol, invited by unknown forces, no doubt malicious in intent. I knew it was over, including any idea of normal life returning. Whatever evil lay concealed among us had marked me for disturbing their sanctum. 
their sinister games perpetually reaching out until capturing their prize or exhausting all viable options, which would be my gruesome demise. I've had my fair share of odd experiences, but one that stands out happened a few years ago and has stayed with me ever since. I decided to ride my dirt bike on an old trail that I hadn't touched in years. The last time I used it was after losing a bet with my sister. I had to sneak into our neighbor's yard and steal one of their garden gnomes. Man, I felt so stupid for that but it's these little memories that brought me back to the place. The trail started just outside Greenwood, Indiana, a pretty popular place around here. Winding its way through trees and hilly terrain, it eventually led deeper into the surrounding woods. At one time, there was said to be a set of stairs somewhere in that forest. They say it belonged to a house that was long since demolished, but the stairs remain as an eerie reminder. As I rode through the woods, I began to feel uneasy for some unexpected reason. Suddenly, my dirt bike stalled out, bringing me to an abrupt stop not far from the supposed location of the stairs. What the hell? I grumbled to myself as I tried to fix whatever caused the stall. Out of nowhere, a man covered in what looked like fresh blood stumbled into view. His eyes were wild and frantic as he locked them on mine. Help me, please! He gasped between breaths before collapsing in front of me. Panicking, I didn't know what to do other than call my friend Jim, who lived nearby. Jim! Dude, you need to get here now! There's this blood-covered guy in the woods. It's insane! I spewed over the phone without even giving him a chance to say hello. You're not messing with me? Like that gnome thing? Jim asked skeptically. No! This is serious! We need to get this guy some help! Hearing the urgency in my voice, Jim agreed and hurried over to meet me. As we covered the injured man with a jacket, Jim recognized him. Hey, isn't this Paul Bromley? You remember that guy from high school? I didn't realize it was Paul at first, but now his face looked familiar. We called an ambulance and waited for help to arrive, but given the amount of blood he was losing, I wasn't sure if he'd make it. Weeks passed, and while Paul slowly recovered in the hospital, Disturbing rumors spread around town about a group of people who would go out and relish in acts of severe violence. This group went by different names depending on who you talked to, but no one knew exactly who comprised it. Were they even real or just figments of twisted imaginations? Jim and I decided to venture back into the woods, looking for any clues about what had happened to Paul. We eventually stumbled upon the stairs in the woods. They were unsettling, a perfectly preserved remnant in the midst of overgrowth. It felt almost as if their sole purpose was for some grisly acts that no one knew about. As we climbed up, we found bloodstains scattered across the stone steps. We also discovered a leather-bound journal lodged between two rocks. It contained detailed descriptions of horrifying crimes committed against innocent people, as if memorializing each act. The members of these violent gatherings reveled in their disregard for human life. Jim carefully showed me one passage that detailed finding a victim with his motorbike stranded, someone eerily similar to Paul's situation. Whoever wrote this seems to have had a hand in what happened to Paul, I said, nauseated by the details imprinted on those pages. As soon as we put together enough evidence, we gave everything we found to the police. They confirmed that some older unsolved cases had striking similarities with the gruesome acts described in the journal. 
The person or persons responsible had been operating for years, hiding under an ominous umbrella of secrecy and terror. As we were preparing to leave the woods, it hit us that all these years, we had ridden on these trails, completely oblivious to the sinister group lurking nearby. Days after handing over the evidence, we unexpectedly received some chilling news. During a routine traffic stop, a police officer recognized one of the people detained as a suspect belonging to this hideous group. Upon searching his vehicle for evidence, they found a list of names, including Paul and a handful of other victims. To this day, the group remains a haunting memory in our town. It feels like an unresolved nightmare that ended in pain for too many people. And though the gang was apprehended, there were still more mysteries to uncover before I could truly be at peace. In an attempt to unmask the remaining secrets of this heinous group, I continued my own investigation. I decided to reach out to people from Paul's past, attempting to gain any insight into why he was targeted. Following a forgotten internet breadcrumb trail, I stumbled upon a forum dedicated to discussing local gruesome events, events like the ones described in the journal we found in the woods. My skin crawled as I scrolled through countless threads detailing the horror and brutality inflicted on innocent victims. As much as it made me sick, it was vital that I face these twisted stories hoping to find some clue or connection back to Paul and the twisted group responsible for his suffering. As I dove even deeper into these terrifying online discussions, something caught my eye. A post from an anonymous user who claimed they had information about this violent cult and their reasoning behind each merciless act. The user went into gruesome detail about their initiation process which involved each member proving themselves by committing shocking acts of violence and reveling in their disdain for human life. Their ultimate goal? An elusive mastermind who rewarded them with a sense of power and purpose, one they had never experienced before. With trepidation, I continued reading every post by this anonymous user. Slowly but surely, several pieces began falling into place. These violent acts were somehow all connected through a sick and intricate web spun by this mastermind. As days turned into weeks of obsessively poring over every post written by the unknown informant, it became clear that whoever was behind the keyboard knew far more than they should, more than any bystander or ever-distant accomplice would be privy to. The truth hit me like a punch to the gut. This anonymous source could very well be the mastermind I had been searching for. The sick and twisted puppet master pulling the strings of these horrific events, coaxing followers down a dark and dangerous path of violence and destruction. Knowing what I had to do, I took my findings to the police. After a thorough investigation and cooperation with their cybercrime unit, they managed to trace the user's IP address. To my shock and disbelief, the origin of these sickening confessions led them directly to Paul's hospital room. Paul was the mastermind all along. In a twisted turn of events, it was revealed that Paul had orchestrated his own brutalization as a ploy to throw everyone off his scent while he recovered in the safety of a hospital bed. He had been controlling this sinister web from behind impersonal screens and watching lives unravel. When presented with the evidence against him, Paul confessed everything without hesitation, smirking at our collective horror. The police arrested him immediately, and he was whisked away, no longer the victim but instead a monster in our midst. Inexplicable anger and bitter heartbreak consumed me. A former high school acquaintance turned perpetrator, orchestrating unimaginable terror all while we searched tirelessly for answers. The unsettling reality still lingers. A man who almost lost his life now faces a long road ahead behind bars, 
a future that only seemed fitting for someone who had manipulated so many through fear and blood-curdling cruelty. The twisted story that started with an innocent dirt bike ride has come to an end. However, I can't help but feel uneasy knowing that monsters truly do walk among us wearing familiar faces. And though the nightmare has reached its conclusion, I am forever reminded that some stories have no happy endings when darkness resides behind every corner, waiting to strike again. As a kid, I always found solace in collecting peculiar items. I had a fascination for rare and exotic things, each piece a unique addition to my ever-growing gallery of curiosities. My name is Nolan Wallensford, and little did I know that this strange hobby would play a significant role in the most horrifying experience of my life. It all started when my friends and I decided to take a trip to Pine Ridge Forest, a popular destination not too far from our hometown. It was the perfect opportunity to find new additions to my collection. Accompanied by Tom, Jack, and Karen, we journeyed on foot, taking in the crisp air and the vibrant foliage. As we ventured deeper into the woods, we discovered a mysterious set of stairs leading up to nowhere. Tom couldn't resist and climbed them, shouting about conquering invisible tree houses. We laughed along until Jack noticed something unusual, a previously unnoticed deer trail that seemed to originate from the bottom of these abandoned stairs. Fueled by adventure-seeking souls, we embarked on the new path. The further we followed it inland, the darker and denser our surroundings became. Strangely enough, no animal sounds reached our ears. Only an eerie silence enveloped us. It's getting late, Karen said nervously. Shouldn't we head back? But this place is amazing, I implored while pocketing an unusual feather I found on the ground. Jack sighed but obliged. Fine, he said reluctantly. We'll come back tomorrow. That night, as we gathered around the campfire, we continued to speculate about why those mysterious stairs were even there in the first place. A sense of uneasiness filled the air despite our laughter and jokes. Our minds were preoccupied with thoughts about what lay beyond that creepy trail. The following day, curiosity got the best of us all, and we returned to explore further along the deer trail. As we walked, we noticed unnerving red stains on the plants and trees. The uneasy feeling only grew when we stumbled upon a gruesome discovery, the mutilated remains of several animals scattered throughout the area. What the hell happened here? Tom shuddered, trying not to vomit at the sight. We need to leave now, Karen insisted, fear rising in her voice. However, Propelled by morbid curiosity, I convinced everyone to stay a bit longer. We pressed on, finding more and more disturbing evidence of something vicious lurking in Pine Ridge Forest. Finally, our fears were confirmed when we found ourselves face to face with a group of human cannibals feasting on their latest kill. Their faces were twisted into grotesque grimaces of insatiable hunger as they tore into their meal with savage glee. They've seen us! Jack shouted as realization dawned on our faces. Panic surged through our veins as we fled for our lives. Miraculously, we escaped with only minor injuries and made it safely back to civilization. Horrified, we reported everything to the authorities, only to be met with a skeptical response. That was until I produced my bizarre findings from that sinister place, particularly the weird feather with traces of human blood. After days of investigation, it was revealed that those cannibals were actually members of a notorious cult called the Alabaster Ascendants. 
led by a man named Jebediah Crowley. Having succumbed to their twisted beliefs about achieving immortality through devouring human flesh, they had been committing cold-blooded murders and barbaric rituals in those quiet woods for years, undisturbed and unknown. Although the cult members were eventually arrested and brought to justice, Jebediah himself vanished without a trace. Some say he still lurks within Pine Ridge Forest, awaiting his next meal, but my friends and I know better. To us, he will always remain an enigma and a horrifying reminder that the world is never truly what it seems. A couple of years had passed since our terrifying encounter in Pine Ridge Forest, and I tried my best to put the whole thing behind me. Our lives went on, with Tom, Jack, Karen, and I parting ways for college but always staying in touch. Then, out of nowhere, I received an anonymous letter in the mail. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Jebediah together again. I felt a cold shiver run down my spine as memories of the alabaster ascendants flooded back. Someone knew about Jebediah's connection to our past. Tom called me right away. He had received an identical letter. We quickly got in touch with Jack and Karen, discovering we each received the same cryptic message. We need to find him before he finds us, Jack said nervously over a phone call. What if it's just a sick joke? Karen asked, clearly disturbed by the letters. But we all knew that whoever sent those letters was no prankster. It was someone who knew way too much about our past. We decided to meet up and investigate further. I started digging for any news reports mentioning Jebediah or unusual deaths resembling his cult's disturbing signature gruesome mutilations and cannibalism. As our search continued, we began to piece together a pattern. There were whispers on internet forums discussing cryptic stories about people going missing in remote forested areas across the country. Each story ended with the same ominous phrase. The Alabaster Ascendant lives on. We decided to track this Jebediah imposter down and put an end to his gruesome spree which put others and potentially ourselves in danger. After weeks of research, we identified a remote cabin at which we suspected Jebediah to be hiding. Nerves taut like piano wire strung too tight, we drove several hours into the wilderness until we found the cabin. It was dusk now, and the dimming light somehow made everything more terrifying. We parked a safe distance away, surveying the surroundings. Look, Tom whispered, pointing at smears of dried blood on a nearby tree trunk. Hearts pounding harder than ever before, we formed a plan. Tom and Jack would sneak around back while Karen and I would slowly approach from the front, ready to confront whoever or whatever was inside. Taking slow, measured steps, we inched towards the door as Tom and Jack disappeared from view. When we finally reached the entrance, I forced myself to keep steady, despite my shaking hands. I reached out and turned the doorknob. It was unlocked. With a deep breath, Karen and I crept inside the dimly lit cabin. The smell of decay filled our nostrils as we entered the living room, only to find something even more astonishing, Jebediah, or rather, his look-alike lying on the floor in a pool of blood. His body was torn apart, much like the cannibals' victims we had once discovered in Pine Ridge Forest. What happened here? Karen whispered in disbelief. Just then, Tom and Jack burst into the room, clearly worked up about something outside. We found an altar. Jack managed between ragged breaths. Something or someone has been following us, stalking us since our last encounter. Overcome with dread and exhaustion from our investigation, coupled with newfound terror after discovering Jebediah's imposter dead in front of us, possibly slain by another cult member seeking revenge, 
we realize that putting an end to this horror wouldn't be nearly as simple as finding one man. We left that cabin with more questions than answers, but we knew that our responsibility to unearth the truth had just gotten infinitely more complicated, a dark web of revenge entangling around us as we tried desperately to break free, for there would never be a true end to the alabaster ascendant's influence so long as their twisted followers persisted in their sadistic rituals. And we all wondered, with lingering dread, if we'd ever truly escape the horrors of Pine Ridge Forest. I'm a retired detective. Back when I was working the force in the picturesque town of Roseland, Oregon, it was known for its beautiful hiking trails and scenic landscapes. One thing that I found unusual about living in Roseland was the number of cats that would congregate at the local grocery store every morning around 5 a.m. As odd as it was, it never really bothered anyone. In fact, many residents would actually feed them and consider it a town quirk. My name is Jefferson Kingsley and my investigation began on an otherwise completely ordinary day. I received a phone call from my good friend Roderick Fenton, who lived on the outskirts of town near some thick forest. He sounded agitated when he told me about an eerie set of stairs he had discovered while exploring the woods. What's so special about these stairs? I asked, curious about Roderick's urgency to have me come and take a look. That's just it, Jefferson, he replied with exasperation. There's nothing around them. Just a random set of stairs leading to nowhere, but they don't look like they've been abandoned or unused. This piqued my interest. What could be so unsettling about a seemingly innocuous set of stairs deep in the heart of the forest? The very fact that they were out there sparked curiosity within me and I agreed to meet him at his place before venturing into the woods together. Upon arriving at his home, Roderick wasted no time getting ready to show me these mysterious stairs. We trekked through heavily wooded terrain for hours until finally coming across them. Nestled between tall trees, there stood an old yet sturdy-looking set of stairs with no discernible purpose in sight. I could feel my heart racing as we approached. It was almost as if there was an unspoken dark energy surrounding these stairs, eerily inviting yet malicious. As I put my foot on the first step, Roderick halted me, a look of fear plastered on his face. Jefferson, please don't, he quietly pleaded. I don't think it's safe. Taking his concerns into consideration, I paused, choosing to instead closely examine the area around the stairs. That's when we noticed the remnants of what appeared to be several small rituals. Broken trinkets and animal bones littered the ground near the base of the stairs. The hairs on my neck stood up as I realized we were far from alone in that remote area. It was at this moment that we heard frantic shouting nearby. Whoever was there must have been watching us closely while we approached their secret space. A panicked young man emerged from behind a nearby tree. You shouldn't be here, he shrieked. This place belongs to them. We tried to question him further, but he refused to divulge anything more than cryptic warnings and hastily left the area. His reaction solidified our resolve to discover the truth behind these ominous stairs. As weeks went by, our investigation led us deep into a rabbit hole of macabre discoveries surrounding a killer cult active in Roseland who utilized these stairs as their meeting place for unspeakable acts of violence, mutilations, sacrifices, and more. The cult had eyes all over town and they knew when anyone was getting too close. A devoted member who wanted out eventually contacted us, 
She provided intricate information about their activities and confirmed our suspicions about their human leader and those who carried out his orders. This woman put herself at incredible risk to help us unravel these mysteries, an act that would ultimately bring her demise at their hands. We managed to track down and arrest several key members of this secret cult before they could inflict more damage on innocent lives. However, their elusive leader remains at large. Rumors are swirling about his true identity, but nothing substantial or credible has surfaced that will lead us to him. It's been months since the takedown, and I often find myself lying awake at night, unable to shake the disturbing images of what we uncovered during our investigation. The stairs in the woods still haunt my dreams, as do the unknown but maliciously powerful man responsible for the suffering and death that took place there. Though I may never truly find peace, I continue my search for him. The memory of those lost souls urged me not to stop. Someday, I hope Rosalind will be rid of this terror once and for all. Months have passed since our successful takedown of the cult members responsible for those macabre acts. Rosalind began to rebuild its reputation, but the cult's leader remained at large. As time went on, my obsession with finding the man responsible grew exponentially. I couldn't let this go. What if he regrouped and started his heinous activities again? I kept digging, using hidden messages and symbols left by the informant to piece together more information about the cult's mysterious leader. I frequented the secluded spot where we discovered the stairs, hoping to find more clues or even confront him myself. Late one night, I stumbled upon a new lead, a coded invitation to a secret gathering at a secluded cabin deep in the woods. With trepidation, I knew that this might be my chance to find out who was behind it all. As I approached the cabin under the veil of darkness, I heard muffled voices and eerie whispers from within. Peering through a crack in the old wooden door, I found myself face to face with an elderly woman, the hostess of this gathering. Come in, she beckoned, immediately sensing my presence as if she knew I was coming. I stepped inside, swallowing my fear as I entered this den of unapologetic evil. The woman seemed oddly familiar although I couldn't pinpoint why. Then suddenly it hit me. She was one of the people who used to feed the stray cats at the grocery store every morning. What brings you here? She asked with a sinister smile, slowly revealing her position as not only a cult member but also their elusive leader. My heart raced in my chest as adrenaline surged through me. All that searching led me straight into the lion's den. Playing it cool, I told her I'd been wandering in the woods and needed shelter for the night. She sat me down by their roaring fireplace and began spinning tales of grotesque ritualistic murders, explaining how they'd misled the authorities into believing the true leader had been apprehended months ago. As she described their methods, her words painted gruesome pictures in my mind. I realized that this unassuming elderly woman was more sadistic than any of us could have imagined. Slowly, as she assessed my reactions, her suspicion of me grew. You know why you're really here, don't you? She asked pointedly. I froze like a deer in headlights, aware that there was no way out of the situation. Yes, I finally admitted. I've been searching for you. You're the reason people suffered under your cult. The world will be a better place once you're behind bars. Her laughter filled the room like nails on a chalkboard, devoid of any remorse or empathy. You have no idea who you're dealing with, she sneered. I knew then that I needed to act quickly if I was going to make it out alive. With every ounce of strength in me, I charged at her and tackled her onto the floor. The intense struggle ensued as we each fought for control with adrenaline and fear fueling our actions. 
Finally able to restrain her, I gasped for breath, realizing I had won, though everything inside me shook with terror and disgust at what I'd just experienced. It had been more harrowing than any other experience in my career. After turning her over to the authorities and revealing her identity, they found concrete evidence linking the cult leader to dozens of unsolved murders across several states. She was sentenced to multiple life sentences without parole and would rot away behind bars for the rest of her days. Her arrest marked the end of a dark chapter for Rosalind. And yet, even years later, as life slowly returned to normal in our little town, my dreams were still haunted by that night in the cabin and those sinister stairs nestled within the woods. Each night, as sleep carried me back to that eerie and ominous staircase, I couldn't help but wonder, how many more places like that one are out there, waiting for their hidden darkness to be discovered? My life has always been a bit unusual, swaying from one extreme to another like a pendulum, never pausing long enough for me to catch my breath. It all began when I was six and discovered that I could climb trees faster than anyone I knew, earning the nickname, Monkey Boy, from my friends. But let's not dive into the oddities of my life. Let's delve into one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had in a popular location near Portland, Oregon. It all happened on June 15, 2009. My friend Derek and I had heard about some mysterious stairs deep in Forest Park from an old park ranger named Old Mike. They said very few people knew about these stairs and that they seemingly led up to nothing but thin air. We decided to check them out ourselves, driven by curiosity and a thirst for adventure. I'm telling you, man, Derek said as we hiked along the dirt trail that snaked through the dense foliage around us. If these stairs are as freaky as old Mike says they are, this will be a day we'll never forget. We carried on hiking for hours until finally coming upon them. The stairs that seemed to lead nowhere yet were eerily captivating in their design. Their smooth stone steps contrasted with the surrounding rugged terrain, almost beckoning us to climb them. We seriously shouldn't be here, Derek murmured as we hesitated at the base of the steps, peering up into the misty void above. Come on, I said, brushing off his concerns and starting my ascent up the stairs. Halfway up, though, I stopped cold as an overwhelming sense of dread wrapped itself around me. It felt like sinister eyes were observing our every move. Derek caught up to me nervously. You feel it too, don't you? He asked without needing confirmation. The unsettling atmosphere intensified, and out of the corner of our eyes, we caught a fleeting glimpse of a shadowy figure darting between the trees. Let's get out of here, now! I yelled as the two of us raced down the stairs and back to the trail. As we stumbled down, from behind us came bone-chilling laughter that sent shivers down our spines. We continued to run, our lungs heaving as we tried to put as much distance between us and this sinister presence as possible. When we finally reached town, our terror was palpable. We found the nearest bar and drank heavily, trying to make sense of what had just occurred. An old man drinking at the bar overheard our conversation and interjected. Sounds like you boys encountered the Shadow Brotherhood, he said ominously. A group of crazed individuals who roam the park at night doing unspeakable things. The man went on to tell us how their leader, a man named Jeremiah Kane was an infamous serial killer from decades ago. The rumor was that he could control shadows, making it nearly impossible for anyone to see or catch him. What terrified us more than anything was realizing that this entire time, 
Derek had been wearing Jeremiah's old leather jacket, unknowingly taunting the murderous brotherhood with every step. We brought this information to the police, but were scoffed at. That was until a series of grisly murders started happening around town with striking similarities to Kane's pattern of murder. The realization that we might have awakened something sinister weighed heavy on our minds. We confronted old Mike about his knowledge on the subject, but he played dumb, claiming he'd never heard of such a thing before. It wasn't until weeks later that we discovered old Mike's true identity, that he was actually an accomplice to Kane's crimes. A tip from an anonymous source upended our lives when it revealed old Mike was not only a member of the Shadow Brotherhood, but was also protecting his twisted leader by sowing disinformation and guiding unsuspecting hikers to their doom. The befitting punishment for old Mike remains a mystery due to his own sudden, inexplicable disappearance. Whether he was saved or betrayed by his brethren remains entirely unknown, or perhaps the truth is much darker. As for us, we still seek peace after our harrowing ordeal, though it eludes us, much like the stairs in Forest Park. Despite the fear and troubling thoughts that nodded us after our experience in Forest Park, Derek and I couldn't help but feel determined to put an end to the twisted acts of the shadowy figures. As we dug deeper into the dark history of Jeremiah Kane and his cohorts, we discovered a chilling pattern regarding their victims. Kane's preferred prey were unsuspecting transients wandering through Forest Park. He'd carefully select them, drawing them off the beaten path under false pretenses before brutally killing them. Knowing this information and with the police still doubting our claims, we decided to take matters into our own hands. We devised a risky plan to lure Kane and his henchmen out by going undercover as potential victims. We first shared our discoveries with an investigative journalist, Delia who found our revelations compelling enough to collaborate with us. Together, we would document every step of our plan as concrete evidence of the sinister workings within the park. One night, Derek and I disguised ourselves as travelers seeking refuge in Forest Park. Meanwhile, Delia was strategically stationed in a concealed spot near the eerie stairs, armed with night vision cameras to capture every moment as it unfolded. As we settled down near a large oak tree for the night, a feeling of unease gradually crept over us. What if this goes wrong? Derek whispered to me worriedly. I swallowed my own growing dread and simply replied, Just stick to the plan. The air was heavy with anticipation and fear as time dragged on. Suddenly, the shadows around us started shifting unnaturally. The laughter we had heard on that fateful day echoed ominously from multiple directions. We exchanged nervous glances but remained still, terrified of revealing that we could sense their presence. A figure finally emerged from the darkness before us. We recognized him as Cain immediately by his cold gaze and twisted grin plastered across his face. Lost? He sneered, stepping forward menacingly. Derek tried to keep his voice steady, feigning confusion. Yes, we're just trying to find our way out. As Kane approached us, multiple shadowy followers appeared from seemingly nowhere. The Shadow Brotherhood was no ordinary gang of thugs. Kane motioned for his comrades to surround us and no sooner had they done so than dark clouds began swallowing up the moon, making it near impossible for anyone but them to discern their surroundings. Right at that moment, thousands of tiny clicks echoed in our ears as Delia triggered her camera's shutter as fast as she could. The confusion allowed us both to gain some distance from them with our adrenaline coursing through our veins. They chased after us relentlessly. But what they didn't know was that we had rigged the entire area with trip wires and pit traps, designed explicitly to disarm and capture them. 
With every passing second, the sound of grunts, crashes, and expletives grew louder, a clear indication that our traps were working. Finally, we found ourselves facing a terrified cane cornered by one of our final traps, a deep pit lined with carefully placed nails jutting out menacingly. Kane's expression morphed into rage as he realized he had been bested by mere amateurs. The very thought seemed unbearable to him. Desperation took over as he lunged towards me in one last attempt to save face. I sidestepped him just in time, causing him to lose balance and fall right into our trap. The sound of his screams was deafening as he landed on the nails below. His followers scattered into the wind after seeing their once feared leader defeated. Together with Delia's recordings, we managed to expose the Shadow Brotherhood and finally convince the police force to apprehend every last member of the notorious gang. Kane himself was found guilty on several counts of several gruesome murders and condemned to spend the rest of his days rotting away in prison. The chilling news coverage of our plan being executed and the dismantling of the Shadow Brotherhood gained traction. And as for Forest Park, the shadow that once loomed ominously over it slowly dissipated, allowing people to enjoy its beauty once more without fear gripping their hearts. Though we found ourselves lucky enough to survive our brush with the Shadow Brotherhood, the scars of our ordeal, and the grotesque memory of Cain's twisted fate still linger to this day. I've always been fascinated by puzzles. The more complex, the better. Jigsaw puzzles were my first love, then Sudoku and eventually challenging logic problems. As a software engineer, I found satisfaction in writing code that solved real-world problems. But little did I know that the skills I gained from these harmless hobbies would eventually help me face my greatest challenge yet, the mystery of Julian Streckner. It all began on December 21, 2012, in a small town on the outskirts of San Francisco. My friends and I were hanging out at our usual spot, an abandoned train yard, and celebrating our holidays by sharing stories and laughs over drinks and cigarettes. The sun had started to set when Eric mentioned something unusual he saw while walking his dog earlier that day. You guys heard of those stairs in the woods? He asked. The remark didn't strike me as significant at the time, but it soon would. Before we knew it, darkness had consumed us, but we carried on with our festivities regardless. That's when we heard the crashing sound and chilling laughter echoing across the empty yard. Fear washed over us as we gazed into the pitch black abyss, searching for its origin, when we noticed a figure bolting from behind an old storage container towards an untouched stretch of trees leaving an ominous trail of heavy breathing behind. We gave chase but lost track after discovering a mysterious set of stone steps leading into the woods. Curiosity got the best of us, so we climbed them one by one, ascending into a world of unspeakable dread. A gut-wrenching scream brought our journey to a halt when we stumbled upon Lauren Martinson, a fellow high school student bound violently around a tree trunk by a thick rope. Her weak pulse quickly disappeared, as though drained away by an unseen force. Our heads spun with confusion and panic at this horrifying scene as someone muttered Lauren's last words before vanishing into the dark. Whoever it was, he's watching. He hates us. We reported the gruesome discovery to the police that night. During the following days, their investigation led them to Julian Streckner, a former student known for his cruel jokes and volatile behavior. But something didn't add up. How did they figure out Julian was involved? I asked, trying to piece together the chain of events. 
The officer hesitated for a moment before responding. Well, they found a snap bracelet belonging to Lauren stuck on one of the branches near the steps. Fingerprints were all over it, so there you have it. This wasn't satisfying enough for me. We knew Julian from school, but nobody had even spoken about him for months since he'd left town one day without warning. It seemed too convenient for him to be responsible for Lauren's grisly end. Determined to understand how Julian could genuinely be a murder suspect, I reached out to his cousin Alana, who offered valuable insight into his life in their earlier years. She mentioned that Julian had always harbored an intense fascination with urban legends and macabre stories since childhood. This revelation struck an unsettling chord as I thought back to Eric's mention of the stairs in the woods, something Julian may have known about. As our friends adjusted to their new reality, scarred by Lauren's gruesome death, I couldn't ignore my vexing thirst for answers. Soon enough, I began hitting dead ends and reaching for conspiracy theories at every turn. With a heavy heart and running out of options, I returned to those dreaded stairs in search of closure. But as dusk turned to night once more, haunted continuously by Lauren's desperate final moments, my need for the truth turned into a dangerous obsession. One night soon after, a sharp knock at my door jolted me from sleep. Opening it hesitantly, I discovered a small, unmarked package on my doorstep. Inside, I found a neatly folded note accompanied by a recently printed local newspaper article on several unsolved disappearances and a map. The note read, Follow the path to where it all began. You aren't alone. In fact, you're in grave danger. A signature at the corner of the paper caught my eye. Julian Streckner. Sweating with fear and adrenaline, I sat in my dimly lit room. The pieces of the puzzle had finally come together, although the truth was as thorny as the thick woods where it took root. My fascination with solving puzzles somehow entangled me in Julian Streckner's twisted game. Staring at the map provided, I noticed multiple locations marked across the town, with one standing out, the abandoned train yard where our nightmare began. The article mentioned several unsolved disappearances, and I couldn't help but wonder if they were all connected to Julian. The only way to find out was to follow his path and uncover the truth. As I revisited each marked location, whispers of past horrors plagued me. These were the hunting grounds for a disturbed individual with a taste for terror. With each step closer to solving this mystery, I felt the noose of danger tighten around my neck, but quitting was never an option. Armed with pepper spray I borrowed from my sister and a makeshift brass knuckle, I arrived once more at the abandoned train yard. The silence that enveloped it now was a stark contrast to that fateful night when Lauren's life was stolen from her. As I muttered a silent prayer for her soul and moved towards the woods, I noticed something odd near the ominous stone steps, a fresh set of footprints leading further into the darkness. Now that I was following these tracks, my heartbeat quickened in both fear and anticipation. They led me to an old, forgotten shed deep within the woods, locked from the outside yet seemingly still in use. Curiosity peaked further, and anxiety took hold. Assembling what little courage I had left, I decided it was time to confront whatever awaited me in that shrouded shelter. Picking the lock with trembling fingers and gritting my teeth through every failed attempt, I eventually broke through as moonlight revealed its secrets piece by piece. To my horror, I found myself amidst a personal shrine dedicated entirely to Julian's macabre world. Photographs of those missing from town adorned the walls alongside crime scene evidence in cold disarray. Choked by revulsion and despair so potent that bow burned at my throat's base, I began piecing together the shadowed connections, each victim, 
Lauren included, had crossed paths with Julian in some way, whether directly or indirectly. As my eyes made their way through this gruesome gallery, I froze in terror as a voice broke the suffocating stillness. It was Julian himself, confirming his presence with chilling malevolence. So you figured it out? His voice whispered menacingly from behind me. You found pieces of my work. His hand clamped tight around my shoulder, forcing me to turn and face him. His eyes were hauntingly empty pools of darkness. I don't understand. Why are you doing this? Why wreak havoc on innocent lives? I stammered through a choked breath as adrenaline surged through every inch of my body. It's all just a game, he said casually, his grip tightening. You've played your part well. Suddenly grasping an opportunity presented by a brief loosening of his grip, fear gave way to a desperate resolve for survival. I unleashed the pepper spray onto Julian's face and swung my makeshift brass knuckles onto his temple, rendering him momentarily disoriented and senseless. Seizing this chance to flee, my heart pounding wildly beneath my chest, my legs carried me faster than ever before back through the woods as Julian's enraged howls pierced the night air. Crashing into the train yard, gulping down short gasps of air as I ran for dear life, sirens suddenly sliced their way through the dark like sonic flames. Somebody must have called the police after hearing our commotion in the woods. Summoning every ounce of strength left within me, I directed a winded officer to the shed while they acted swiftly and apprehended Julian in that wretched place. His reign of terror was now brought to an end by the very strands of morbid curiosity he had so cunningly spun. Inhaling the cold air of that never-ending night, I realized the most daunting puzzle I'd unravel would bring a monster to justice. And with that, all illusions of safety previously held in these woods were shattered on those fateful stone steps. I've always had a knack for finding things people didn't know they'd lost. It's this strange, inexplicable ability that has led me down some interesting paths in life. From uncovering family secrets to locating missing heirlooms, my unique skill has never failed to pique the interest of those around me. I swear, it's like the universe is playing a constant game of hide-and-seek, and I'm always chosen to be the seeker. My name is Lysander Oakley. I'm an antique dealer by trade and a semi-professional finder on the side. About six months ago, I got a call from an old friend named Marius Wright. We hadn't spoken in well over a decade, but he contacted me to ask if I could help him locate something important that he'd lost, his cousin Felix. Marius explained that his once close family had been estranged since their grandparents' funeral. Thrust back together after years apart, they held a reunion at their grandparents' old cottage in the woods near Lake Tahoe. Felix had gone missing one night without a trace. I need your expertise, Marius pleaded. This isn't like Felix. He wouldn't just leave like that. I told Marius I'd do my best, packed my bags, and headed for Lake Tahoe. Upon arriving at the old cottage, I met up with Marius and the rest of his family members who stayed over. We reconvened at the dining room table in preparation for our search. Let me get this straight. Marius' niece, Ivy Quinn, chimed in. You're here because you can find things? Like some sort of supernatural detective? I shrugged nonchalantly. Supernatural might be pushing it. Marius interjected before I could finish. But he's helped many people in the past with difficult cases. The next day, I roamed the woods around the cottage, 
and while my gift usually guides me to precisely what I seek, something about the atmosphere felt overwhelmingly tense, as if someone was watching me. Then I stumbled across a disturbing set of stairs deep in the forest. No logic seemed to explain their presence. They merely stood alone, surreal and imposing. As I hesitated before the staircase, I felt an indescribable dread wash over me. A sense of danger clawed at the back of my mind. Resisting the urge to ascend the mysterious steps, I thought it best to consult Marius. The tension in the room was palpable as I delivered my findings to the family, detailing both my inexplicable unease and my unsettling discovery. Marius' brother, Cassius Thornbridge, skeptically eyed me. You're trying to tell us that some creepy staircase in the woods has something to do with Felix's disappearance? That's when Ivy broke her silence. Speaking without emotion or hesitation, she coldly revealed that on that fateful night weeks prior, they had encountered the staircase and dared Felix to climb it as a joke, a test of bravado. Felix had willingly obliged, yet once he reached halfway up, he simply vanished into thin air. The stunned silence following Ivy's confession was deafening. Days passed without any sign of Felix. Although we searched everywhere we could think of and spread countless flyers in town offering rewards for any information leading to his whereabouts, nothing came out of it. No leads, no witnesses, just dead ends. Feeling defeated and increasingly concerned for my own safety due to the eerie energy permeating my surroundings, I decided it was time for me to return home. My gift let me down this time, or perhaps it revealed something better left unseen. The image of Feliz ascending those stairs towards oblivion still haunts me today. Months after returning from Lake Tahoe, I received an anonymous letter in the mail containing nothing but a single newspaper clipping. No return address, no note, just a headline dated two days before Felix disappeared. Infamous serial killer and kidnapper, Victor Sheridan, escapes custody near Lake Tahoe. A cold chill ran down my spine as I realized the predator Marius family had unknowingly invited into their home and ultimately, the reason why I couldn't find Felix. The letter sender remains unknown to this day, a sinister mystery hanging over my memories of that fateful search party and those dreadful stares in the woods that now haunt me forevermore. For weeks after receiving the newspaper clipping, I couldn't shake the feeling of having unfinished business at Lake Tahoe. The thought of Victor Sheridan lurking in the shadows, having escaped custody, and likely having played a role in Felix's disappearance, not at me. I knew I had to go back and uncover the truth. As soon as I arrived at Lake Tahoe, I started my investigation by gathering any information about past victims and their connections to Victor Sheridan. Visiting local libraries and talking to detectives, I pieced together a pattern. All of his victims had vanished near mysterious staircases in the woods, just like Felix had. It became clear to me that Victor used these staircases as his hunting grounds. One evening, as I was scouring through online forums discussing Victor's modus operandi, an anonymous user posted a message claiming that they knew where Victor was hiding. I messaged them privately, and after confirming their claim was legitimate, they provided me with the coordinates of an old abandoned cabin deep in the woods near one of these strange staircases. Armed with this information and my determination to bring Felix's case to a close, I ventured deep into the forest, where the cabin lay hidden. As night fell and the atmosphere grew increasingly eerie, I approached the dilapidated structure with caution. My heart raced as I stepped into the cabin's darkness, its creaking wooden floors protesting beneath my feet. A horrendous stench filled the air, a horrifying mix of decay, sweat, and something metallic, 
blood. The scene before me was chilling, blood-stained walls adorned with newspaper clippings of Sheridan's victims and tools used for God knows what atrocities. Suddenly, a voice from behind sent shivers down my spine. I knew you'd come looking for me. I looked around only to see Victor Sheridan himself standing there, grinning manically as he brandished a knife in his hand. You couldn't resist the mystery, eh? It's over, Victor. You can't keep doing this, I said, trying to maintain my composure. He lunged at me with a knife but I managed to dodge his attack. We engaged in a tumultuous struggle, with the knife nicking my arm in the process, causing it to bleed profusely. In desperation, I grabbed a rusty pipe lying nearby and swung it at Victor's head with all my strength. He dropped to the ground, unconscious but alive. Bloodied and bruised, I dragged Victor out of the cabin and into the woods, towards the staircase that had haunted me for months. With him tied up and weakened, I made my way back to town with the weight of what had happened bearing down upon me. The police soon swarmed the cabin where I had found Victor Sheridan hiding out. As they investigated deeper into the surrounding woods, they unearthed a network of tunnels linking each of these mysterious staircases. Grotesque trophies from his victims were kept as morbid reminders of his heinous crimes. Finally realizing that Sheridan masqueraded as a helpful guest at Felix's family reunion was sickening. Victor was taken into custody and placed back behind bars, where he belonged. The depth of his depravity became public knowledge, and how he used the staircases to prey on unsuspecting victims brought not only closure for Felix's family but many others too. The mystery of those eerie stairs still lingers in my mind. However, some things are better left unexplored. For now, what matters is that I've managed to put an end to Victor Sheridan's reign of terror. Justice may have been served for all those affected by his sick and twisted schemes. But for me, this experience will stick with me for the rest of my days, with the haunting image of those stairs forever etched in my memory. My name is Jasper Crowley and I am one of those people who cannot seem to hold on to a set of car keys or a wallet. Over the years, I have lost countless sets of keys and wallets, which has made my life slightly unpredictable, often irritating, but occasionally exciting. You see, this tendency forces me to rely on things like public transportation or walking through unfamiliar neighborhoods. It all started about six years ago when I was living in Virginia. In one of the refurbished older neighborhoods near downtown Richmond, a strange urban legend circulated among the locals for years. They spoke about a set of mysterious stairs hidden in the woods just outside town. Three weeks after moving into my new home and once again misplacing my car keys, I decided to take a walk to clear my head. As I strolled down the gravel pathway near a forested area that bordered the neighborhood, I noticed something peculiar, an old, weathered staircase seemingly leading nowhere. They were worn stone steps that abruptly ended in nothingness amid the dense foliage. As soon as I took a step forward towards those stairs, my phone rang, breaking into my thoughts. Hey! Jasper! How's it going? said Felicity, an old friend I bumped into earlier that week at a local bar. Felicity and I decided to catch up over coffee, so we agreed to meet in town at a nearby cafe. We chatted for hours about memories, mutual friends, and unknown mysteries out there that our collective mundane lives hadn't encountered yet. While exchanging stories that evening, Felicity mentioned her own inexplicable experience. 
She described a seemingly innocent job almost two years ago at the local daycare, where she witnessed some terrifying behavior from one of the caretakers. Her account involved an older co-worker named Stanley Westridge. Stanley had been looking after children for many years and had garnered immense respect from both co-workers and families alike. But over the past year or so, he has begun to display unusual tendencies. Felicity spoke of times she found the man silently watching the kids with an unnerving gaze from afar, which seemed inappropriate for a caretaker. Admittedly, there is not much to go on, but I remember finding the escalation of her narrative very intriguing. It must have been around the fourth cup of coffee that she finally disclosed the terrible truth about Stanley. Apparently, while talking to a policeman after closing down the bar one night, she discovered that Stanley Westridge was part of a secret group of individuals known to commit unspeakable acts. Their connection with the mystery stairs was unknown, but it was whispered in hushed voices around town. Suddenly alarmed by this information, I told Felicity about discovering some stairs myself just outside our neighborhood. She gasped and shared knowing glances with me in silence. Not wanting to let this mystery go unresolved and hoping somehow it could fix my key losing issue, we decided to dig deeper into this eerie story together over the following weeks. After many sleepless nights of poring over archives at the town library and knocking on many suspicious doors for interviews, we unearthed a terrifying connection between Stanley and several missing child cases over the past decade. It quickly became apparent that something unthinkable was happening at those stairs in the woods. But what? We continued our investigation and were soon pointed towards an area on the western edge of town. A local neighbor mentioned that a dark figure had been seen climbing those mysterious steps when night fell completely. It sent shivers down my spine. Desperate for answers, Felicity and I gathered flashlights, cameras, and other essentials before setting off towards those dreaded stairs one foggy night. As we slowly ascended each step, every creak or rustle in the darkness sent waves of terror through our bodies. Upon reaching their peak and carefully examining our surroundings, we saw nothing but endless trees fading into darkness. We turned to each other, confused and disoriented. Suddenly, there it was, the unmistakable silhouette of Stanley Westridge darting through the shadows carrying the terrified figure of a young girl. Felicity and I couldn't contain ourselves any longer. We screamed and rushed towards him as he unexpectedly vanished into the gloom. In one looming instant, the nauseating weight of our discovery came crashing down on us. How these stairs and Stanley were connected would remain a mystery forevermore. But only one thing was for sure. Jasper Crowley's life would never be the same again after that horrific night. The weeks that followed were consumed by a dark obsession. Felicity and I dove deep into the dark underbelly of our town, desperate to find out more about Stanley and his nefarious activities. After countless hours of research, we uncovered something far more sinister than we could have ever imagined. It seemed that Stanley was just a small cog in an enormous machine operating right under our noses. Staying up night after night trying to piece together this vast puzzle began to take a toll on me. My life started to spin out of control, with sleepless nights fueled by insomnia and caffeine turning into deadly explorations. We tirelessly visited other parts of the town risking our lives to find where Stanley would strike next. One night, as the chilling wind creaked through the trees overhead, Felicity and I found ourselves at an old abandoned warehouse, rumored to be one of the meeting places for this malevolent collective of townsfolk. Armed with flashlights, pepper spray, and our unwavering determination, we slowly made our way through the decaying building. 
It reeked of dampness and decay. My heart pounded in my chest as we stepped over rotting wood and debris. Suddenly Felicity grabbed my arm, her eyes wide with fear. Jasper over there, she whispered hoarsely. In front of us lay a gory scene, bodies piled up, mutilated beyond recognition. What? What have we found? My voice trembled as I spoke. We were about to turn away when we heard the muffled sound of sobbing. As if drawn by some macabre force, we crept closer to investigate. There, chained to a rusty pipe on the grimy floor, was a young girl, terror etched across her tear-streaked face as she sobbed uncontrollably. Instantly filled with rage and compassion, Felicity and I worked together quickly to unlock her chains and bring her to safety. The horror in her eyes as she recounted being kidnapped by Stanley and taken here was too much to bear. We knew we couldn't let this continue any longer. Felicity stayed with the young girl, consoling her, while I made my way to the police station. It was time to turn this information over to the authorities and put an end to it once and for all. Following our cold, harrowing account, a flurry of police activity commenced. Our town would never be the same after that night. Stanley Westridge was arrested, along with several other members of the twisted cult he was involved in. Our relentless pursuit of the truth led to their demise, but at what cost? As I lay in bed that night, the weight of our discoveries weighed heavily on my chest. Felicity slept beside me, exhausted from the ordeal. The events from the warehouse replayed over and over in my mind, making rest impossible for me. The terror on that young girl's face will forever haunt me as a reminder of what evil truly lurks beneath humanity's surface. Though we had helped bring justice to many innocent lives, it left me questioning if we ever really know who or what is operating behind closed doors in our own small towns. To this day, I still occasionally walk past those mysterious stairs on my morning strolls to clear my head. Although we had exposed terrible secrets within our town's walls, a part of me can't help but wonder if those stairs still harbor unseen mysteries waiting to be stumbled upon by another unsuspecting wanderer like myself. Life went on, Felicity went off to journalism school, and as for me? Well, my keys still have a habit of disappearing, and whenever they do, I can't help but pause and reflect upon the horrors we uncovered within that quiet corner of Virginia. Somewhere out there those stairs remain hidden in plain sight, continuing to draw the curious and the daring into their eerie grasp. My name is Jeremy Tillman, and I have always had a penchant for collecting antique items. It started with old coins when I was a child, and soon my obsession grew into a vast collection of rare trinkets and memorabilia from various periods in history. I'd be the first to admit this isn't the most thrilling aspect of my life, but it makes for an unusual passion in today's increasingly digital age. I'll never forget the day that changed everything, August 7, 2019. I was at a local flea market in my hometown of Philadelphia, and something caught my eye. It was an old map, worn around the edges and likely dating back to the early 1900s. My curiosity peaked, I paid the vendor and left with the mysterious map in hand. As I studied it closer, I noticed peculiar markings that led to a secluded spot deep within the nearby state park. On a whim, against my better judgment, I called up some friends, Diana Restrepo, Travis Oliverwood, and Cassidy Montrose, to join me on an impromptu hiking trip to explore the mysterious location. As we ventured deeper into the woods that fateful day, 
we stumbled upon something oddly fascinating, a set of stairs. The staircase appeared out of place and inexplicable, devoid of any logical reason for being there. Nevertheless, we couldn't help but investigate further. When Diana began climbing the stairs with childlike curiosity, Travis playfully chided her for taking risks without considering potential danger. Diana! Get down from there! He demanded. Oh, come on! Live a little! She rebutted with a mischievous grin plastered on her face. Despite initial doubts about exploring the odd staircase structure, eventually all four of us ascended to the top step where we discovered a hidden entrance sealed off from plain sight. That was when our seemingly innocuous adventure took a dark and foreboding turn. As we ventured through the narrow passageway revealed by our discovery, we were faced with scenes of utter horror, lifeless bodies in various states of decay, some suspended from the ceiling, others sprawled across the damp, musty floor. This gruesome tableau was accompanied by the nauseating odor of rotting flesh. None of us could believe our eyes, our heart rates quickened, and our minds frantically searched for an explanation. Had we stumbled upon the secret lair of a serial killer? Or were we crossing paths with an esoteric cult unknown to us? Diana fell to her knees, nearly vomiting out of sheer terror. Upon regaining some composure, she muttered, What? What is this place? Breathing heavily, Travis responded, I don't know. But we need to get out of here right now. Frantically navigating our way back towards the entrance, we stumbled upon a small room adjacent to where we had found the hidden passage. Inside was a table piled high with cryptic notes and papers crime scene pictures, journal entries detailing acts committed against victims, and an array of evidence highlighting the atrocities committed by those who had previously occupied the space. As I skimmed through some of the unsettling content in front of me, my eyes landed on one particular piece, a detailed drawing bearing a striking resemblance to Diana. Look at this. Cassidy whispered as she held up an eerily similar portrait of her own face. It seemed whoever was behind these vile acts already knew us and had targeted us explicitly. A feeling of dread washed over us as we fled from the sanctuary that housed these unspeakable horrors. We knew we had to warn others about what transpired in that unholy place and vowed to bring those responsible into custody. The next day at the local police station, after sharing our chilling experience with Detective Harold Gallagher, we received intel from a reliable source close to the department. Listen, I'm not supposed to be telling you this, but the recent victims' files show they were all members of a radical group called the Crimson Circle. The informant divulged, the detective believed the evidence pointed to a deranged individual among the group who was systematically picking off its own members as part of some demented initiation ritual. We left the station with our minds spinning with unanswered questions. We continued our search for answers on our own terms, and as weeks passed, stories began to emerge from various sources, stories that were whispered in hushed circles chilling tales painting the Crimson Circle as a shadowy cult linked to unsolved murders and other violent crimes. We knew we had to expose them, but we were also aware that doing so could place our own lives in danger. Despite our fears, we decided to dig deeper for the sake of justice. Our search led us to a house on the outskirts of town, rumored to be a meeting place for the Crimson Circle. We decided to stake out the hideout at night, parked across the street in Travis's minivan, cautiously waiting for any strange activity. Hours passed without much happening until suddenly, several hooded figures entered the building. Damn it! I knew they were up to no good. Travis whispered nervously. 
As adrenaline fueled our drive to unearth the truth, we armed ourselves with makeshift weapons and slowly approached the ominous dwelling. Diana picked the lock, and we silently slipped inside. The atmosphere inside was suffocating. An overwhelming blend of fear and malice seemed to seep through every crevice. As we crept down a dimly lit hallway lined with mysterious symbols drawn in blood, we began hearing faint cries for help. They must have another victim. Cassidy gasped. We followed the sound and came upon a locked door guarded by a hooded figure who held an ornate ceremonial dagger. Before we could intervene, he raised his weapon and slashed his own throat, falling dead at our feet. I kicked open the door, and our eyes met with pure horror, a girl tied down to an altar, trembling with fear. Without hesitation, we untied her and raced back out with her in tow, barely evading several members of the Crimson Circle who pursued us relentlessly. We managed to deliver her safely into police custody and finally saw some semblance of justice when Detective Gallagher arrested key members of the Crimson Circle. However, the criminal organization proved far more deeply rooted than initially presumed. Many within its ranks maintained powerful connections that allowed them to elude punishment and vanish without a trace. Knowing we'd barely scratched the surface of the Crimson Circle's network, our lives had been irreversibly altered by the nightmarish discoveries we'd witnessed. Fearful that repercussions loomed over us, we reevaluated our priorities. Travis signed up for self-defense courses, Diana moved cross-country and adopted a new identity and Cassidy began researching occult practices to better understand what we were up against. As for me, I continued my pursuit of the Crimson Circle, working with Detective Gallagher in an unofficial capacity to bring down the devious organization once and for all. Months passed, and I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that I was being watched. One night, alone in my apartment, I received a message instructing me to meet someone at an abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. Although I was fearing a potential trap laid forth by the Crimson Circle, I also recognized this as potentially vital information they would risk slipping by. Upon arriving at the factory, I was met by a man standing in the shadows. His face was obscured by a hood. I cautiously approached him. I have the information you need, he whispered, and he handed me an envelope addressed to Diana Restrepo. Just as he slipped away into the shadows from whence he came, inside were photos of Diana's mutilated corpse arranged in unspeakable configurations, just as we had discovered bodies during our first chilling encounter with the Crimson Circle. My heart dropped as shock and paralyzing dread washed over me. I realized that this monster was signaling that none of us had escaped its grudge. Not Travis, not Cassidy, not Diana, nor myself. The grotesque memento also served as a harrowing reminder that the Crimson Circle never forgets and never forgives. Criminals living in an untouchable realm beyond semblances of justice. I continued working with Detective Gallagher only to find myself one step behind the organization at every turn, slowly becoming more and more unhinged by the fear of the Crimson Circle lurking around every corner. And so, my once ordinary life succumbed to the darkness that had ensnared me as I continued my relentless pursuit of the Crimson Circle, a shadowy evil that consumes everything it touches, including myself. I have this unusual hobby. I collect rare vintage postcards from around the world. It started when I found a box of old postcards in my grandfather's attic labeled, Memories from Places Unknown. 
That old box was my gateway to the world of beautiful and forgotten places captured in those short messages on cardboard. It was a balmy summer evening, and I could feel the heat radiating off the sidewalks as my friend Charles and I explored a quirky, thriving artistic neighborhood in downtown Portland, Oregon. We'd stumbled upon one of those massive outdoor sculptures that leave you questioning whether it's art or just garbage. A local had told us about a peculiar landmark nearby, some stairs that went nowhere in the middle of a dense woodland area. Intrigued by the urban legend, we decided to trek into the woods. What better place for an unexpected adventure? Our casual banter and laughter echoed through the trees as we walked deeper into the forest. The once noisy streets seemed a distant memory, leaving only an unsettling silence pierced by the distant cause of crows. We found them, stairs made of stone and covered with ivy, leading up to nothing. After ascending them cautiously, we realized we were standing on top of some kind of abandoned structure buried beneath dirt and foliage. As we debated about its possible origins, we noticed an unnerving quietness had settled over the forest. That was when we first heard it, hushed whispers uttered between shallow breaths somewhere close behind us. We froze. Charles whispered hoarsely, Do you hear that? My heart pounded in my ears as guttural mumblings echoed through the woods. Neither of us dared turn around or speak again. Instead, we slowly descended the stairs. Unable to hold back any longer out of fear for our lives, we ran like hell back towards civilization. As we stumbled out onto the streets, lungs burning and hearts racing, we couldn't shake the terror of what we'd heard back there. Charles nervously spurred some locals on, asking them if they knew anything about those stairs. One elderly man spoke up, his voice quivering. Those stairs. Steer clear, young fellas. There have been unnatural things happening in those woods for years now. There's a group, the Whispers, they call them, that preys on people who go exploring too far in. He shuddered before hesitantly continuing. You know, attacks, kidnappings, and worse. His eyes flicked away from us before he turned to walk away. Unsettling, didn't begin to describe our feelings as we left Portland as fast as we could after hearing the horrifying local tales of this mysterious group known only as the Whispers. According to our sources, they performed unspeakable acts on their victims gruesome, brutal killings that were honestly far beyond my most horrific nightmares. We decided it was best for our safety to retreat to the comfort of home rather than press our luck in that sinister place any longer. Telling our terrifying tale to friends and family back home did little to assuage the night terrors it caused me. Strangely, despite being unable to eradicate that eerie sense of dread from our minds, Charles and I both felt even more enthralled by those stairs in the woods than before, simultaneously captivated by and horrified by the unknown evil that seemed to permeate their surroundings. It was several weeks later that I happened upon a local newspaper article detailing a recent string of unsolved murders in and around the Portland area. At least eight had been slain in brutal fashion, their bodies mutilated and displayed like grotesque artwork for all to witness when they inevitably stumbled upon them. My stomach clenched as I shared the article with Charles, doing my best not to vomit at the sight of such ghastly descriptions. We couldn't help but suspect that these grisly acts were somehow connected to the whispers, about whom we'd heard those dark tales during our fateful trip. Days later, as I attempted to distance myself from the dreadful memories plaguing me, a man named Wallace Connolly contacted me after discovering my vintage postcard collections through an online forum. He was an older gentleman who claimed to have extensive knowledge of the dark secrets of Portland's past. 
which he believed were connected to the malicious actions of the Whispers. Wallace invited me to a meeting at his old Victorian-style house, tucked away in a quiet Portland suburb. I went with Charles as emotional support. We couldn't face the prospect of confronting the Whispers on our own. The house was dusty and cluttered with books and old paintings, which reflected Wallace's obsession with history. Settling down with cups of tea, Wallace started revealing the story behind the Whispers. He had been investigating these ominous figures for years, collecting evidence from newspaper articles, police reports, and survivor testimonies. Picture it, he said. A secretive cult that's been around since the 1930s, preying on Portland's vulnerable by using twisted rituals and grotesque acts of violence. Charles gripped his tea tightly and asked hesitantly, Have you found any solid evidence to support all this? Wallace looked at us solemnly and walked over to a hidden safe embedded in his bookshelf. He pulled out an ancient leather-bound book. This is the diary of one of the original members of the Whispers, he said, handing it to me. Over the following days, Charles and I poured over the diary. It detailed horrific events, kidnappings, torture sessions using medieval tools, and gory mutilations, all performed by the cult members in their quest for power and control. With each disturbing entry we read, our convictions strengthened, this cult must be stopped. Our curiosity turned into a mission as we teamed up with Wallace to investigate further. Determined to confront our fears and expose the cult, we decided to return to the stairs in the woods, but we armed ourselves against any potential dangers. As we approached the staircase after sunset, when the whispers were known to gather, an eerie feeling settled upon us. Lights flickered around corners as ghastly whispers filled the air like puffs of malevolent poison aimed at weakening our resolve. We steeled ourselves against the unsettling atmosphere and pressed on. Following the rituals detailed in the diary, we found a hidden entrance to an underground chamber beneath the stairs. Inside, candlelight revealed walls covered in cryptic symbols and rusty tools for torture. We heard faint footsteps and suppressed sobs from a locked room at the far end of the chamber. Against every instinct to run, we reached for the door handle and found several people chained to the walls, their faces stained with tears. The whispers had taken more victims. Before we could even react, cult members wearing black robes and grotesque masks emerged from a secret doorway. We were cornered. The cult leader, his face twisted in a sick smile, approached us menacingly. Charles managed to overpower one of the kidnappers and grab their weapon. In a desperate bid to protect ourselves and save those people, we fought back. The bloody brawl left us battered and bruised, but we managed to subdue our attackers. As Charles stayed with the victims, I explored further into their heart-wrenching lair. There, I discovered a gruesome tableau, a display of past victims who had been brutally murdered as part of their demented experiments. My heartbeat pounded in my ears as I scrambled back to Charles and frantically called 911. Announce the whispers hideout! I shouted over the sound of sirens, which drowned out any residual whispers lingering in our minds. As police stormed through the decaying underground chamber, they arrested those masked figures responsible for ceaseless terror throughout Portland for decades. Rescued survivors sobbed in relief upon being saved from their destined fate as test subjects. News of our heroic act spread throughout Portland like wildfire. Reporters formed human barricades around our homes. Police thanked us. Citizens gossiped in cafes. It was all over social media platforms. Though further investigations into the whispers persisted, public exposure signaled their eventual end, the darkness dissipating in the face of the truth. 
our lives returned to normalcy. But every time I walked past those stairs in the now brightened woods, a chill ran down my spine. The postcards from around the world continued to gather dust in my attic, a hobby shelved for a few years in favor of vigilance against that lurking darkness. Portland had changed. Its terrors had transformed into memories shared with a shudder over quiet drinks or late-night campfires. Charles and I hid no longer in fear. We had fought and conquered our nightmares. I've always been fascinated by places that are shunned by the masses. It might have something to do with my childhood, growing up in an old, dilapidated house where I shared my room with countless shadows and whispers from the past. The thrill of unraveling dark mysteries is irresistible to me. It all started on August 5, 2019 when I traveled across the country to visit one of the most intriguing places I'd ever come across. A mysterious set of stairs in the middle of the woods in a scarcely populated area of North Carolina. I had learned about them from an online forum dedicated to strange and unexplained phenomena. Apparently, they were just ordinary wooden stairs, leading nowhere and looking completely out of place among all the foliage. That alone piqued my interest. Once I reached my destination, I contacted someone from that forum who lived nearby, a woman named Mona Cantrell. Over coffee, she agreed to take me to the stairs tomorrow morning. After a surprisingly comfortable night at a motel in town, we set off into the woods together. As we navigated through dense undergrowth, Mona told me stories about locals who had vanished during their visits to these steps. The most recent case was last year when Brian Mercer went out for his usual hike and never came back, she said, but some incidents go back decades. After hiking for hours, we finally reached our destination. The sight before me was perplexing, a perfectly ordinary set of rotting wooden stairs right in front of us. The air around them was heavy and unsettling. As we cautiously approached the stairs, I noticed graffiti on one of the steps. Jonah Harrower was here. This name seemed familiar. After racking my brain for several seconds, it finally hit me. Jonah Harrower was one of those locals who had disappeared years ago without a trace. Not only this bothered me, but also the fact that it seemed like someone had deliberately tried to wipe away the graffiti. As the sun began to set, we decided it was best to head back. On our way out of the woods, we stumbled across a group of people who were searching for yet another missing person, Susan Fitzroy, a waitress from the town's cafe. When we got back to town, I spent hours researching Jonah Harrower and others who had gone missing near those stairs. The more I read about them and spoke with locals about them, the more I began to believe that there might be some connection with the dog fighting ring that used to operate in the area. Some say Jonah got mixed up in it and might have antagonized a fellow partygoer by winning too many bets. A fire destroyed the warehouse where they conducted the dogfights years ago, but those involved never faced justice. This ignited an idea in my mind. Maybe some of these men were taking out their vengeance against people they believed wronged them, using the stairs as a place to dump their bodies. But why would these culprits leave behind ominous graffiti on those very steps? Mona called me early the next morning, disturbed. She'd received a threatening note at her doorstep that read, Keep away from the woods. We reported it to the local police, and after listening to our findings, an officer named David Ortega disclosed something crucial. Susan Fitzroy was last seen in a heated argument with two men who are indeed linked with that dog-fighting ring that used to run here, he said hesitantly. 
The pieces suddenly clicked for me. The names on those stairs, Jonah Harrower's and all others, were trophies for these men. However, their identity remains hidden, masked behind shadows and secrets. To this day, we don't know where Susan Fitzroy is or if she will ever be found. But I know, deep in my heart, that she is another name that haunts those stairs in the woods. And the men responsible for these merciless acts remain an unsettling enigma. But I can't give up, and neither can Mona Cantrell or Officer Ortega. Because every time we sleep, those words whisper through the whispers of our dreams. Keep away from the woods. Over the next few weeks, Mona, Officer Ortega, and I became obsessed with the idea of cracking this case. We were convinced that if we could find any sort of pattern or link between the mysterious steps and the dog fighting ring, we'd be able to apprehend those responsible. One night, after hours of scouring through records and forums, I stumbled upon something that sent chills down my spine. There was another man connected to the dog fighting ring who had a history of violence and an unhealthy obsession with dead things, jackal taxidermy, to be precise. His name was Roland Vincent. Things got even stranger when I found out he had recently opened a dingy bar in town. The following day, Mona and I met up with Officer Ortega and told him about our findings. He admitted to having heard about Roland Vincent but never thought he could have any connection to Susan or the steps, but agreed it was worth looking into it. We decided to stake out outside Roland Vincent's bar, hoping to find more information and maybe even catch him in the act of taking another victim. After several nights of keeping watch like vultures perched on a rooftop, we noticed Roland meeting up with one of his cronies late at night near the entrance to the woods. Stay here, Officer Ortega whispered to us before slipping silently into the shadows on their heels. Hours passed without any sign of life from deep within the woods. My heart pounded in my chest with each passing minute until, finally, Officer Ortega returned. You wouldn't believe what I saw, he said breathlessly. We demanded details, hearts pounding in unison as he recounted finding a hidden trapdoor beneath an old tree trunk leading to an underground chamber filled with horrifying scenes. Mutilated canine corpses hung like twisted ornaments adorning every wall and corner. Decayed remains of numerous missing townspeople littered the cold floor. In the center of the ungodly space stood the imposing figure of a mammoth dog sculpture made of human bones. As he spoke, we could see terror battling with disbelief in his eyes. This was worse than any crime scene he'd ever encountered. He had been able to take a few gruesome photos without being discovered or caught so we had enough evidence to get a warrant and put an end to this nightmare. Officer Ortega assured us that with our collective testimony, Roland Vincent and his cronies would spend their remaining days rotting in prison. Though the news development should have brought closure or at least some semblance of justice, the images of that underground chamber haunted my dreams for months. In my nightmares, I could hear the ghostly whispering of Susan Fitzroy and Jonah Harrower, a constant reminder that their spirits would forever linger among those ominous steps hidden somewhere in those woods. Even though our findings led to Roland Vincent's arrest and conviction for his heinous crimes, it felt like we had only scratched the surface of an abyss so dark it could swallow you whole and leave nothing but your silent screams echoing through eternity. Eventually, Mona moved away from that cursed town, looking for a fresh start. Officer Ortega followed suit not long after. As for me, I returned to my home, far away from those haunted woods. The mystery surrounding the steps remains unsolved. Who built them and why they were placed in the middle of the woods? Yet every once in a while, when night falls and shadows dance around my apartment walls, 
I imagine reaching out to Mona Cantrell or Officer Ortega and searching for more answers. But for now, I glance nervously over my shoulder as I scribble these words out onto paper, praying that the truth about these sinister steps stays buried deep within those woods forevermore, far away from anyone's reach. As a seasoned college professor with a serious passion for avian photography, I've navigated hidden corners of America like a bird on the wing. My research on the migratory patterns of North American birds has taken me to many unassuming and remote places. One would think these would be uneventful journeys, but quite the opposite is true. There was one encounter that still unsettles me to this day. It was early August 2017, and I remember it vividly because it happened right after celebrating my leap into early retirement. Eventful months teed up my expedition to an old-growth forest in Oregon, where I had heard tales of rare bird species thriving amongst the ancient trees. Accompanied by two graduate students, Danilo Cooper and Shireen Dahl, we ventured deep into the forest in search of these elusive avian wonders. In the midst of our pursuit, we stumbled across a peculiar set of stairs in the woods that seemingly led nowhere. They were so incongruous in their environment, seemingly abandoned from civilization but perfectly functional like any residential asset. Hey Professor Lowerth, Shireen spoke up with an open map in her hand. These stairs aren't marked anywhere on here. Danilo squinted through binoculars into the distance, but found nothing that could offer any explanation for their presence. Our curiosity was piqued despite limited rations and diminishing daylight hours. As dusk crept closer and closer, we decided to ascend midway up the mysterious staircase while keeping each other within sight. On top of a landing halfway up the stairs, I noticed something strange about the surrounding vegetation. It was lashed together with sinewy cords, fastenings that could have only been crafted by human hands. What do you think this is about? Danilo asked aloud as he tugged at one of these cords. Raising my camera to snap a few photos documenting our discovery, I suddenly heard a cruel laughter echoing through the tree trunks. Furtively glancing around, I noticed a group of figures flitting off into the darkness like sinister shadows. Did you see? Shireen nervously asked, her words trailing. But we had all felt it, an overwhelming sense of dread and unease. Armed with only our flashlights and dwindling courage, we decided to follow the shadowy figures through the woods. They materialized at a sinister gathering of hooded men, illuminated only by the flickering light of a massive bonfire that left looming shadows dancing like demons on the nearby trees. Hey guys, I whispered to Danilo and Shireen as I tried to capture this haunting scene through my camera lens. Listen carefully to their conversation. We went unnoticed as we inched closer enough to hear chilling tales of past conquests, seemingly normal people going about their lives when lured into their killer's grasp by a seemingly innocent circumstance in this very same forest, evidently falling victim to the cruel intentions of these hooded figures. We must tell the authorities, Shireen said, her voice wavering with fear and anticipation. We agreed we couldn't turn back now, not unless we were sure this malevolent cult was brought to justice. As the days passed, we watched covertly from behind thorny bushes or hidden crevasses, gathering evidence of their nefarious activities. We discovered that their leader was known only as the Harlequin, an alias that struck terror into his minions. His true identity remained elusive. It was several days later that things took an even darker turn. 
An outsider unsuspectingly wandered into this den of deception while admiring the enigmatic stairs, just as we had done. A hulking figure swooped down on her like a hawk on its prey. The ensuing events chilled us to the core. Her screams of terror carried across the wind through the trees and were permanently etched into our memories. When we returned to civilization, still shaken from witnessing such depravity, we went to the authorities with our evidence. There was a lengthy investigation spearheaded by Detective Roscoe Lowell, who concluded that the Harlequin was not only orchestrating these blood-chilling schemes but also masking himself as a respected member of society. The cult was a gruesome facade crafted to cloak his insidious motivations, while the other members were simply pawns in his sinister game. I knew we had to act fast, and I was convinced of one thing. Their leader, the Harlequin, had to have some involvement with the old-growth forest itself. Otherwise, why would he choose such a remote location for his sinister operations? I decided to infiltrate their ranks by posing as a new member of their cult. Danilo and Shireen went into hiding while keeping contact with me through encrypted messages. Using the knowledge from our observations, I constructed a false identity and approached the Harlequin's minions in the woods. They were surprisingly open to new recruits, as long as I swore an oath of loyalty to their cause. I complied and bided my time, waiting for the perfect moment to unmask the Harlequin. Over the next few days, I participated in macabre rituals that turned my stomach and made sleep impossible. When we'd gather around the bonfire at each meeting, I'd search for a clue that could expose the Harlequin's true identity. During one of these cult gatherings, as gruesome acts were being performed around me, a horrible realization struck me like lightning. The hooded members spoke with a certain familiarity when discussing the old-growth forest, a topic that seemed more fitting among bird-watching enthusiasts than cold-blooded murderers. My heart pumped like never before. Combining this observation with how oddly ceremonial the staircase seemed in the woods made it clear to me that the Harlequin was someone who had frequent access to or connections to this research site. The theory flooded my thoughts, each piece fitting together like an intricate puzzle. Who in the bird-watching community has such access and commands frightening respect within this cult? The answer should have hit me instantly, but instead, it was forced out during one final ritual. As the cult members chanted ominously around me, I finally recognized which hooded figure carried himself with a distinct air of authority. It was none other than my former mentor, Professor Loworth. I knew I had to act quickly. I feigned a sudden illness that prompted the Harlequin, still shrouded, to approach me. Then, without hesitation, I grabbed the cult leader's hood and yanked it off. The gasp from the gathered members was louder than any thunderclap, sending tremors down my spine as the piercings in the Harlequin's face glinted ominously in the flickering firelight. Standing there, Bleary-eyed and breathless like a wild predator surrounded by its prey, was indeed Professor Loworth. Realizing his identity had been exposed, all eyes locked on him, panic-stricken and vulnerable. He ordered his followers to silence me once and for all. However, I had the perfect trump card. Before they could react, I revealed all the evidence to Nilo, Shireen, and I had collected during our initial pursuit. Shocked by their leader's betrayal, they hesitated before turning against him instead. While chaos erupted from within their ranks, I took my opportunity and made a desperate sprint towards the staircase amidst cult members taking up arms against their deceitful leader. Once beyond the wicked stairs and deep within the woods, I called upon Danilo, and Shireen to come out of hiding while alerting Detective Lowell of our findings. The authorities moved quickly. Utilizing our information, 
backed by video evidence, led them to arrest Professor Lowerth and dissolve the demonic cult he'd so intricately orchestrated. Though we were safe now, I was continually haunted by these chilling memories of true crime beyond imagination and the irony that monsters lurk not only among ancient trees but behind charming smiles too. However terrifying our encounter may have been for Danilo and Shireen, it gave birth to an unbreakable bond between us. With stories like ours gaining popularity on channels like Mr. Nightmare, we knew there was one thing to do. Together, we shared our story of Professor Lewerth and his cult with the world, daring an audience to stare into the dark abyss we escaped while warning society that horrors camouflage themselves in places long forgotten and masked by faces so familiar. The aftermath of such an engrossing tale of evil permeating the old-growth forest left listeners and readers gasping for a breath of security, but echoing louder within them was a declaration, a promise that no crime would remain shrouded in shadows forever. I've always been drawn to the thrill of the unknown, and I loved venturing deep into seemingly mundane places searching for a sense of wonder. One moment in my life will forever stand out. You see, I had just begun bungee jumping as a way to cope with my recent divorce from my high school sweetheart, Erica Sterling. As I was seeking a new adventure spot, I stumbled upon an online forum post about these peculiar stairs in the woods near a place called Evergreen Park, located in the heart of Oregon. Intrigued, I thought it would be the ideal location for some bungee jumping. So with my mind set and gear packed, I called up my best friend Joel Waters to accompany me on this trip. We gathered our essentials and drove to Oregon. Upon reaching Evergreen Park, we asked a park ranger named Hank Thomas for help finding the fabled stairs. After a few uncertain glances between my friend Joel and myself, Hank hesitantly agreed to show us where they were located. He guided us through thick shrubbery and underbrush until we finally stood at the foot of these out-of-place stone steps. There was something undoubtedly eerie about their presence. They seemed to lead nowhere, yet they possessed an irresistible magnetic energy that begged us to climb them. Taking up our gear bags and harnesses, Joel and I began cautiously making our ascent when, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, two grisly murders happened just beyond our view. We heard blood-curdling screams and saw what could only be described as large pools of crimson blood seeping through the dense foliage towards us. Stunned, bewildered, and petrified by fear, Joel and I scrambled off the steps to seek cover behind some nearby boulders before contacting the authorities on our satellite phone. As we waited for help to arrive, enveloped by utter darkness and terrified whispers, it became apparent that the threat of these separate grisly killings was likely just one chillingly brutal individual or group. Indeed, it wasn't long before we noticed a silhouette creeping forth from the trees, clutching a gleaming blade, fingers caked in blood. We could now make out a gruff, sadistic laughter as our attackers seemed to take immense pleasure in their recent kill. Our worst fears were confirmed by the time authorities rushed into the scene. Two mutilated bodies lay lifeless on the forest floor. The detectives began examining the horrifying crime scene while taking statements from Joel and me. A few days later, still shaken beyond words, we sat with a private investigator named Alex Rasmussen, who shared distressing details he'd uncovered from a third party. He told us about an elusive criminal collective known as the Shadow Kids, known for their gruesome and cruel acts of violence executed on unsuspecting hikers. 
The mysterious stairs in Evergreen Park had become their killing grounds of choice. Alex had been investigating a separate case involving targeted campers when terrifying stories involving the Shadow Kids came to his attention. It was evident they operated within these woods, seeking those brave enough to face the daunting pull of those mysterious steps. Their motive? He asked before answering himself. Pure, unhinged carnage. As we sat there in shock, grappling with how our innocent adventurous desires led us to horrific murder scenes at the hands of some savagely brutal crew, never knowing their true identity. I couldn't help but think about what could have been our fate if we'd wandered further into those woods. The possibility still sends chills down my spine. And while no new information regarding the Shadow Kids surfaced after that final confidential meeting with Alex Rasmussen, I can't help but be haunted by the nightmare of my very brush with death, all because of a tantalizing set of stairs that promised nothing but ended with an acrid stench of immeasurable pain, carnage, and lingering unease. I knew I couldn't let this nightmare win. I knew that the only way to conquer fear was to face it head on. So, with a newfound determination, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I began secretly working on uncovering the true identities of the Shadow Kids and putting an end to their reign of terror. In my quest for knowledge, I started visiting online forums digging through every resource that could provide even the barest hint about these enigmatic killers. Months turned into years as I meticulously built profiles on each member of this vicious group. But the breakthrough finally came when I stumbled upon a piece of crucial information. A raid on an underground bunker had led to the arrest of one of the Shadow Kids. With the case finally back in the limelight, Alex Rasmussen returned to the forefront of our investigation. With his help and some heavy persuasion, we managed to secure a closed-door interview with the captured member of the Shadow Kids. As we entered his jail cell, he laughed, a man broken by his incarceration, but still clearly imprisoned by his demented reality. We spoke at length with him about his involvement in the Shadow Kids and discovered the driving force behind their actions, their love for chaos and torment. He confessed that he had stumbled upon this group during a period of vulnerability in his life and was quickly indoctrinated into their world. They orchestrated gruesome murders not for money or power but purely for pleasure and artistic expression. For days, we grilled him about other members' identities, using any scrap of information we could find in our previous research as leverage. Eventually, enough pieces fell into place to paint a horrifyingly clear picture. We laid out our findings, everything from aliases and ages to postal codes and aliases, and delivered them to law enforcement. Excitement buzzed through our community as a result of that evidence. One anonymous call led them straight into their lair, a mansion hidden deep within the dense forest. As the police burst through the gates, bodies littered the front yard, and gruesome blood patterns adorned the wallpaper. But no one was home. Heartbreakingly close as we were, the shadow kids had fled. As weeks turned into months without any leads, Alex and I refused to give up. Dark, sleepless nights only fueled our determination, and soon enough, it paid off. In a moment of sheer luck, a friend spotted one of the Shadow Kids, recognized by his unique tattoo, in a city far from Oregon. After discreetly contacting Alex and me, we rushed to reconvene with law enforcement. Backup assembled quickly but stealthily surrounded the area where we knew he'd been last sighted. And then, chaos unfolded in a dizzying blur. Shouting erupted as this shadow kid screamed out for his comrades. But to our shock, he was met with deafening silence. No response came. In their haste to escape their elaborate house of horrors, 
they'd abandoned each other. One by one, they were taken down, scattered across continents, forced into the solitude and darkness they so craved. Over time, every member found themselves back at the cells where it all began, bars not glistening in silver moonlight but shrouded in cold steel rot. As news spread about our success in capturing the Shadow Kids, I stood tall, knowing that I'd conquered my fear and faced the nightmares that haunted me head on. But deep inside my heart, I know that you don't erase years of pain overnight, and eerie unease will forever be etched into my soul. Our journey wasn't easy. It was laced with horrors no human should ever have to witness. But when faced with seemingly insurmountable evil, it's often the only choice to charge forward bravely into the abyss that clings so tightly to our lungs. And after a tumultuous adventure digging through the darkness in search of some light, I finally emerged stronger, wiser, and indefatigably unyielding. My name is Lysander Jameson, and I have a peculiar obsession with collecting antique diving helmets. It all started when my father gifted me one on my twelfth birthday. Since then, I've scoured thrift stores, yard sales, and obscure online auctions to add more unique pieces to my ever-growing collection. On the evening of June 22, 2017, this simple fascination would lead me down a grim path. Somewhere in the heart of Louisiana, there was a small town blessed with picturesque landscapes and lush greenery. It was here that my best friend Remy Martin and I planned to meet our college friends for a camping trip with the specific purpose of finding an elusive hidden set of stairs in the dense woods. Josh Milton, a fellow camper from our group, recently lost a bet with Remy. As repayment, he told us about these strange stairs that supposedly led to nowhere in particular but were rumored to be connected to unexplained disappearances. After arriving at our destination and meeting up with Natalie Rubin and Dean Kowalski, who had already set up their tents, we ventured into the woods. The forest seemed unnaturally quiet as we walked deeper along the trail. Occasionally we veered off track when some formation caught our attention, but we couldn't find the mysterious stairs. As evening approached, we decided to turn back toward camp. As Natalie documented our trip with her camcorder, we discussed theories about those supposed urban legends. Y'all ever hear about those hidden underground fight clubs? Dean asked while snapping twigs underfoot. Yeah. Natalie chimed in enthusiastically. I heard there's one right here in Louisiana where people fight to the death with animal masks on. Remy rolled his eyes. He was never impressed by anything that he couldn't personally verify. These stories always come from someone's brother's cousin's roommate who swears they saw the evidence themselves. It's all just tall tales, he said dismissively. Right when we approached our campsite, Remy spied a glinting object hidden beneath some foliage. Curious, we unearthed a blood-encrusted knife. It sent chills rippling through my spine. We exchanged uneasy glances, but ultimately dismissed it as a mislaid hunting tool. Still, the grim discovery left an unsettling air in our midst. Before going to bed that night, I couldn't shake the thoughts plaguing my mind. My nerves were on edge, and my curiosity was piqued. I needed to find those damned stairs in the woods. When Remy stirred from his sleep, he found me furiously scouring through online forums for any reliable information. What are you doing? He muttered groggily. We need to find those stairs, Remington. I was adamant. I found another forum post where a guy mentioned seeing them in this area. We can't leave until we've at least found them. Grumbling, 
Remy agreed to revisit our search first thing in the morning. We began our search early that day with little luck until Dean spotted something highly unusual at the edge of a ridge. What appeared to be a broken staircase leading up into the abyss of treetops above us. Finally, the stairs didn't seem to end or offer any proper destination, but rather haphazardly climbed heavenward. We marveled at their abnormal existence and speculated about their origin and purpose. As Remy cracked open a beer and leaned against one step, Josh told us about his friend, who'd initially told him about these eerie stairs. So, Josh began in a hushed tone, my buddy Pete saw you used to live around here and swore he'd encounter these stairs a few times before they vanished into thin air. After spending the day discussing theories and exploring farther ahead, we returned to camp with a feeling of triumph. As the shadows stretched darker and longer, a local man greeted us. The old man seemed lost until we mentioned the stairs. Then his face turned pale and serious. Y'all found them? Those stairs are cursed, he warned. One time, a group of masked men entered those woods at night, rumored to be involved with underground death fights. They never returned, and folks heard tormented screams for days. As the frightened man rushed home, we again exchanged unnerved expressions but shrugged them off attributing his story to local folklore. The next morning, we discovered Remy missing. We split into groups and frantically looked for any sign of him. Hours passed with no luck, and we were close to calling the authorities when Dean spotted something by the stairs, partially buried under leaves, Remy's beer bottle. Fear gripped us as we realized the old man's warnings might not just be folklore. Suddenly, echoing through the quiet forest, we heard the blood-curdling screams of Remy. We raced towards the sound, our hearts pounding in our chests. Following his shouts, we stumbled upon a hidden pathway that led to a concealed underground entrance. It seemed like nobody had used it in ages. Vines and moss covered its rusty metal door. We hesitated for a moment, contemplating our options. But the thought of losing Remy propelled us forward, fear turning into determination. Inside was a long hall with flickering lights hanging from the ceiling. The air was thick with an unsettling smell, a mixture of blood and damp earth. As we navigated deeper into the underground lair, we came across several rooms with unsettling scenes. One room contained cages filled with various animals wearing strange masks, like they had been cruelly experimented upon. But there was no time to process all of these horrors as Remy's screams grew louder and more panicked. Finally, we arrived at a sizable chamber where an audience of masked figures surrounded a blood-soaked pit. At its center stood Remy, bruised and battered but alive. He was facing off against another masked figure, relentless in their pursuit to harm him. Every brutal hit resonated through our bones as we watched helplessly from our hiding spot. I thought about trying to save Remy myself, but that seemed like suicide given the number of opponents present. So I did something smart. I took out my phone and started recording everything happening inside that sinister chamber. When another contender approached Remy after defeating his original attacker, I gasped loudly in shock. Hearing my gasp, several masked figures suddenly turned their attention towards us. Their terrifying masks and menace-filled eyes made it clear they did not intend to let us escape. We had no option but to run for our lives. With adrenaline fueling our escape, we charged back the way we came, praying we wouldn't be caught. As we bolted, I dialed 911, giving the operator an urgent summary of our situation and our precise location in the underground compound. Once outside, we frantically barricaded the entrance, 
and raced towards our campsite while awaiting help. Exhausted and scared out of our minds, we huddled together as night shrouded the forest. When the police arrived, armed and ready for a fight, they were shocked to find that every single masked figure was gone, had escaped or vanished into thin air. The only thing left behind were disturbing scenes of their gruesome activities. But my recording offered critical evidence. Haunting images from that night would haunt them indefinitely as they investigated this macabre underground world of animal mass death fights. At that moment, I longed to hold on to Remy, relieved that he had survived but traumatized by what he had been through. He'd never be the same person again after facing such horrors in those cursed woods with those monsters. In the end, several arrests were made, thanks in part to my recording, but some remain at large. For years afterward, my dreams tormented me with memories of those life-altering events. It became impossible for me to even look at that staircase without shivering in dread. I chose to move away from Louisiana and have never gone back since resigning from that job. And although I'll always remember Remy's haunting cries for help emerging from behind animal masks etched forever in my nightmares, at least I'll never have to encounter those godforsaken stairs or that underground fight club ever again. I've always had this peculiar talent, an unusual sense of smell. I can detect a scent from miles away, and it's never failed me. Some call it a gift, others call it a curse. My name is Carter Jameson, and this is my scariest personal encounter. On May 12, 2018, a group of friends and I decided to explore the vast forest that surrounded our town. The woods were known for their eerie atmosphere, but despite numerous rumors and stories about strange hauntings or mysterious creatures, we never gave them much thought. We gathered at the edge of the trees one late afternoon, checking our gear and preparing ourselves for an adventure in search of an old set of stairs that was said to be hidden within the woods, stairs leading to nowhere with no apparent purpose. Their presence captivated me. As we ventured deeper into the forest, the air grew thick with tension. It didn't feel like our usual excursions into these familiar woods. Something felt off. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what was different, but my gut warned me not to ignore it. Why are you guys acting so creeped out? One friend asked the others while chewing on a protein bar. Let's just focus on finding those damn stairs. Another responded, clearly bothered. Hours passed as we wandered around in search of our enigmatic destination, all the while feeling as if we weren't alone. And then, finally, the air shifted as I caught a whiff of copper mixed with earthy forest odors. Blood. Fresh blood. The metallic scent both repulsed and intrigued me in equal measure. Guys! I suddenly called out to my friends. Something's happened nearby. What? They asked in surprise, pausing and regarding me with concern as I filled them in on my unsettling discovery. My team knew better than to doubt me, so we followed the scent and soon stumbled upon a horrifically gruesome scene. The source of the blood was a mutilated deer, its entrails spilling out in a twisted display of malevolence. What the hell did this? My friend Jake muttered under his breath, horrified, as we exchanged nervous glances. But I knew this scene wasn't the work of a wild animal. There was something calculated, almost deliberate, about the carnage. As I examined the deer's wounds closely, I observed intricate patterns carved into its flesh. That was when I knew we were not alone in these woods. As my friends started to panic, I urged them onward. The stairs were still our primary objective. 
The smell of blood grew stronger as we trekked deeper and deeper until, at last, we found them. There they stood, old stone stairs, moss-covered and weather-worn, surrounded by dense foliage. Feeling uneasy and aware of our desperation to exit the forest, we opted to split into pairs and meet back at the stairs in precisely half an hour, our logic being that with multiple search parties, we would find our way out more effectively. As my partner and I ventured away from the structure, that voice in my head piped up yet again. Danger is near. This overwhelming sense of doom fell over me as we trampled determinately through the undergrowth. And then we heard screams. Without sparing a second thought, I sprinted back to the stairs that seemed to be at the center of it all. My partner is following closely behind. Breathless and panicked, we came upon another malevolent act. One friend lay motionless on her back atop those sinister steps. Her throat slashed wide open. Jake clutched his head in agony as he uttered words that struck terror into my heart. It's Calvin! He killed her! Calvin was another member of our group. He'd been with us since the beginning, exploring and seeking out mysteries with the rest of our crew. Or so we thought. We were in disbelief, unable to comprehend what had just occurred. The look on Jake's face was that of pure terror, and we all knew he wasn't lying. It suddenly clicked. All those scenes of gore and terror had been perpetrated by someone we knew, someone who had gained our trust as a dear friend. I couldn't help but wonder if he had meticulously planned it all, our adventure into these very woods that now seethed with death and deceit. Our minds reeled as we realized there was no time to waste. We still needed to find Calvin and deal with him before he inflicted more damage. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I pushed on, every one of my senses heightened. The metallic tang in the air grew stronger and louder, guttural snarls resonated throughout the forest. We came across another friend near a cluster of bushes, panting heavily and with hands caked in blood. I found him, he stammered, pointing at the dark figure across the clearing. We locked eyes for a split second before Calvin darted deeper into the woods, like he was reeled in by an invisible force. Driven by desperation and fear, we pursued him relentlessly while being careful not to make noise. With every breath, his lingering scent became more apparent, which helped me pin down his location faster than my fellow pursuers. As we continued our pursuit, Calvin started reciting some antique language that seemed somehow both familiar and foreign, like it stemmed from nightmares shared by humanity. The forest curled around us as if reacting to those words. Suddenly, amidst the chaos and terror, I noticed the woods seemed oddly familiar once again, not unlike the countless adventures we had shared together in this very same place only now tainted by the cruel revelation of betrayal within our ranks. This painful realization finally confirmed my suspicions regarding Calvin's true nature. He was no friend at all, but rather a malevolent entity who carefully crafted friendships to prey on our unbridled curiosity. My gut told me we were racing against time, so I urged my remaining companions to use their desperation as fuel towards Calvin's capture. As we drew closer to him, we discovered what appeared to be some hidden lair deep within the forest, oddly out of place amidst this otherwise serene and untouched wilderness. Inside this hideaway was a macabre sight, walls lined with numerous photographs and personal belongings taken from friends and strangers alike. It was clear he had been stalking people for years, carefully watching and waiting for the perfect moment to strike. At that very instant, Calvin emerged from the shadows, his face contorted with sadistic pleasure. You figured me out too late, he sneered wickedly. 
your little group was just another ploy to entertain me and cultivate new victims. In a last-ditch effort to escape, we frantically fought him off as the lair began collapsing around us, nature itself seemingly revolting against its dark occupant. We managed to subdue Calvin, and as we dragged him out of his crumbling sanctuary, the forest reverted back to its previous state as if expelling an unwanted intruder. The resolution I sought, unconventional, uneasy, and unsettling, came as the authorities arrived and took Calvin away. The forest no longer appeared sinister, at least not more than it had before. The painful truth behind Calvin's deception served as a permanent reminder of the darkness capable of lying dormant within man's hidden nature. Greetings like wraiths from the depths of our subconscious, sometimes it was necessary to face the horrors head-on, acknowledging our fragility and reliance on shared bonds for safety, whether corporeal or ethereal in nature. Although life would continue without Calvin's presence, I can never unsee or forget his actions during that ominous night, a unique and eerie tale forever etched into my bones, one I recount only in hushed whispers among trusted company, still seeking validation for my gut instincts amidst doubt, always subconsciously expecting echoes of that ancient language twisting reality into a nightmare while unseen threats lurk in every corner. A while back, I used to be an amateur chess player trying to make it into the big leagues. It was a strange time in my life, the result of being between jobs and having inherited a small, unexpected sum of money. I spent countless hours studying games and competing in local tournaments. Eventually, my zeal for chess waned, but not before it led me to discover hidden corners in popular places in the USA. It was sometime in August 2017 that I heard about a unique chess club called The Stairs Club, located deep within a dense forest in Oregon. This club was famed for its beautiful but strange location, at the top of an ancient staircase deep in the woods. Intrigued by this mysterious organization, I packed my bags and ventured out in search of this secluded retreat. I'll never forget that distinctive feeling when I first set foot on those stairs, solid stone covered with decades-old moss, the looming trees on both sides shunning sunlight and making space for darkness to thrive. There I stood at the base of these eerie yet breathtaking steps and started ascending into the unknown. The forest seemed alive with sounds, crackling leaves underfoot, rustling branches overhead and faint animal noises echoing through the trees. Yet as I continued upward, these sounds faded until only my footsteps remained. About halfway up, I encountered another man heading down the stairs. His name was Andrew Crossland, or so he said. He had a hearty laugh and a strong grip when we shook hands. Long climb, Matt, he said, chuckling. You're not kidding. I replied. What's up there? You'll see, he said enigmatically before descending below me. Feeling disquieted but determined to uncover the secrets of this peculiar realm, I pressed onwards until, finally, I reached the summit. There it was, an outlandish sight of people seated around wooden tables, engrossed in their chess matches. Shadows played across the clearing, cast by the canopy overhead and flickering candlelight laid out on each table. Intoxicating aromas from a nearby fire pit enveloped one's senses. It felt otherworldly. After several exhilarating games, I found myself chatting with another chess enthusiast named Lara. She told me about the history of the place and how only select people knew of its existence. I couldn't comprehend how something so fascinating could be so well hidden. 
It was then that Lara's expression changed. A sinister air settled over her face as she recounted gruesome rumors of a hidden group of individuals involved in treacherous activities within this very forest. As she spoke, I felt that same eerie sensation from earlier crawl up my spine. A few weeks later, when I returned to my normal life, I received an unsettling call from Andrew Crossland, the man I had met on the stairs that fateful day. He explained that his actual name was Andy Turner, and he was an undercover FBI agent investigating the illegal group Lara had mentioned during my visit to the club. He shared ghastly details of their actions, horrendous crimes, vicious assaults on unsuspecting victims, people who had been hunted down like animals in those woods. Worse yet, he claimed they used the Stairs Club as a ploy to gain access to new blood. As we talked more, it became clear that my peculiar encounter with Lara wasn't mere coincidence. She was one of them the antagonists he sought to expose and apprehend. Her sweet facade had shattered with this revelation. Their names remained a mystery for now, but Andy swore that they were close to revealing their true identities. He urged me to distance myself from any further correspondence with these people and invited me to join him in his fight against them if I ever returned to Oregon. I could not comprehend what madness had plagued the place I once saw as a sanctuary. My heart races anew as I recount these unspeakable deeds. The Stairs Club had been an enigmatic dream that has now morphed into a living nightmare. The truth is out there, but it lies far away at the top of those stairs in the woods, where darkness and murder await behind the facade of a simple chess game. Haunted by the knowledge of the secret crimes happening in that forest surrounding the Stairs Club, my life was never the same. I began to obsess over it, researching online and trying to find anything about this hidden group. But my search was fruitless. I had to go back to Oregon and see for myself what was truly going on. A sense of deja vu washed over me as I once again found myself at the base of those ancient stairs. This time, a chilling air greeted me. Stealing my nerves, I ascended slowly as a feeling of dread crept up my spine. My footsteps resonated through the silence but were occasionally drowned out by a distant wail or rustled deep within the woods. Finally. I reached the top and found the familiar sight of wooden tables surrounded by people absorbed in their chess games. Nothing seemed to miss at first glance. Looking around cautiously, I saw Lara sitting at one of the tables with an unsettling smile plastered across her face. I approached her, but this time, there was no small talk or friendly banter. She didn't waste any time, cutting to the chase. You came back, she hissed with a smirk. You're either brave or foolish. Her voice had lost the sweetness it once had and now held a menacing undertone. To my left, there was a sudden commotion. Screams and cries for help rang through the air as three masked figures dragged a struggling man towards a hidden corner near the edge of the clearing. Lara got up from her seat and strolled confidently towards me leaning in close and whispering. What's it going to be? Will you look away like everyone else here? Or will you do something about it? My heart raced. It felt like it would tear out of my chest. I mustered every ounce of courage I had inside me, deciding then that no matter what happened, I wouldn't stand idly by anymore. Swiftly, I lunged at one of the masked assailants grabbing a nearby fire poker as I did so. The makeshift weapon found its mark in the figure's back. The man screamed and crumpled to the ground, blood pooling around him. The other two attackers froze momentarily but quickly recovered and turned their attention to me. Adrenaline surged through my veins. One of them charged at me with a knife, but I sidestepped just in time. 
The blade dug into a nearby tree trunk instead, getting stuck. Seizing the moment, I kicked him in the stomach and sent him sprawling. The last attacker circled me carefully. He was smarter than the others and more cunning. Our dance was fraught with life-threatening stakes. Meanwhile, the club's patrons looked on in horror at the unfolding scene while others fled into the woods. Feeling backed into a corner and desperate for help, I called out for Andy, hoping against hope that he'd respond. Seconds later, a man burst from the bushes at the periphery of the clearing. It was Andy Turner. Together, we managed to overpower and subdue the last assailant just as sirens wailed in the distance. Andy had alerted fellow agents before coming in. As police surrounded us and arrested our captured attackers, Lara stood watching with an unreadable expression until she casually slipped away unnoticed amidst the commotion. We never got answers from our captives as to who they were or who their true leader was. They remained tight-lipped until the bitter end. But something changed that day. Word about what happened at the Stairs Club spread like wildfire through whatever channels these people used for communication. Consequently, attacks ceased around that area of Oregon's forest. Our actions had made a difference, it seemed. And though we couldn't apprehend Lara or uncover her true name or her organization's secrets, we had put a stop to this bloodshed. The Stairs Club went quiet after that eventually disappearing entirely. I never played chess again. As for myself and Andy Turner, we've become friends and sometimes collaborators on dark cases. We still search for links about that hidden group and the meaning behind the Stairs Club, eager to unearth the whole truth behind that eerie location in the woods and hoping that someday we may bring true justice to those who once found pleasure in haunting those ancient stairs. I used to be a pickpocket in my younger days. It's not something I'm proud of, but sometimes you have to do what you have to do to survive. My life turned around, though. I landed a decent job and moved far away from that old life. It wasn't until my camping trip with my friends in Yosemite National Park that everything changed again. It was June 15, 2019 when the group of us arrived at our campsite near the famous Half Dome. It was a beautiful area, with tall trees shading us from the sun and a creek nearby providing soothing background noise. The pristine location was even more exceptional because there were rumors of an abandoned staircase in the woods around here. Some said it belonged to an old mansion that had burned down while others believed it was part of something much more sinister. As the sun began setting on our first day there, my friend Michael called me over. He had found the staircase. Damn, this thing is creepy, I told him. It doesn't feel right, you know? I know, he chuckled nervously. Want to climb it? Nah, let's get back to camp. We can come back tomorrow. I suggested. The next morning, the oddities started happening. We heard distant screams throughout the night and assumed it was just some wildlife or other campers playing pranks. But when we woke up, my friend Victoria was missing. The six of us split up and searched the area for any sign of her, but she was nowhere to be found. We regrouped at camp as a sense of unease spread among us. Well, we have to go look for her again, John said finally, breaking the silence. I agree, Rebecca chimed in. We can't just sit here and let her wander around lost. We split into pairs and went out searching for Victoria one more time. Michael and I headed back to the mysterious staircase, thinking perhaps she had stumbled upon it. As we approached, we found Victoria's shoe near the bottom step, 
confirming our suspicions. The two of us climbed the stairs cautiously, each step sending shivering chills down our spines. As we reached the top, we noticed a small tree house in the distance. It seemed like an unlikely place to find Victoria, but we couldn't ignore any possibility. As we approached, I began to feel like someone was watching us. An urge to run filled me with dread. We entered the treehouse and found it empty except for a rotting mattress on the floor and blood stains staining its corners. The smell alone was enough to make us want to leave immediately. After leaving the treehouse with no sign of Victoria, my phone rang. Hey there, a man's raspy voice said. I think you might be looking for your friend. My blood ran cold. Who are you? Where's Victoria? I have her, he replied casually. Meet me at the bottom of that staircase you're so fond of. Michael heard the conversation and desperately tried to call for help as I walked back to the stairs. Neither of us knew how this man even knew about our location or why he had taken our friend. As I approached the staircase again, my heart raced in anticipation. At the bottom stood a tall man wearing a hooded sweatshirt, shielding his face from my view. Where is she? I demanded. She's safe, he growled before shoving a newspaper article into my hands. The Donnelly family murders, I read aloud. Four members were found brutally murdered in their home in 2015. My eyes drifted down to see a familiar name, David Humphreys, listed as their neighbor who discovered their bodies. The man then revealed his face, and I recognized him immediately. It was David Humphreys. He had a wild look in his eyes, one that seemed both unhinged and proud of his deeds. You see, he explained, I killed the Donnellys and built that tree house as a monument to my work. David forced me to follow him back to the tree house, where, luckily, Michael had managed to find park rangers who were waiting nearby. The rangers apprehended David Humphreys while he confessed to the murders. They found Victoria in a hidden cave nearby thankfully alive but severely traumatized. It turned out that in these woods, David was suspected of even more unsolved crimes from the past. Everyone was in shock, and we couldn't comprehend what had unfolded right in front of our eyes. In the following months, Yosemite turned into a crime scene. Forensic specialists dug deeper into David's disturbing history. More hidden locations for his heinous acts were uncovered throughout the park, complete with bones and personal items belonging to forgotten victims. Every new discovery only reinforced how twisted this man was and how misplaced our trust had been. Each one of us who experienced those horrifying days at Yosemite was left permanently scarred. I struggled to sleep jolted awake by nightmares where I could still hear Victoria's cries echoing through the woods or see David's manic grin staring back at me. On days when I managed to push those memories aside, other friends would call or text, their voices laced with pain as they recounted their own experiences during that camping trip from hell. We all tried to find solace by talking with each other, but some wounds were too deep to fully heal. David Humphrey's trial made headlines around the nation, and we were forced to relive our trauma in excruciating detail as evidence was presented and testimonies heard. He showed no remorse for his actions. Instead, he seemed to revel in the attention he received from both the media and the courtroom. Nevertheless, justice was eventually served, as David was convicted on several counts of murder and kidnapping among numerous other charges, and sentenced to life behind bars without parole. However, there remain more questions than answers regarding his motives and why he chose Yosemite National Park as his hunting ground for innocent victims. 
The staircase remained an eerie reminder of the terror we faced that summer. Park officials debated whether to dismantle it or leave it untouched as a testament to this dark chapter of history. Eventually, they decided to seal off that area of the park permanently as a sign of respect for the victims and their families. As for me, I could never fully shake off the memories of that dreadful trip. My life and values had changed drastically during those few days at Yosemite. I became more cautious and wary of others, haunted by the knowledge that someone who seemed so ordinary on the outside could be hiding a monstrous evil within. I eventually found solace in starting my own YouTube channel, where I shared my experience alongside other true crime stories. Through my videos, I reminded people that darkness exists even in places where we least expect it. And every time I thought about Yosemite and David Humphreys, I was motivated to shed light on the truth so that history wouldn't repeat itself. Those stairs might no longer cast their literal shadow over the park, but they left an indelible mark on our lives, as well as on those whose loved ones fell victim to David's sinister deeds. And while our journey into the heart of evil left us scarred, we couldn't let our past define us. We faced our fears and shared our stories, hoping that someday we might find peace and finally leave those demons behind. I never thought I'd become a collector of antique mirrors, but that's what happened after my first find at an estate sale in rural Illinois. A piercing pain shot through my head as I purchased the seemingly ordinary mirror, but it subsided as soon as I walked away. That, as it turned out, would be the catalyst for my growing obsession. Now, staring at my reflection in another musty, age-old mirror I'd found deep in the Appalachian woods, I wondered if maybe I should have left this one alone. One crisp fall morning, during a solo hiking trip in the Appalachians, I discovered a set of stairs in the woods. Stairs that led to nothing but an empty platform. Strange and eerie they might be, but curiosity got the better of me, and I ventured up. At the top of the stairs lay a dusty mirror, unremarkable except for its strange location. The oversized oval frame was covered with intricate carvings of roses and thorns. But it was when I caught sight of my reflection that everything changed. Hey man, watch where you're going! My best friend, Mitch, yelled from behind me. Our banter brought me back to reality. Sorry, I replied sheepishly. I got lost in thought for a moment there. Mitch came up behind me and patted me on the back. He and a few other friends were joining me on this hiking excursion to escape the grind of city life. We had all grown restless from being cooped up indoors for too long. As our hike continued, that nagging feeling of unease never left me. We set up camp near a quiet brook at dusk and roasted marshmallows over an open fire everyone engrossed in their own conversations. So, how about that mirror you found earlier? Mitch asked while taking another bite of his s'mores. It looked old and ridiculously out of place. I shrugged. I don't know. It's just another piece from my collection, I guess. Well, it's really creepy, Mitch insisted. You know how superstitious I am. I've heard stories about mirrors that can trap souls, show the future, or release demons. We should have left it behind. Despite my growing unease, I couldn't help but laugh at his intensity. Calm down, man. It's just a mirror. Later that night, as we fell asleep to the soothing sounds of the brook beside us, I found myself dreaming of the mirror from earlier that day. A scream ripped through the silence, jolting us all awake. 
We scrambled out of our tents in a panic. Jesus Christ! What the hell was that? One of our friends shouted. As we huddled together in the darkness, shaking and breathless, we noticed Charlotte had not followed suit. And when we saw her lifeless body lying near the edge of our campsite with a deep gash running across her throat, we knew what had caused the agonizing scream. Distraught and terrified, with adrenaline pumping through our veins, we fled through the woods to our cars, not even pausing to consider what monstrous force might have attacked her. The drive back to civilization was excruciatingly long, filled with shock and disbelief at what had happened. In the days that followed, an older man tapped me on the shoulder as I was leaving a cafe near work. Hi there. He introduced himself softly. I'm Paul, Charlotte's uncle. His voice wavered and his eyes filled with grief. I know you're trying to piece things together about what happened. He continued solemnly. Charlotte used to tell me about your hiking trips. He passed me a stack of old photographs and whispered in a hushed tone. I think you should look at these. The black and white pictures depicted a group of people dressed in early 20th century clothing. Among them was a man with an uncanny resemblance to mine, clutching the mirror I'd found in the woods. Cold shivers ran down my spine as I considered the implications. It couldn't be possible. But somehow, I knew that the man, my doppelganger from another age, and that damn mirror were the keys to understanding Charlotte's horrifying fate. It seemed I had accidentally unveiled something evil and deadly. And worst of all, it was just getting started, secretly lurking behind my own reflection. Over the next few weeks, the once light-hearted banter between Mitch and I faded into a palpable tension as our suspicion that this mirror played a large role in Charlotte's death grew. Mitch refused to come over to my place lest he accidentally look into the mirror, even for a second. Sleepless nights became the norm, with horrid nightmares leaving me drenched in sweat. It felt as if something was lurking just beyond the reaches of my knowledge, waiting for the right moment to strike. One evening, after downing several shots of whiskey to deal with my anxiety, I clumsily stumbled upon an online community dedicated to researching mysterious mirrors and their connections to unexplained deaths. In those threads, people shared photos of mirrors with carvings eerily similar to mine, thorns entwining around roses and various other sinister motifs. A user named Thorned Rose sent me a private message via the forum. Desperate for answers, I responded accordingly. Their messages carried an ominous tone. The mirror you found. I recognize the carvings. It's much older than you think. Part of a collection of mirrors forged centuries ago across Europe, rumored to carry a powerful curse that brings terrible suffering and death upon those who possess one of them. Asterisk chills ran down my spine as I read this revelation. The old black and white photographs that Paul had given me took on an even darker meaning. There's one more thing. They wrote with urgency. The man in the picture, your doppelganger. I believe he goes by many names but is known within dark circles as Reaper, a twisted soul that finds pleasure in luring unsuspecting victims towards cursed mirrors like yours. Asterisk my hands shook as I continued reading. Smoke or shatter any single cursed mirror, and the Reaper will be destroyed along with it, at least temporarily until another becomes the new curse bearer. Determined to rid myself and my friends of this evil, I devised a plan. Since my apartment was now tainted with the Reaper's presence, I opted to perform the ritual alone at a discreet location. Mitch wanted to come along but I insisted it was too dangerous. At midnight, I hauled the mirror to an abandoned warehouse. I doused its odious frame with gasoline before igniting it. 
Engulfed in flames, the warped reflection of me blurred into a sinister apparition, the Reaper. Enjoy your fleeting freedom. He hissed menacingly as the flames consumed him. A devastating explosion followed, tearing the mirror apart and leaving only ashes in its wake. Dizzy and disoriented, I stumbled away from the scene, which was reeking of smoke and covered in ash. Returning home, it felt as though a heavy weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Despite still grieving Charlotte's untimely death, life slowly began to normalize again. Without the Reaper's presence haunting my dreams, sleep once again became restful. Months passed by without incident. Life was good until unexpected news shattered that illusion. Mitch informed me he'd begun collecting antique mirrors recently after, stumbling across, one during a vacation in Europe. My heart raced as he showed me his newest find, an ornate oval mirror with roses entwined around thorns, identical to mine before it was destroyed. Do you think it could be? Mitch trailed off as we stared at each other in disbelief. Is it possible that destroying one cursed mirror only offered temporary respite while transferring the curse to another? Had Reaper survived? I didn't have any answers, but for the first time since our chaotic ordeal began, we set aside our fear and vowed to find a permanent solution together. One by one, we hunted down cursed mirrors from hundreds of collections worldwide, never allowing ourselves to fall victim again. Our battle against the Reaper and his twisted game of death continues, but with each shattered curse, we fight the darkness that once consumed us. No matter what, we will not let this evil win. There's an ending in sight, but it remains to be seen whether it will be a just one or something far more sinister. As a lock -aker, I have always found solace in the intricacies of locks and the challenges they present. My passion started as a hobby but eventually turned into a full-fledged career when an opportunity to work in security presented itself. Although the job paid well, the 9-to-5 life didn't sit well with me. Every day, I named my favorite lockpicks like I was naming people in my entourage. Then, one weekend, I made a decision that changed everything. October 17th. The meeting point was at an isolated cabin in the woods near Arcadia National Park, Maine, where four like-minded friends and I decided to unwind and bond over a shared passion for adventurous lock picking. As we gathered around the campfire that evening, talk turned from friendly banter to recollections of our most challenging lock-related escapades. Why don't we go find something interesting off the beaten path to pick? Pip chimed in enthusiastically. Maybe an old hut or abandoned building with locked doors. He continued. This caught our attention. It may not have been strictly legal or ethical, but it filled us with excitement nonetheless. The next day, as we traversed deeper into the woods, following an overgrown trail towards less frequented territories of the forest reserves, we came across an old set of seemingly misplaced stairs. Covered by overgrowth and fallen leaves, the staircase seemingly led nowhere. How fascinating! Gideon exclaimed. Urban myths speak of stairs that mysteriously appear in heavily wooded areas just like these. We cautiously ascended and found an unexpected sight, a dilapidated log structure nestled precariously between three large trees with padlocked doors. Within minutes, with another set of subtly nicknamed lockpicks, Zelda and Dobby, I stood triumphantly by the now open doors leading into darkness. Mutterings of excitement spread among us as we entered. 
The dark, musty interior revealed that the place seemed to have been abandoned for years, untouched by time. I could swear there was no wind outside. Is it just me, or is there a cold draft in here? Yao whispered suddenly. We stopped moving and realized it wasn't our imagination. We could hear our breath in the icy air, and the once friendly atmosphere suddenly turned menacing. Instead of recoiling in fear, we swept the disheveled room with our flashlight beams in a futile search for evidence that would lend itself to the sinister aura we had begun to sense. With no such luck, we decided to turn back. As we exited the dilapidated building, Gideon alerted us that his lighter was missing, undoubtedly an earlier pocketed find from within the structure. While he returned inside to search for it, Pip informed us about his cell phone service outage despite having perfect reception moments ago. Minutes later, Gideon staggered out and revealed strange symbols on every surface inside objects that had not been there during our initial exploration. Apprehension plagued us now as we made a hasty retreat down the stairs. A week after this chilling encounter, I came across a news article referencing police investigating a cult suspected of conducting ritual sacrifices not far from where we found the set of stairs in Arcadia National Park. It mentioned that cult members were usually heavily cloaked and reclusive, and their ritualistic paraphernalia, which included numerous padlocks and keys, was confiscated by authorities. At first glance, it all appeared unconnected, but then the repercussions of my lockpicking suddenly became clear. As I scrolled further through reports and interviews online, Photos began to emerge displaying some of these confiscated items, locks and keys eerily matching those named Zelda and Dalby that I had used in breaking open those old doors only days before. The unsettling implications dawned on me as I read through more stories about this mysterious cult's activity patterns over the years. Whatever forces we disturbed on those mysterious stairs in the woods must have had malevolent motives beyond our comprehension. It seemed that opening the doors wasn't about testing our skills anymore. It was feeding into some abominable plot, and unfortunately, there was no way to change it. As I leaned back in my chair, finally processing my actions and attempting to understand what I'd unwittingly released, a chilling breeze swept through the room as if reaffirming that our tampering with unknown forces in the woods had set in motion something far graver than we could have ever imagined. As the days went by, my sense of uneasiness grew stronger. The chilling encounter in the woods with my friends haunted me relentlessly. I couldn't shake the feeling that the cult and their dark rituals were still lurking around. Perhaps I had opened a door that should have remained locked forever. I became increasingly paranoid. I would frequently glance over my shoulder and keep a close eye on my surroundings, fearing that danger was lurking around every corner. My friends also noticed a shift in my demeanor and expressed concerns about how much I had changed since our adventure in the woods. One Saturday night, as I lay in bed, Unable to sleep, I received an anonymous text message. It read, We know what you did at the cabin. My breathing picked up, and a bead of sweat trickled down my temple. I felt my heart race as though they had somehow found me. This cult had tracked me down. Panicked but unwilling to appear weak, I shot back a blunt message. Who is this? I wouldn't worry about that right now. The text suggested ominously. Just know that there are consequences for your actions. That was enough to push me over the edge. No longer doubting the gravity of the situation, I decided to confess everything to my friends and work together to protect ourselves from any possible threat. When we all met up at Pip's apartment the next day, he presented us with an article he had found on an obscure conspiracy forum online. 
It was filled with similar accounts of people opening mysterious locked doors only to experience a series of escalating misfortunes afterward. As we huddled together in Pip's living room, researching the cult's frightening history and intentions, we stumbled upon a potential solution, returning all stolen items, such as Gideon's lighter, to their original location might appease whatever sinister forces we had unleashed. The following weekend, with heavy air in our lungs, we ventured back to the chilling area where we had made our fateful decision. The woods loomed ahead, casting a foreboding shadow over the isolated staircase. Nerves were at an all-time high, but we knew what had to be done. Upon reaching the cabin, we returned Gideon's lighter and Zelda and Dobby, the lockpicks I used to break in the first place, to their rightful spots inside. Gideon hesitated for a moment before letting out a small prayer, pleading silently for forgiveness. That night, as we camped away from the cabin, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about the cult and its malevolent motives. Around midnight, when everyone else was asleep in their tents, I heard whispers coming from outside. Heart pounding in my chest, I cautiously unzipped my tent and peered out into the darkness. To my horror, surrounded by an eerie bluish light flickering through the woods, I saw cloaked figures standing close to one another in a circle. Their voices grew louder, chanting something unintelligible yet hauntingly harmonic. Gathering every ounce of courage I had left, I forced myself to take deliberate steps towards my friend's tents to wake them gently. We need to go, was all I could muster in hushed tones before quickly gathering up our supplies and making our escape. We ran towards our car under the cloak of darkness with inexplicable shivers running down our spines. From far behind us, we could hear guttural screams, sounds so unearthly that it's hard to believe they came from anything human. Barely escaping with our lives intact that night, overwhelming fear coursing through us, we made a solemn pact never to return to those woods or search for mysterious locks again. Months have passed since that horrific night. In time, things return to some semblance of normalcy for all of us. However, we each still carry a lingering sense of chilling dread that pervades our every thought. Although our amateur lockpicking adventures have ended, one cannot shake the eerie feeling that there will always be someone, or something, watching over us. From time to time, I catch a glimpse of cloaked figures out of the corner of my eye. They vanish as soon as I turn to face them. We may never know exactly what we unleashed that day, but one thing is for certain, sometimes the locks we break have a purpose far beyond our understanding. I've always been fascinated by the complexities of human behavior, the subtle shifts in facial expressions that reveal hidden emotions, those furtive glances betraying an unspoken thought. Perhaps that's why I chose a career in psychology. It allowed me to delve into the depths of others' minds, striving to uncover the innermost enigmas. Little did I know that this curiosity would lead me into a twisted world of darkness and unexpected deceit. It was a crisp, autumn day in the heart of San Francisco when I first encountered an eerie sight during my afternoon hike through a popular reserve just outside the city limits. Tucked within the dense foliage was an old, mysterious set of stairs leading to, well, nothing in particular. They seemed to have been constructed with attention to detail and care, as if they carried some great significance, but even from a distance, it became abundantly clear that they led nowhere at all. Curiosity peaked. I began asking around among my friends and fellow hikers if anyone had seen these stairs before or knew anything about them. Nobody did. 
My intrigue only grew when a local historian informed me that no records existed of any such construction ever taking place on that land. As my need for answers intensified, bordering on obsession, I decided to investigate the matter further during my spare time. Driven by adrenaline and unrelenting curiosity, I spent evenings poring over old documents in my cozy apartment, forming connections between seemingly unrelated events and assembling pieces of an increasingly complicated puzzle. During these late nights of holding rabbit hole conversations with other historians and fact finders online, I came across other tales of mysteriously appearing staircases scattered throughout the woods across America. Every instance shared similarities, elaborate sets of stairs and remote locations with no discernible purpose or origin. My determination eventually bore fruit several weeks after embarking on this enigmatic journey. Utterly consumed by my investigation, I encountered a trail of whispers leading to a group with seemingly innocuous origins, a local meetup group dubbed the Progressive Explorers Club. This quickly led me to stumble directly into their hidden agenda, one encompassing a labyrinth of macabre secrets and malevolent intentions. The Progressive Explorers Club was merely a facade, concealing the activities of an occult group endeavoring to tear open the fabric of reality through ritualistic acts of violence. They used these isolated staircases as their sacrificial altars, the steps themselves symbolic of the ascension towards godhood they sought. The deeper I dove into their seedy underworld, the more apparent it became how intricate and extensive this network had become. There were too many people involved to compile a complete list, but at the heart of their operations was a man named Marcellus Stratham. From what I managed to piece together, he appeared to be an orchestrator, weaving darkness and despair throughout his fellow cult members' otherwise ordinary lives. It was during this escalating foray into terror that I overheard, through online message boards and anonymous sources I had managed to acquire, rumors circulating about a rather sizable sacrifice being prepared in only a matter of days. Recognizing the gravity of the threat this posed, I knew I needed to act quickly or risk allowing unspeakable atrocities to be committed. Gathering what little evidence I could muster without alerting them to my presence, I brought my findings to the local authorities, my heart pounding in my chest as I recounted the imminent carnage looming in those accursed woods. Naturally, skepticism reigned at first. It all sounded like some far-fetched urban legend sprung from fertile and twisted imaginations. Yet, as they examined the information laid before them in great detail, data culled from sleepless nights and agonizing research, they began to understand just how real and profound this threat truly was. A special task force was assembled to deal with the situation discreetly guided and informed by my work on this grisly case. The night they descended upon the stairwell in the woods is one etched forever into my memory. Though not physically present, I listened in on a walkie-talkie, waiting with bated breath as each ghastly discovery and horrifying revelation unveiled itself from within the shadows. I had saved lives. There was no doubt about that. But deep down, I knew it would never be enough. For every Marcellus Stratham arrested that fateful evening, there were countless others planning their sinister innovations elsewhere. It was only a matter of time before another case popped up. A friend from the task force called me, saying they had discovered another staircase, deep in a forest several miles away from the city. Someone stumbled upon it and reported it to the police. With my heart in my throat, I headed out there myself. As we studied the staircase, which looked similar to but eerily distinct from the one I had explored earlier, I realized that this might have been Marcellus Stratham's backup plan or even his primary target. 
I could feel the lingering malevolence in every step, as if waiting to be activated by some unspeakable act. We were cautious this time. The task force and I took preventative measures, setting up hidden cameras and surveillance equipment around the area. We needed solid evidence, something to nail down everyone involved in these gruesome rituals. A couple of days later, during one of my routine checkups on the cameras, I noticed something horrifying. The footage showed a group of hooded figures surrounding the staircase at midnight. Each carried a lantern, illuminating their twisted faces as they chanted dark verses in unison. And then I saw him, Marcellus Stratham himself, slicing into a helpless victim tied to the highest step. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There he was, amidst his followers, committing heinous acts just days after being arrested. It didn't make sense. But as bizarre as it sounds, our evidence now points to Marcellus having an identical twin brother who shared his dark desires. This discovery fueled my obsession even more. Determined to bring both brothers to justice and stop these twisted ceremonies from happening again, we decided to make our move. The next night, we would silently surround their unholy gathering and catch them red-handed. Under cover of darkness, we closed in on them with careful precision. Just as we breached their circle of followers, shots rang out from the shadows. Chaos erupted, with hooded figures dropping like flies as police moved in to apprehend the leaders, the Stratham twins. I, too, was caught off guard and ended up grappling with one of the hooded figures. We struggled for control of his weapon before I finally landed a solid punch that knocked him flat on his back. I ripped the hood away, revealing not a cold-blooded murderer but an old college acquaintance. I was dumbfounded by this revelation. How deep did these connections go? Once we had them all rounded up and cuffed, we discovered who they were. Seemingly ordinary people from all walks of life entangled in the Stratham's wicked web. The significance of these staircases became clearer. They acted as beacons, drawing new initiates into this dark brotherhood. As we led them away from that cursed place, I couldn't help but feel that it wasn't over. Unnerving whispers still haunted me, steps on stairs leading deeper into shadow. Though the Stratham twins now faced justice and countless members of their twisted cult had been exposed, a lingering sense of unease crept through my soul. We may have eliminated one staircase, but what about others scattered throughout the country? Who knew what rituals were performed there? What malevolence still slept within those steps? What initially began as curiosity and fascination with human behavior morphed into a perpetual mission against evil. My work wasn't over. It truly would never be enough. In our wake that night, hidden among the trees surrounding the scene, I saw something that sent shivers down my spine. Another staircase appeared in the distance, cloaked in darkness and malevolence. As we receded back into our civilized world, how many would continue to rise from the darkness? I'm a collector, not of coins, stamps, or any other mundane objects. I collect secrets. Though I may seem ordinary on the outside, my peculiar hobby has led me down some dark and twisted paths. It was a breezy summer day when everything went to hell. At the time, I lived in this small town near a popular nature park in the USA. In the midst of planning my next adventure, my friends and I decided to spend our day off exploring the wooded area and stumbled upon something none of us anticipated. A staircase that appeared in the middle of nowhere, rising directly amidst the trees. Tom Elkridge! 
Where did you take us today? Demanded Lisa, one of my friends, who tagged along due to her curiosity and frustration with her boring job at the local diner. Lisa's fiery red hair whipped around in the wind as we stared at the stairs. I have no idea, I replied with equal parts confusion and intrigue. But maybe someone else here knows something. I turned to Johnny Bellingwin, another friend from school. Feeling equally baffled by this strange discovery, Johnny shook his head. I've never seen these before. Regardless of our confusion and intuitive concerns, we cautiously climbed up the stairs. At first, it felt like a whimsical exploration into an adventure like no other. How wrong we were. In our carelessness and disbelief of what we were witnessing, we didn't notice it at first, traces of blood on some stairs. With each step we took higher up the staircase, more splatters appeared. As members of society desensitized by countless violent movies and online games, our primal instinct grasped humanity's dedication to solving mysteries. Up ahead, Lisa suddenly cried out in terror as she discovered a mutilated body at the top of the stairs. It was utterly unrecognizable with its twisted limbs and gutted insides, leaving a macabre display that caught us off guard. The culmination of my bizarre secrets is brought to life in one horrifying scene. Panicked, we descended the gruesome staircase and reported our grisly finding to the local police. During the investigation and the media circus that followed, our small town became infested by reporters who pressured us for details. Reluctantly revealing our horrible secret, we took them to the steps, which were no longer there. That night, Detective Stanton Greenport sought me out during his investigation. He recognized my name due to certain tendencies my peculiar hobby presented during my teenage years. Tom, he began ominously, I know you're a collector of some sort. And while I can't fathom why or how these stairs appeared in the woods only to vanish after your curiosity was ignited, I do know that you have connections to an underground society of sorts. Underground society? I frowned at him. You think those stairs were planted there by some secret organization? I have reason to believe they were, Tom. He stated gravely. We identified the remains as belonging to James Umbertson, a man once associated with this group called the Crimson Spiders. What? I exclaimed in shock. Unknown even to me, one of my myriad secrets had come hauntingly back to life. Detective Greenport fixed me with a piercing gaze. So tell me why your old group's activities happened to result in the brutal murder of one of their own. Realization seeped into my bones like ice water as my past washed over me, a time when we all played innocent games. How much do you know about the Crimson Spiders? He asked slowly. I, I don't know. I stammered weakly, struggling with this chilling revelation and its implications. Greenport leaned in closer. Someone knows why those stairs came and went the way they did, Tom, and I'm going to find the truth behind James Umbertson's gruesome death. He left me with more questions than answers. The Crimson Spiders had dissolved after my teenage years. Did this mean someone resurrected the group and continued with a macabre agenda? I realized that no secret remains hidden forever. It was only a matter of time before Detective Stanton Greenport would uncover more, not just about the Crimson Spiders but also about me and my own twisted past. One thing was certain. This case would not stop haunting me or my town any time soon. As the days went by, my mind kept drifting back to that horrifying scene atop the mysterious staircase. The consequences of collecting secrets now weigh heavily on me. I knew I had to find out who was behind this and why. But how, 
when nobody else seemed to know anything about it and the stairs had vanished, I decided to look into the past members of the Crimson Spiders. While our teenage shenanigans certainly bordered on the dark and twisted, none of us ever pushed our games into the realm of murder. One by one, I tracked down former members, engaging in long conversations over coffee or beers, trying to understand if any of them were connected to James Thumbertson's murder. Moreover, I wanted to know if they had anything to do with the mysterious staircase. Those conversations led me down some unexpected paths. People who had moved far away, others who still lived nearby but led lives we could never have imagined back in our youth. Yet none appeared responsible for what had happened. And soon, there were only three people left unaccounted for, Melissa Crane, Victor Hughes, and Lenny Norton. With growing trepidation, I hunted for these final members, armed with a determination born from desperation and a fear of what Detective Greenport might find next. Melissa Crane turned out to be a professor at a university a few states away. Talking to her felt surreal. She was as disturbed by the story as anyone else would be. She denied having any knowledge about what happened but mentioned how Victor and Lenny had remained close even after the group disbanded. Nerves tightened in my chest as I made my way towards Victor Hughes' address. He lived alone in a secluded cabin deep in the woods, oddly close to where we found the staircase. Gritting my teeth against the unease gnawing at me, I knocked on his door. To my surprise, Lenny Norton was there as well. Suspicion rose uncontrollably in my gut as I stared at them, a duo linked to the only part of my past that seemed connected to this gruesome nightmare. I did my best to nonchalantly steer the conversation towards the Crimson Spiders and what had happened recently. Initially, both men seemed to know nothing their faces showing genuine confusion as I recounted the horrifying discovery. But then Lenny cracked. His voice shook with fear as he confessed they had continued indulging in darkness even after the Crimson Spiders fell apart. Aided by Victor, they called upon ancient rituals they barely understood, which led to the formation of the strange staircase and an entity they couldn't control. Tears formed in Lenny's eyes as he admitted he tried to break free from the darkness, but Victor wouldn't let him. He told me how they made a pact with this entity. Killing James Umbertson was their last resort to protect themselves and keep our town from falling victim to this monstrous force. My head swam with terror and disbelief. It felt impossible for everything I had witnessed to be true. Yet the gruesome reality remained. James' mutilated body and that brief encounter with the eerie staircase were undeniable evidence. Just then, Detective Greenport appeared at the cabin door with backup. Someone must have tipped him off about our meeting. As all those present were arrested for questioning, a sigh of relief escaped me, knowing justice would finally be served, but at what cost? With Victor and Lenny contained in prison cells, we all waited anxiously for weeks as nothing else happened. No more mysterious stares nor bizarre occurrences tainted our once ordinary lives. The town slowly returned to normal, plagued only by whispers of once hidden secrets we wished we could forget. Life went on, filled with despair and draped in disillusionment. But despite my resignation from my secret collecting hobby, I never stopped wondering about what might lurk around the next corner, waiting just out of sight to drag me back into another horrifying mystery. And so it was, late into the night, as I lay in bed unable to sleep, haunted by the horrors we'd unearthed and that lingering sensation that something else, even more sinister, was hiding in the darkness beyond my window. I wondered if I would ever be free of the dread that now clung to me like a second skin, or if my life had become eternally entwined with secrets better left buried. 